foreword and preface of one hundred years in yosemite the story of a great park and its friends this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales one hundred years in yosemite the story of a great park and its friends by carl parcher russell foreword the national park service is primarily a custodian of and trustee for lands lands with unique and special qualities so distinctive as to make their care a concern of the entire nation lands therefore held under a distinctive pattern and policy administered according to the national park concept yosemite national park comprises such lands it is so to speak a type locality for the national park idea while yellowstone established in eighteen seventy two was the first real national park yosemite valley in eighteen sixty four under an act signed by president lincoln was transferred to the state of california to be protected according to park principles later to be reseeded to the federal government here in yosemite many of the national park policies and techniques of protection administration and interpretation have evolved and are still evolving within the framework of the basic act of nineteen sixteen with its injunction to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein and to provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations dr russell's one hundred years in yosemite appearing now in its new version gives not only a chronology of events and the persons taking part in them related to this place of very special beauty and meaning it also portrays in terms of human experience the growth of a distinct and unique conception of land management and chronicles the thoughts and effort of those who contributed to it it tells of the obstacles overcome and of the pressures present even today to break down the national park concept and turn these lands to commercial and other ends that would deface their beauty and impair their significance this book therefore is more than a history of yosemite it traces the evolution of an idea in scholarly fashion sources of information are cited many of the documents and other source materials upon which the book is based are preserved in the yosemite museum thus giving special interest to visitors to yosemite belief in the worth of the national park program cannot but be strengthened by reading one hundred years in yosemite newton b drury director national park service february thirteenth nineteen forty seven preface it is the purpose of one hundred years in yosemite to preserve and disseminate the true story of the discovery and preservation of america's first public reservation to be set aside for its natural beauty and scientific interest when the original version of this book was written in nineteen thirty i had recently completed the collation of manuscript diaries and correspondence newspaper files old journals hotel registers state and federal reports photographs and a variety of other pertinent historical source materials in the library of the yosemite museum this was the material upon which the book was based in the preface of the book i made a plea for the contribution of additional yosemite memorabilia to be added to the yosemite archives perhaps some of the fine response from donors during the past sixteen years is traceable to that plea more likely the increased interest in the yosemite museum results from the creditable work of the park staff members and the message carried by the monthly publication yosemite nature notes the notable growth of the yosemite museum collections and the improvement of its exhibits and its general program of interpretive work are heartening to all who had a hand in the establishment of the work in the original version and in bringing to the present work the benefit of new material i have attempted to organize the published information which has been confirmed by the oral testimony of many yosemite pioneers and enriched with authentic data from unpublished manuscripts prepared by other old-timers to whom i could not speak in order that a convenient chronology of events might be available to the reader an outline is appended to the book 
this includes the episodes related in the text and in addition mentions many obscure events not treated in the narrative it also provides ready reference to the sources drawn upon in writing this method of citing sources has made it unnecessary to encumber the pages of the text with numerous footnotes most of the manuscripts referred to are the property of the yosemite museum the whereabouts of other manuscripts is indicated in the bibliography to the donors of the expanding collection of source materials and to the yosemite staff persons also who have accomplished so much in organizing interpreting and publishing upon these materials i am indebted their interest and their labors have facilitated my present writing and their conscientious handling of file systems accession records stored collections and publication programs will facilitate the work of future investigators of yosemite history and natural history at the same time their good museum practices should inspire further public confidence in the integrity of the yosemite program and the collections will continue to grow a host of friends and associates have contributed to the production of the book great thanks are due my wife for her generous help and continuous encouragement mrs h j taylor lent important assistance and advice among the yosemite staff members who gave valuable help former park naturalist c a harwell and c frank brockman and former museum secretary mrs william godfrey made especially important contributions however the extraordinary interest of every member of the park naturalist staff has placed me in the debt of the entire organization the american association of museums in addition to cooperating with the national park service in founding the yosemite museum has contributed directly to the production of this book by assisting me in the collecting of rare publications and helping generally in assembling yosemite data the yosemite park and curry company has made available many publications and photographs mrs don tresider of that organization particularly has given material assistance in establishing dates and historical facts the sierra club has permitted the use of my article mining excitements east of yosemite which was first published in the sierra club bulletin to david r brower editor of the sierra club bulletin and at the university of california press i acknowledge particular indebtedness not only for editorial guidance in producing the book but also for his historian's sense and his basic knowledge of the yosemite terrain and its story some of his contributions to the content of the text are acknowledged elsewhere but his friendly help has extended to every part of the book francis p farquhar and ansel f hall during a quarter of a century of our friendships have given assistance and encouragement mr farquhar has read parts of the manuscript and made helpful suggestions his library has been drawn upon in the course of my work the more recent photographs reproduced upon the following pages are credited to their makers to each of whom i am deeply beholden for use of the very old pictures used herein i am indebted to the yosemite museum and to superintendent frank crittridge i express thanks for this and many other helpful acts performed by him and his staff members in furthering my efforts in the sixteen years that have elapsed since one hundred years in yosemite first appeared notable changes have taken place in the geographical boundaries of the national park physical developments within the reservations have so far as possible kept pace with progressing modes of vacationing and some eight million visitors have journeyed to its wonders a number of the historic caravansaries that served so conspicuously during stagecoach days have been removed from the scene and the one-time dusty tortuous routes of access have been converted to safe surfaced roads of beautiful alignment a world-shaking conflict has been waged and the superlative values of the park have emerged from that war unaffected by the demands of production interests many earnest men have applied themselves in guarding the precious values of the great reservation some of these conservationists have virtually died in the harness a growing appreciation of the work of these men is evident and there is notable acclaim also of the far-sightedness of unnamed leaders who in eighteen sixty four obtained the epoch-making legislation that gave america her first public reservation of national park caliber 
it has been gratifying to me to observe some practical usefulness of my original compilation of yosemite history and this new version of the work is offered with the hope that it may continue to guide public attention to the significance of the action of pioneers who led the world along the paths of scenic conservation upon the executives who now plan and administer programs of protection and management in yosemite rests a responsibility that gains in magnitude in proportion to the growing pressure exerted by the hordes of people who seek the offerings of the park the nation is yet in a pioneering stage in defining yosemite values and regulating their use in the light of experience of the past it should be possible to discern some of the path that lies ahead the ability to discern even the more subtle influences affecting the security of yosemite and other great national parks has become a must for national park service executives this sensitivity has not developed overnight but now it approaches maturity director newton b drury has exercised a leadership in this regard which marks his period of service as the apex of clear thinking on national park problems Carl P. Russell, United States National Park Service, January 30, 1947. End of foreword and preface. Chapter 1 of 100 Years in Yosemite by Carl Parcher Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1 Discovery that picturesque type known as the american trapper ushered in the opening event of sierra nevada history true the spaniards of the previous century had viewed the snowy range of mountains had applied the name sierra nevada and even had visited its western base but penetration of the wild and snowy fastness awaited the coming of americans in the opening decades of the nineteenth century the entire American West was occupied by scattered bands of trappers. From the ranks of the Fur Brigade came Jedediah Strong Smith, a youthful fur trader not yet thirty years old, but experienced in his profession and well-educated for his time. In the summer of 1826, he took his place at the head of a party of men organized to explore the unknown region lying between Great Salt Lake and the California coast smith's leadership of this party gave him a first place in the history of the sierra nevada his party left the salt lake rendezvous on august twenty two eighteen twenty six a southwest course was followed across the deserts of utah and nevada penetrating the mojave country and the cajon pass on november twenty seven they went into camp near mission san gabriel smith was thus the first american to make the transcontinental journey to california the harbinger of a great overland human flood the spanish governor of california refused to permit the party to travel north as smith had planned instead he instructed that they should quit california by the route used in entering reinforced with food clothing and horses supplied by the friendly mission san gabriel smith returned to the neighborhood of the cajon pass it was not his intention however to be easily deterred in his plan to explore california he followed the sierra madre to the junction of the coast ranges and the sierra nevada and entered the san joaquin valley he found the great interior valley inhabited by large numbers of indians who were in no way hostile or dangerous there were few beaver and elk deer and antelope in abundance reaching one of the streams flowing from the mountains he determined to cross the sierra nevada and return to great salt lake smith called this stream the wimelcha after a tribe of indians by that name who inhabited the region thereabouts c hart merriam has established the fact that smith's wimelcha is the king's river and the time of his arrival there is february of eighteen twenty seven since the passes of the sierra in this region are never open before the advent of summer it is not surprising that his party failed in this attempted crossing of the range authorities have differed in their interpretation of smith's writing regarding his ultimate success in traversing the sierra but there is little doubt that he crossed north of the yosemite region perhaps as far north as the american river smith was then the first white man known to have crossed the sierra nevada 
His pathfinding exploits did not take him into the limits of the present Yosemite National Park, but because his manuscript maps were made available to government officials who influenced later expeditions, and because he was the first to explore the mountain region, of which the Yosemite is an outstanding feature, his expedition provides the opening story in any account of Yosemite affairs. Smith's explorations paved the way for a notable influx of American trappers to the valleys west of the Sierra Nevada. Smith, in fact, returned to California that same summer. Patty, Young, Ogden, Wolfskill, Jackson, and Walker all brought parties to the new fields during the first five years following the Smith venture. Fur traders informed the settlers in the western states of the easy life in California and enticed them with stories of the undeveloped resources of the Pacific Slope. Pioneers were then occupying much of the country just west of the Missouri, and a gradual tide of westward immigration brought attention first to Oregon and then to California. The presence of Americans in California greatly annoyed the Mexican officials of the country, the fears of these officials were justified, for the trappers scarcely concealed their desire to overthrow Mexican authority and assume control themselves. To add to the threatened confusion, revolt brewed among the Mexicans who held the land. In 1832, Captain B. L. E. Bonneville secured leave of absence from the United States Army and launched a private venture in exploring and trapping. One Joseph Reddiford Walker, who had achieved fame as a frontiersman, was engaged by Bonneville to take charge of a portion of his command. Walker's party of explorers was ordered to cross the desert west of Great Salt Lake and visit California. Reliable knowledge of the Sierra Nevada and the first inkling of the existence of Yosemite Valley resulted from this expedition made in 1833. Joseph Walker, born in 1798 on the Tennessee River near the present Knoxville, Tennessee, had moved westward with the advancing frontier in 1818 to the extreme western boundary of Missouri. There he and his brothers rented government land near the Indian factory, Fort Osage. They put in a crop and during slack seasons mingled with the Osages and the Kansas Indians. Here, Walker formed his first ideas of trade with the Indians, ideas which bore fruit during his later experiences on the Santa Fe Trail and with the fur brigades in the Rocky Mountains. Early in 1831, Walker, en route southward from his home to buy horses, stopped at Fort Gibson in the heart of the Cherokee Nation in the eastern part of the present Oklahoma. Several companies of the 7th U.S. Infantry were stationed there. This circumstance brought about a sequence of events which left permanent marks upon Walker's personal career and upon the history of the American West. Captain B. L. E. Bonneville was in command of B Company of the 7th Infantry. Bonneville confided in Walker that the government was about to place him on detached service in order that he might conduct a private expedition into the Rocky Mountains for furs and geographical data. He asked Walker to join him as guide and counselor. To this proposal, Walker acceded enthusiastically and proceeded forthwith to organize the equipment and personnel needed for the venture. On the 1st of May, 1832, Bonneville and Walker led westward a caravan of 20 wagons attended by 110 mounted trappers, hunters, and servants from the Missouri River Landing where Fort Osage had once stood. Out upon the Kansas Plains they went, up the Platte, to the Sweetwater, and through South Pass. In the valleys of the Green and the Snake, they trapped and traded through the winter and spring of 1832-33. After the rendezvous on the Green in July 1833, Walker was named by Bonneville to be the leader of this now famous Walker expedition to the Pacific. The reports of Jedediah Smith on his trip of 1826 to California and the much-talked-about adventures of Smith, as discussed by the mountain men, seem to have been decisive factors which influenced Bonneville to authorize this ambitious undertaking. The fact that a scant 4,000 pounds of beaver was all he had to show for his campaign of the past year also may have contributed to his determination to take another fling at exploration, trapping, and the trade. 
Walker's California party consisted of 50 men, with four horses each, a year's supply of food, ammunition, and trade goods. Zenas Leonard and George Nidiver, two free trappers who had joined the Bonneville crowd at the Green River Rendezvous, were selected as members of the Walker party. Both were to become conspicuous in California history by virtue of their writings. Because Walker was the first white man to lead a party of explorers to the brink of Yosemite cliffs, he is given a first place in Yosemite history. It is worthwhile to record here some of the appraisals of Walker, the man, made by his contemporaries and companions. Zenas Leonard, clerk of the Walker party, wrote, Mr. Walker was a man well calculated to undertake a business of this kind, the California expedition. He was well hardened to the hardships of the wilderness, understood the character of the Indians very well, was kind and affable to his men, but at the same time at liberty to command without giving offense, and to explore unknown regions was his chief delight. Washington Irving said of Walker, about six feet high, strong-built, dark-complexioned, brave in spirit, though mild in manners. He had resided for many years in Missouri, on the frontier, had been among the earliest adventurers to Santa Fe, where he went to trap beaver, and was taken by the Spaniards. Being liberated, he engaged with the Spaniards and the Sioux Indians in a war against the Pawnees, then returned to Missouri and had acted by turns as sheriff, trader, trapper, until he was enlisted as a leader by Captain Bonneville. Hubert Howe Bancroft, the historian, estimated, Captain Joe Walker was one of the bravest and most skillful of the mountain men. None was better acquainted than he with the geography or the native tribes of the Great Basin, and he was withal less boastful and pretentious than most of his class. Walker's biographer, Douglas S. Watson, referring to Bonneville's effort to blame the financial failure of his western enterprise upon a scapegoat, stated, Whatever may have been Bonneville's purpose in besmirching Walker, in which Irving so willingly lent himself, he has hardly succeeded, for where one person today knows the name Bonneville, thousands regard Captain Joseph Reddiford Walker as one of the foremost of Western explorers, worthy to be grouped with Jedediah Strong Smith and Ewing Young as the trilogy responsible for the march of this nation to the shores of the Pacific, the true pathfinders. Walker's perseverance in completing his California journey grew out of a solemn determination to make a personal contribution to the expansion of the United States westward to the Pacific. His cavalcade crossed the Great Basin west of Great Salt Lake via the Valley of the Humboldt, and passing south by Carson Lake and the Bridgeport Valley, struck westward into the Sierra Nevada. The exact course they took across the Sierra has been a matter of conjecture. Some students have attempted to identify it with the Truckee route, and others have maintained that no ascent was made until the party reached the stream now known as Walker River. It seems probable that they climbed the eastern flank of the Sierra by one of the southern tributaries of the East Walker River. Once over the crest of the range, they traveled west along the divide between the Tuolumne and the Merced Rivers, directly into the heart of the present Yosemite National Park. In Leonard's narrative is found the following very significant comment regarding the crossing. We traveled a few miles every day, still on top of the mountain, and our course continually obstructed with snow hills and rocks. Here we began to encounter in our path many small streams which would shoot out from under these high snow banks, and after running a short distance in deep chasms, which they have through the ages cut in the rocks, precipitate themselves from one lofty precipice to another until they are exhausted in rain below. Some of these precipices appear to us to be more than a mile high. Some of the men thought that if we could succeed in descending one of these precipices to the bottom, we might thus work our way into the valley below, but on making several attempts we found it utterly impossible for a man to descend, to say nothing of our horses. We were then obliged to keep along the top of the dividing ridge between two of these chasms, which seemed to lead pretty near in the direction we were going, which was west, in passing over the mountain, supposing it to run north and south. Walker's tombstone in Martinez, California, bears the inscription, 
Camped at Yosemite, November 13, 1833. Leonard's description of their route belies the idea of his having camped at Yosemite Valley, and the date is obviously an error, as there is reliable evidence that Walker had reached the San Joaquin Plain before this date. L. H. Bunnell, in his Discovery of the Yosemite, records the following regarding Walker's route and his Yosemite campsites. The topography of the country over which the Mono Trail ran, and which was followed by Captain Walker, did not admit of his seeing the valley proper. The depression indicating the valley and its magnificent surroundings could alone have been discovered, and in Captain Walker's conversations with me at various times while encamped between Coulterville and the Yosemite, he was manly enough to say so. Upon one occasion I told Captain Walker that Tinia had said that a small party of white men once crossed the mountains on the north side, but were so guided as not to see the valley proper with a smile the captain said that was my party but i was not deceived for the lay of the land showed there was a valley below but we had become nearly barefooted our animals poor and ourselves on the verge of starvation so we followed down the ridge to bull creek where killing a deer we went into camp francis farquhar in his article walker's discovery of yosemite analyzes the problem of walker's route through the yosemite region and shows clearly that the walker party was not guided by indians he concludes quite rightly that bunnell was not justified in depriving walker of the distinction of discovering yosemite valley douglas s watson in his volume west wind the life of joseph Redford walker offers further evidence to this end it requires no great stretch of the imagination to visualize scouts along the flanks of the Walker party coming out upon the brink of Yosemite Valley and looking down in wonder upon the plunging waters of Yosemite Falls and perhaps venturing to the edge of the Hetch Hetchy. In any case, we have in the 1839 account by Leonard the first authentic printed reference to the Yosemite region. Another passage from this narrative must be quoted here in the last two days traveling we have found some trees of the redwood species incredibly large some of which would measure from sixteen to eighteen fathom round the trunk at the height of a man's head from the ground this is the first published mention of the big trees of the sierra if we accept bunnell's contention that the walker party camped at bull creek hazel green we will also agree that the party followed the old mono trail of the indians this route would have taken them near the merced grove of big trees there is probably no way of determining definitely whether the merced grove the tuolumne grove or both were seen by walker's men but this incident so casually mentioned is clearly the discovery of the famous big trees and here for the first time is a scholarly record of observations made in the present yosemite national park we may accept leonard's writings as the earliest document in yosemite history and the walker party as the discoverer of both the yosemite valley and the sequoia gigantia end of chapter one chapter two of one hundred years in yosemite by carl parcher russell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two mariposa hills following the significant work of the early overland fur traders there came a decade of emigration of bona fide california settlers the same forces that led the pioneer across the alleghanies thence to the mississippi and from the mississippi into texas explained the coming of american settlers into california Hard times in the East stimulated land hunger, and California publicity agents spread their propaganda at an opportune time. Long before railroads, commercial clubs, and real estate interests began to advertise the charms of California, its advantages were widely heralded by the venturesome Americans who had visited and sensed the possibilities of the province. 
the press of the nation took up the story and the people of the united states were taught to look upon california as a land of infinite promise abounding in agricultural and commercial possibilities full of game rich in timber possessed of perfect climate and feebly held by an effeminate people quite lacking in enterprise and disorganized among themselves the tide of immigration resulting from this painting of word pictures began its surge in eighteen forty one with the organization of the bidwell bartleson party other parties followed in quick succession and many of the pioneer fur hunters of the preceding decade found themselves in demand as guides the settlers came on horseback in ox wagon or on foot and with the men came wives and children they entered the state by way of the gila and the colorado the sacramento the walker the malheur and the pit and the truckee some journeyed to the mono region east of yosemite and either struggled over difficult sonora pass just north of the present park or tediously made their way south to owens river and then over walker pass the sierra nevada experienced a new period of exploration and california took a marked step toward the climax of interest in her offerings this pre-mexican war pre-gold rush emigration takes a prominent place in the history of the state and the tragedy and success of its participants provide a story of engrossing interest they had forced their slow way across the continent to find a permanent home beside the western sea and their arrival presaged the overthrow of mexican rule in california the mexican castro stated before an assembly in monterey these americans are so contriving that some day they will build ladders to touch the sky and once in the heavens they will change the whole face of the universe and even the color of the stars in one of the parties of settlers was a man of no signal traits who by a chance discovery was to set the whole world agog this was james w marshall an employee of john a sutter of the sacramento on january twenty fourth eighteen forty eight he found gold in a mill race belonging to sutter about a week later the inevitable took place california became a part of the united states the news of the gold discovery spread like wildfire and by the close of eighteen forty eight every settlement and city in america and many cities of foreign lands were affected by the california fever gold seekers swarmed into the newly acquired territory by land and by sea the overland routes of the fur trader and the pioneer settler found such a use as the world had never seen from the missouri frontier to fort laramie the procession of argonauts passed in an unbroken stream for months some thirty five thousand people traversed the western wilderness and two hundred and thirty american vessels reached california ports in eighteen forty nine the western slope of the sierra from the san joaquin on the south to the trinity on the north was suddenly populous with the gold mad horde on may twenty nine the californian of yerba buena issued a notice to the effect that its further publication for the present would cease because its employees and patrons were going to the mines on july fifteen its editor returned and published an account of his personal experiences as a gold seeker he wrote the country from the ahuba yuba to the san joaquin a distance of about a hundred and twenty miles and from the base toward the summit of the mountains about seventy miles has been explored and gold found on every part by eighteen forty nine the mariposa hills were occupied by the miners and the claims to become famous as the southern mines were being located jamestown sonora columbia murphy's chinese camp big oak flat snelling and mariposa all adjacent to the yosemite region came to life in a day stockton was the immediate base of supply for these camps the history of mariposa is replete with fascinating episodes may stanislaus corcoran a daughter of mariposa has supplied the yosemite museum with a manuscript entitled mariposa the land of hidden gold which comes from her own accomplished pen from it the following brief account is abstracted as an introduction to the beginnings of human affairs in the mariposa hills in eighteen fifty mariposa county occupied much of the state from tuolumne county southward 
a state senate committee on county subdivision headed by p h de la guerra determined its bounds and a select committee on names m g vallejo chairman gave it its name a name which was first applied by moraga's party in eighteen o six to mariposa creek gradually through the years the original expansive unit was reduced by the creation of other counties madeira fresno tulare kings and kern and parts of inyo and mono counties agua fria was at first the county seat but even in the beginning the town of mariposa was the center of the scene of activity four mail routes of the pony express converged upon it prior to the arrival of americans the spanish californians had scarcely penetrated the sierra in the county but these uplands were well populated with indians one of the strongest tribes the awanichis lived in the deep grassy valley yosemite during the summer months and occupied villages along the mariposa and chowchilla rivers in the winter mariposa proved to be the southernmost of the important southern mines of the people who were drawn to it during the days of the gold rush many were from the southern states they brought libraries horses from kentucky silk hats chivalry colonels and culture from virginia and from most of the states that later became confederate lawyers doctors writers even painters miners all pennsylvania massachusetts new york and europe also sent representatives and there were mexican war veterans such as jarvis streeter commodore stockton colonel fremont and captain william howard by christmas eighteen forty nine more than three thousand inhabitants occupied the town of mariposa which extended from chicken gulch to mormon bar in february eighteen fifty one a remarkable vein of gold was discovered in the mariposa diggings first designated as the johnson vein of mariposa and extensive works were developed from ridley's ferry bagby to mount ophir these properties were acquired by a company having headquarters in paris france which became known as the french company the Fremont Grant, also known as the Rancho Las Mariposas, was a vast estate of 44,386 acres of grazing land in the Mariposa Hills, which Colonel J.C. Fremont acquired by virtue of a purchase made in 1847 from J.B. Alvarado. It was one of several so-called floating grants after gold was discovered in the mariposa region in eighteen forty eight fremont floated his rancho far from the original claim to cover mineral lands including properties already in the possession of miners the center of fremont's activities was bear valley thirteen miles northwest of mariposa lengthy litigations in the face of hostile public sentiment piled up court costs and lawyers fees however the united states courts confirmed fremont's claims and other claimants including the french company lost many valuable holdings tremendous investments were made in stamp mills tunnels shafts and other appurtenances relating to the mining towns as well as to the mines which fremont attempted to develop in spite of its phenomenal but spotty productiveness the fremont grant brought bankruptcy to its owner and was finally sold at sheriff sale the town of mariposa which was on fremont's rancho became the county seat in eighteen fifty four and the present courthouse was built that year the seats and the bar in the courtroom continue in use today and the documents and files of the mining days still claim their places in the ancient vault they constitute some of the priceless reminders of a dramatic period in the early history of the yosemite region in these records may be traced the transfer of the ownership of the mariposa grant from fremont to a group of wall street capitalists these new owners employed frederick law olmsted as superintendent of the estate he arrived in the sierra in the fall of eighteen sixty three to assume his duties at bear valley the next year he was made chairman of the first board of yosemite valley commissioners so actively linking the history of the mariposa estate with the history of the yosemite grant olmsted continued his connection with the mariposa grant until august thirty one eighteen sixty five at which time he returned to new york and proceeded to distinguish himself as the father of the profession of landscape architecture 
His son, Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., born July 24, 1870, has continued in the Olmsted tradition. As an authority on parks, municipal improvements, city planning, and landscape architecture, and the preservation of the American scene, he has exerted a leadership comparable to his father's pioneering. He has entered the Yosemite picture as National Park Service collaborator in planning and as a member of the Yosemite Advisory Board, to which organization he was appointed in 1928. One of the few members of the small army of early miners in the Mariposa region, who left a personal record of his experiences, was L. H. Bunnell. His writings provide most valuable references on the history of the beginning of things in the Yosemite region. He was present in the Mariposa Hills in 1849, and from his book, Discovery of the Yosemite, we learn that Americans were scattered throughout the lower mountains in that year. Adventurous traders had established trading posts in the wilderness in order that they might reap a harvest from the miners and Indians. James D. Savage, the most conspicuous figure in early Yosemite history, whose life history, if told in full, would constitute a valuable contribution to Californiana, was one of these traders. In 1849, he maintained a store at the mouth of the South Fork of the Merced, only a few miles from the gates of Yosemite Valley. Now half a million people each year hurry by this spot in automobiles, yet no monument, no marker, no sign indicates that the site is one of the most significant historically of all localities in the region. It was here that the first episode in the drama of Yosemite Indian troubles took place. The story of the white man's occupancy of the valley actually begins at the mouth of this canyon in the Mariposa Hills. End of chapter 2chapter three of one hundred years in yosemite by carl parcher russell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three white chief of the foothills the entire story of very early events in the yosemite region is pervaded by the spirit of one individual in spite of the fact that no historian has chronicled the events of his brief but exciting career, the name of James D. Savage is legendary throughout the region of the Southern Mines. It has been the ambition of more than one writer of California history to pin down the fables of this pioneer and to establish his true life story on stable supports of authentic source. Scattered through the literature of the gold days are sketchy accounts of his exploits, and rarely narratives of first-hand experiences with his affairs may be found. Before relating Savage definitely to Yosemite itself, we shall do well to consider his personal history. During the beginning years of the gold excitement, his fame spread throughout the camps and to the ports upon which the mines depended for supplies. Savage was the subject of continual gossip, conjecture, and acclaim. His career was short, but it was crowded with thrilling happenings and terminated with violence in a just cause. Throughout it, Savage was brave, a man born to lead. Because he played a leading role in the discovery of Yosemite Valley, National Park officials have been energetic in their attempt to complete his life story and give it adequate representation in the Yosemite Museum. For several years, as historical material had been accumulating there, and details of most events in the Yosemite drama unfolded and took their proper place in the exhibits, Savage still remained a mystery. At last there came a Yosemite visitor who was descended from the grandfather of James D. Savage. This woman, Ida Savage Bowles, after learning of the local interest in her relative, communicated with yet another relative, who today resides in the same Middle Western state from which Jim Savage came. The result was that Mrs. Louise Savage Ireland took up the challenge and devoted many months to the determining of the California pioneer's ancestry. To her, we acknowledge indebtedness for her persevering search, which involved considerable travel and correspondence. Not only did she reveal the ancestry of Jim Savage, but she located a delightful old lady who, as a girl, knew Jim of California fame. 
This unexpected biographical material provides first-hand information about the youth of James D. Savage, such as has not been obtained from any living Californian who knew him in his halcyon days. The following story of the life of the first white man to enter Yosemite Valley, though incomplete, is much more comprehensive than anything that has previously appeared in print, and is, we believe, gathered from sources wholly dependable. James D. Savage was one of six children born to Peter Savage and Doritha Shantz. Henry C. Pratt of Virginia, Illinois, a second cousin, writes, My mother, Emily Savage, born in 1817, and her cousin, James Savage, were near the same age. This is the best approximation of his age contained in the biographical material accumulated by Mrs. Ireland. The parent, Peter Savage, went by ox cart and raft from Cayuga County, New York, to Jacksonville, Morgan County, Illinois, in 1822. Sixteen years later, Peter's family removed to Princeton, Bureau County, Illinois. Mrs. Ireland, in her quest, met Mrs. Sarah Seaton Porter of Princeton, who at the time of the interview in 1928 was 98 years old. Mrs. Porter knew James D. Savage as a youth. She recalls that Jim Savage was grown when his father Peter brought the family to Princeton from Morgan County. Jim was smart as a whip, shrewd, apt in picking up languages such as German and French, for both tongues were spoken here, the two races having settlements in and about Princeton. He was vigorous and strong, had blue eyes, and a magnificent physique, loved all kinds of sports engaged in in his day, was tactful, likable, and interesting. Sometimes Jim would come to church, but oh, he was such a wag of a youth. More often than not, he would remain outside, and when he knew time had come for prayer, he'd flick the knees of his horse and make him kneel too, and then wink at us inside. We couldn't laugh, of course, but we always watched for this trick of Jim's. He got such a lot of fun out of doing it. Savage took a wife, Eliza, and settled in Peru, Illinois. A daughter was born to this union. He and his brother Morgan were caught in the wave of California fever that affected many of the border settlements in the 40s, and they joined one of the overland parties in 1846. Lydia Savage Healy, another second cousin, expresses the opinion that the brothers joined Fremont's third expedition. However, since it is known that Savage's wife and child made the start, it is evident that they were with one of the parties of immigrants who that year made the journey. Mrs. Porter, then Sarah Seaton, with two brothers and a sister, drove from Princeton to Peru to bid them farewell. On this journey, suffering and discouragement went hand in hand. The wife and child did not survive the trip. Only the physically fit endured the hardships, and among these were Savage and his brother. By what route they entered California is not known, but S. P. Elias reports that Savage volunteered beneath the bear flag and fought through the war against the Mexicans. A member of Fremont's battalion, he was with Fremont both in Oregon and in California. After peace and before the discovery of gold, and shortly after the disbanding of Fremont's battalion, he went to the south, settled among the Indians, and through Jose and Jesus, two of the most powerful chiefs in the valley of the San Joaquin, he established an intimacy with the principal tribes. By his indomitable energy, capability of endurance, and personal prowess, he acquired a complete mastery over them to such an extent that he was elected chief of several of the tribes. He obtained great influence over the Indians of the lowlands and led them successfully against their mountain enemies, conquering a peace wherever he forayed. In any event, when Fremont and Pico put their signatures to the Cahuenga Peace Treaty on January 13, 1847, the Mexican War, so far as California was concerned, was at an end. Fremont's battalion was disbanded, and we may believe with Elias that James D. Savage then established his intimacy with the principal Indian tribes of the San Joaquin. 
His aptitude for picking up languages apparently came to the fore, for he mastered the Indian dialect and extended his influence until it amounted to something of a barbaric despotism. The Indians acknowledged his authority, and he, no doubt, improved their condition. In the wars with the mountain tribes, Savage's tactics won them victories, and he brought about progress generally. Prior to the gold rush, his territory was seldom visited by whites, but early in 1848, hardly a year subsequent to his conquest of the Indians, there poured in that flood of miners which transformed the entire picture. Savage adapted himself to it forthwith, and soon his name was on the lips of everyone. When he let it be known among his Indian followers that he would like to acquire a lot of the yellow metal, the squaw set to work and turned the product of their labors into the lap of the white chief. W. E. Wilde writes that Savage was associated with the Reverend James Woods in 1848, and that he and his Indians were working the gravel deposits at what became known as Big Oak Flat. It was here that a white Texan stabbed Luturio, one of the Indian leaders, and the Texan, in turn, was killed by the Indians. Savage, knowing the potentialities of enraged Indians, pacified them and withdrew with them to other localities. George H. Tinkham next throws a spotlight on Savage at Jamestown in May, question mark, 1849. Cornelius Sullivan related to Tinkham that, under a brushwood tent supported by upright poles, sat James D. Savage, measuring and pouring gold dust into the candle boxes by his side. Five hundred or more naked Indians, with belts of cloth bound around their waists or suspended from their heads, brought the dust to Savage, and in return for it received a bright piece of cloth or some beads. Just how much gold dust Savage acquired was never reported, but that it was an enormous amount is not to be questioned. For some two years his army of Indian followers busied themselves in gleaning the creeks and ravines of the foothills, and considering the facility with which gold could be gathered, it is small wonder that he was reputed to have barrels full of it. We learn from L. H. Bunnell, one of Savage's intimate acquaintances of long standing, that in 1849-1850 Savage had established his trading post at the mouth of the South Fork of the Merced, not more than 15 miles below Yosemite Valley, and on the line of the present Merced-Yosemite Highway. At this point, engaged in gold mining, he had employed a party of native Indians, Early in the season of 1850, his trading post and mining camp were attacked by a band of the Yosemite Indians. This tribe, or band, claimed the territory in that vicinity and attempted to drive Savage off. Their real object, however, was plunder. They were considered treacherous and dangerous and were very troublesome to the miners generally. Savage and his Indian miners repulsed the attack and drove off the marauders, but from this occurrence he no longer deemed this location desirable. Being fully aware of the murderous propensities of his assailants, he removed to Mariposa Creek, not far from the junction of the Agua Fria, and near to the site of the old stone fort. Soon after, he established a branch post on the Fresno, where the mining prospects became most encouraging as the high water subsided in that stream. This branch station was placed in charge of a man by the name of Greeley. This event on the South Fork constitutes the initial step in the hostilities that were to result in Savage's renown as the discoverer of Yosemite Valley. Since he had remained so close to the remarkable canyon for some months prior to the Indian attack, and because the threatening Indians frequently boasted of a deep valley in which one Indian is more than ten white men, Bunnell once asked Savage whether he had ever entered the mysterious place. Savage's words were, Last year, while I was located at the mouth of the South Fork of the Merced, I was attacked by the Yosemites, but with the Indian miners I had in my employ, drove them off, and followed some of them up the Merced River into a canyon, which I supposed led to their stronghold, as the Indians then with me said it was not a safe place to go into. From the appearance of this rocky gorge, I had no difficulty in believing them. Fearing an ambush, I did not follow them. It was on this account that I changed my location to Mariposa Creek. 
i would like to get into the den of the thieving murderers if ever i have a chance i will smoke out the grizzly bears the yosemites from their holes where they are thought to be so secure savage built up an exceedingly prosperous business at his trading post on the fresno and on mariposa creek he stocked his stores with merchandise from san francisco bay and exchanged the goods at enormous profits for the gold brought in by the indians an ounce of gold bought a can of oysters five pounds of flour or a pound of bacon a shirt required five ounces and a pair of boots or a hat brought a full pound of the precious metal his customers included white prospectors as well as his subservient indians for the white men would agree to his exacting terms in preference to leaving their diggings to make a trip for supplies to the growing village of mariposa the indians never questioned the rate of exchange for to them it seemed that their white chief was working miracles in providing quantities of desirable food and prized raiment in return for something that was to be had for the taking to guarantee a continuance of cordial relations with his indian friends and to cement the alliance of several tribes savage had taken wives from among the young squaws of different tribes two of these were called ikino and homet it is not known which tribes were represented in his household but the wives are reported to have totaled five if their bridal contract was recognized by all their tribesmen it is not difficult to understand how savage's supporters numbered five hundred the mariposa creek store retinue of whites was thrown into a state of some agitation one fall day in eighteen fifty when one of savage's wives confided the information that the mountain indians were combining to wipe the whites from the hills confirmation of her rumor was obtained from some of the friendly bucks who had long followed savage these indians declared that they had learned that the mountain tribe the yosemites were ready to descend upon savage again for the purpose of plunder and that they were maneuvering to secure the combined forces of other tribes savage did not misunderstand the threat as did some others of the white men hoping to impress the indians with the wonders numbers and power of the whites he conceived the idea of taking some of them to that milling base of supply san francisco it is probable too that he planned to put some of his great store of accumulated gold in safekeeping on the same trip accordingly he announced that he was going to the bay for a new stock of goods and invited jose juarez a chief of influence with the chowchillas and chukchansies to accompany him jose accepted the invitation with them went some of savage's dependable indian friends including a wife or two it was the occasion of this trip that provided the crowning touch for savage's reputation among the whites of all the gold camps the story of the affair spread to as many localities as were represented in san francisco's picturesque population at the time of the visit and legends of jim savage's barrel of gold are handed down to this day how large the barrel may have been it is now impossible to ascertain but certainly a fabulous fortune travelled with the strange party they made their headquarters at the revere house and became the sensation of the hour the indians arrayed themselves in gaudy finery and gorged themselves with costly viands and considerable liquor to the great distress of savage jose maintained himself in a state of drunkenness throughout most of their stay in order to prevent disturbances savage locked him up on one occasion and when he was somewhat sobered remonstrated with him jose flew into an excited rage became abusive with his tongue and finally disclosed his secret of the war against the whites savage knocked him down the party remained to witness the celebration of the admission of california into the union on october twenty ninth eighteen fifty savage deposited his gold in exchange for goods to be delivered as needed gilded his already colorful visit with enough gambling and reckless spending to stagger the residents and gathered his retinue for the return journey jose had maintained a silence and dignity ever after the violent quarrel with his chief no sooner had they reached the foothill territory from which they had traveled a fortnight before than they were greeted with news of indian threats as the fresno station maintained by savage seemed to be in immediate danger the party went there at once numerous indians were about but all seemed quiet 
however the white agents employed by savage revealed that the indians were no longer trading savage thereupon invited all indians present to meet with him and proceeded at once to conduct a peaceful confab before his store addressing them he said i know that some of the indians do not wish to be friends with the white men and that they are trying to unite the different tribes for the purpose of a war it is better for the indians and white men to be friends if the indians make war on the white men every tribe will be exterminated not one will be left i have just been where the white men are more numerous than the wasps and ants and if war is made and the americans are aroused to anger every indian engaged in the war will be killed before the whites will be satisfied having made himself clearly understood in the indian language he turned to his fellow traveller jose for confirmation of his statements regarding the power of the whites jose stepped forward and delivered himself of the following brief but energetic oration our brother has told his indian relatives much that is truth we have seen many people the white men are very numerous but the white men we saw on our visit are of many tribes they are not like the tribe that dig gold in the mountain he then gave an absurd description of what he had seen while below and continued those white tribes will not come to the mountains they will not help the gold diggers if the indians make war against them if the gold diggers go to the white tribes in the big village they give their gold for strong water and games when they have no more gold the white tribes drive the gold diggers back to the mountains with clubs they strike them down referring to the police as your white relative struck me while i was with him the white tribes will not go to war with the indians in the mountains they cannot bring their big ships and big guns to us we have no cause to fear them they will not injure us his climax came as a bold argument for the immediate declaration of war upon the whites chief jose rey of the chowchillas then contributed his plea for immediate hostilities and savage withdrew from the two hostile chiefs upon his return to the mariposa station his appeals for immediate preparation for war were given small hearing by the whites a few were inclined to scoff close on the heels of the warnings however came news of an attack on the fresno store all the whites except the messenger who had brought the news were killed the mariposa indian war was on savage had gone to horseshoe bend in the merced canyon to solicit aid he had hoped to find a more attentive audience there than among the county officials at agua fria in his absence his mariposa store was burned its three white attendants were killed and his wives were carried off by the assailants cassidy one of the rival traders who had scoffed at savage's first news of impending disaster was surprised in his establishment and met quick death three other murderous attacks took place in the immediate vicinity and the whites finally leaped to the defense of their holdings james burney the county sheriff took a place at the head of a body of volunteers who had banded for mutual protection on january sixth eighteen fifty one james d savage accompanied this party in an attack made upon an indian encampment of several hundred squaws and bucks under the leadership of jose ray this was the first organized movement of the whites against the indians of the mariposa hills by this time governor mcdougall had issued a proclamation calling for volunteers and the mariposa battalion came into existence savage was made major in full command three companies under john d coikendall john bowling and william dill were organized and drilled near savage's ruined mariposa store the affairs of this punitive body of men are dealt with in another chapter let it here suffice to say that its activities were especially directed against the mountain tribe of grizzlies and that on march twenty five eighteen fifty one savage and his men entered the mysterious stronghold yosemite valley in nineteen twenty eight it was my privilege to interview maria labrado one of the last members of the yosemite tribe who experienced subjection by the whites I eagerly sought ethnological and historical data, which was forthcoming in gratifying abundance. Purposely, I had avoided questioning the aged squaw about Major Savage, but presently she asked in jumbled English and Spanish if I knew about the captain of the white soldiers. 
she called him chowis and described him as a blond chief whose light hair fell upon his shoulders and whose beard hung halfway to his waist she had been much impressed by his commanding blue eyes and declared that his shirts were always red to this member of the mountain tribe of yosemite the major was recalled as something of a thorn in her flesh that he was a beloved leader of the foothill tribe she agreed but hastened to explain that those indians too were enemies of her people maria is the only person i have met who had seen savage for five months savage commanded the movements of the mariposa battalion its various units were active in the sierra summit region above yosemite at the headwaters of the chowchilla and on the upper reaches of the san joaquin in every encounter the indians were defeated and they finally sued for peace the prowess of savage as a mountaineer and military leader is borne out in a letter published in alta california on june twelfth eighteen fifty one in which the battalion's sergeant major describes at length for the adjutant a foray at the headwaters of the san joaquin i am aware that you have been high up and deep in the mountains and snow yourself but i believe this trip ranks all others the major himself has seen canyons and snow peaks this trip which he never saw before it is astonishing what this man can endure travelling on day and night through snow and over the mountains without food is not considered fatigue to him and as you are well aware the boys will follow him as long as he leaves a sign the same alta carries a resolution signed by men in dills and bowling's companies affirming in great detail their high confidence in savage in addition to his activities with the battalion in the field major savage functioned conspicuously in aiding the united states indian commissioners in preparing a peace treaty he maintained a friendly attitude toward the oppressed indians and had the government made good its promises or had the appropriations not been absorbed elsewhere the tribes of the sierra would have been more adequately provided for the treaty signed april twenty nine eighteen fifty one does not carry the signatures of tenaha of the yosemites or of the leader of the chowchillas on july one eighteen fifty one the mariposa battalion was mustered out major savage resumed his trading operations in a store on the fresno river near coarse gold in compliance with the treaty a reservation for the indians was set aside on the fresno and another on the king's river in the fall of eighteen fifty one the fresno store was the polling place for a large number of voters for county officers that winter savage built fort bishop near the fresno reservation and prepared to carry on a prosperous trade he spoke as follows on this subject to l h bunnell if i can make good my losses by the indians out of the indians i am going to do it i was the best friend the indians had and they would have destroyed me now that they once more call me chief they shall build me up i will be just to them as i have been merciful for after all they are but poor ignorant beings but my losses must be made good during the first months of eighteen fifty two major savage conducted a substantial if not a phenomenal business with the miners of the fresno and surrounding territory and with the indians at the agency no indian hostilities were in evidence but a policy of excluding them from the store proper was adhered to the goods which they bought with their gold dust were handed out to them through the small openings left in the walls these openings were securely fastened at night not infrequently the indians were subjected to abusive treatment at the hands of certain whites the mistreatment was enough to provoke an uprising but with a few exceptions they remained on the reservations an important light on subsequent events in savage's life is brought out in this statement by l h bunnell as far as i was able to learn at the time a few persons envied them the possession of their king's river reservation and determined to squat upon it after they should have been driven off this border element was made use of by an unprincipled schemer who it was understood was willing to accept office when a division of mariposa county should have been made or when a vacancy of any kind should occur but population was required and the best lands had been reserved for the savages 
a few hangers-on at the agencies that had been discharged for want of employment and other reasons made claims upon the king's river reservation the indians came to warn them off when they were at once fired upon and it was reported that several were killed further details of the deplorable act committed by the would-be squatters are provided by the following news item which appeared in the alta california of july seventh eighteen fifty two anticipated indian difficulties on king's river by mr stell who came express to stockton on the fifth instant we have received the annexed correspondence from the san joaquin evening july second eighteen fifty two editors alta california a few days ago the indians on king's river warned campbell pool and company ferrymen twenty miles from here to leave showing at the same time their papers from the indian commissioners the indians then left and threatened to kill the ferrymen if on their reservation when they returned mr campbell has been collecting volunteers many have joined him major harvey left this evening with some eighteen or twenty men a fine chance for the boys to have a frolic locate some land and be well paid by uncle sam these agitations and murders were denounced by major savage in unsparing terms although the citizens of mariposa were at the time unable to learn the details of the affair at king's river which was a distant settlement the great mass of the people were satisfied that wrong had been done to the indians however there had been a decided opposition by citizens generally to the establishment of two agencies in the county and the selection of the best agricultural land for the reservations mariposa then included nearly the whole san joaquin valley south of the tuolumne the opponents to the recommendations of the commissioners claimed that the government of the united states has no right to select the territory of a sovereign state to establish reservations for the indians nor for any other purpose without the consent of the state the state legislature of eighteen fifty one eighteen fifty two instructed the senators and representatives in congress to use their influence to have the indians removed beyond the limits of the state w w elliot in his history of fresno county eighteen eighty one reveals further details some time previous to august sixteenth eighteen fifty two one major harvey the first county judge of tulare county and william j campbell either hired or incited a lot of men who rushed into one of the rancherias on king's river and succeeded in killing a number of old squaws elliot's assertions are supported by the following news item from the san francisco daily herald august twenty one eighteen fifty two among other acts by white men calculated to excite the indians a ferry was established over the san joaquin within an indian reservation above fort miller some miles above savages the indians no doubt considered this an encroachment and from an idea that the ferry stopped fish from ascending the river some straggling indian acting without authority from chiefs or council spoke of this notion about the fish at the ferry and saying that the ferry was within their lands added that it would have to be broken up the proprietor of the ferry assuming this as a threatened hostility or making a pretense of it assembled a few willing friends who armed with rifles appeared suddenly among some indian families while most of the men were many miles off peaceably at work at savages without dreaming of danger and without justifiable provocation the white men fired upon the families killing two women as it is stated and some children and wounding several others with such conditions prevailing on the kings it is small wonder that numerous kings agency indians travel to the fresno in order to trade with savage needless to say this aroused the further ire of the traders on the kings the white malcontents continued their agitation and the wronged indians of the kings wailed to savage of their troubles consistently with his earlier acts wherein the public good was involved major savage attempted to pacify the indians he also denounced the squatters with all the emphasis of his personality and high standing he asserted that they should be punished under the laws which they had violated and presented the case to the indian commissioners harvey and the trader campbell made common cause of denouncing major savage in return 
word was sent to the major that they dared him to set foot in king's river region upon its receipt savage mounted his horse and traveled to the king's river agency the events that occurred upon his arrival have been variously described by half a dozen writers elliot's description which agrees essentially with bunnell's is as follows on the sixteenth day of august eighteen fifty two savage paid a visit to the king's river reservation but previously to this harvey declared that if savage ever came there he would not return alive arriving at the reservation early in the forenoon savage found there harvey and judge marvin and a quarrel at once ensued between savage and harvey the latter demanding of savage a retraction of the language he had used regarding harvey whereupon savage slapped harvey across the face with his open hand and while doing so his pistol fell out of his shirt bosom and was picked up by marvin harvey then stepped up to marvin and said marvin you have disarmed me you have my pistol no said marvin this is major savage's pistol whereupon harvey finding savage unarmed commenced firing his own pistol shooting five balls into savage who fell and died almost instantly marvin was standing by all this time with savage's pistol in his hands too cowardly or scared to interfere and prevent the murder at this time harvey was county judge of tulare county and one joel h brooks who had been in the employment of savage for several years and who had received at his hands nothing but kindness and favors was appointed by harvey justice of the peace for the sole purpose of investigating harvey's case for the killing of savage of course harvey was acquitted by brooks was not even held to answer before the grand jury harvey finally left in mortal fear of the indians for he imagined that every indian was seeking his life to avenge the murder of savage afterwards harvey died of paralysis in nineteen twenty six the late bootwell dunlap unearthed a hundred and sixty nine pages of depositions in manuscript form taken in a law case of eighteen fifty eight in which the death of savage was made an issue the incidents related by the witness under oath are redolent of the old wild days this testimony comes from the same brooks who as magistrate had acquitted harvey it is quoted as follows twenty-four hours after the indians had ordered campbell to leave harvey and his company had a fight with the indians killing some and whipping the balance savage was then an indian agent appointed by wozencroft savage and wozencroft made a great fuss about the american people abusing the indians and succeeded in getting the commanding general of the u s forces on the pacific to send up a couple of companies of troops to tulare county to take up major harvey and the men who were under his command and that had assisted him in this horrible murder of the poor innocent savages the circumstances which led to savage's death grew out of this difficulty the troops had crossed king's river this was some time in august eighteen fifty two in the morning major savage and judge john g marvin rode up to the door of campbell's trading house savage called for harvey harvey stepped to the door savage remarked i understand major harvey that you say i am no gentleman harvey replies i have frequently made that statement savage remarked to harvey there is a good horse saddle bridle spurs and leggings which belong to me i fetched them for the purpose of letting you have them to leave this country with harvey replied i have got a fine mule and i will leave the country on my own animal when i want to leave it savage called for breakfast savage and marvin ate breakfast by themselves in a brush house outside the store after they had got through their breakfast savage tied up his hair rolled up his sleeves took his six-shooter out of its scabbard and placed it in front of him under the waistband of his pantaloons he then walked into campbell's store and asked major harvey if he could not induce him to call him a gentleman harvey told him that he had made up his mind and had expressed his opinion in regard to that and did not think he would alter it he knocked harvey down and stamped upon him a little they were separated by some gentleman in the house and harvey got up savage says to what conclusion have you come in regard to my gentleman c harvey replies i think you are a damned scoundrel savage knocked harvey down again 
they were again separated by gentlemen present as harvey straightened himself on to his feet he presented a six-shooter and shot major savage through the heart savage fell without saying anything it was supposed that harvey shot him twice after he was dead every ball taking effect in his heart that is all i know about the fight i gained this information by taking the testimony as magistrate of those who saw it what may have become of the court records of the so-called trial is unknown but a scrap of testimony by the proprietor of the house in which the killing took place was preserved by the san francisco daily herald september three eighteen fifty two as follows the people of the state of california versus walter h harvey for the killing of james d savage on the sixteenth day of august eighteen fifty two contrary to the laws of the state of california and so forth mr edmunds sworn says yesterday morning major savage came into my house and asked major harvey if he had said he was no gentleman major harvey replied he had said it major savage struck major harvey on the side of the head and knocked him down on some sacks of flour and then proceeded to kick and beat him judge marvin and someone else interfered and major savage was taken off of major harvey major savage still had hold of major harvey when major harvey kicked him major savage then struck major harvey on the cheek and knocked him down the second time and used him the same as before by some means i cannot say major savage was again taken off and they separated major savage was in the act of attacking him again when major harvey draw his pistol and shot him question by the court did major harvey shoot more than once answer i think he did i found four holes in him question did major savage knock major harvey down before he drew his pistol answer the prisoner had been knocked down by major savage twice before he drew his pistol or made any attempt to shoot him mr gunnell sworn corroborates the evidence of mr edmonds mr nider sworn also does the same this is all the testimony given in as to the fight major fitzgerald u s a sworn testified to some facts which induced him to think major savage not a gentleman the court upon this testimony discharged major harvey without requiring bail so passed the leading figure in early yosemite history in this day of greater appreciation of individual heroism sacrifice and pioneer accomplishment in public service how one covets unprejudiced narratives of such lives as was that of james d savage bunnell comments feelingly on his many noble qualities his manly courage his generous hospitality his unyielding devotion to friends and his kindness to emigrant strangers a writer in the daily herald of september four eighteen fifty two contributes more details of events that followed the murder effects of major savage's death upon the indians we have received a letter dated august thirty first on the indian reservation upper san joaquin giving some further particulars of the murder of major james savage and the effect produced thereby upon the indians the writer has resided among them upwards of two years understood their language and their habits and for a long time assisted major savage in managing them his opinions therefore are entitled to wait the following extracts will show the probable effect this murder will have on the prospects of the southern section of the state you have doubtless ere this heard of the death or rather murder of major savage upon king's river it has produced considerable sensation throughout the country and is deeply regretted for the country and the government have lost the services of a man whom it will not be easy to replace he could do more to keep the indians in subjection than all the forces that uncle sam could send there the indians were terribly excited at his death some of them reached the scene of the tragedy soon after it occurred they threw themselves upon his body uttering the most terrific cries bathing their hands and faces in his blood and even stooping and drinking it as it gushed from his wounds it was with difficulty his remains could be interred the chiefs clung to his body and swore they would die with their father the night he was buried the indians built large fires around which they danced singing the while the mournful death chant until the hills around rang with the sound 
i have never seen such profound manifestations of grief the young men as they whirled wildly and distractedly around in the dance shouted the name of their father that was gone while the squaws sat rocking their bodies to and fro chanting their mournful dirges until the very blood within one curdled with horror at the scene i have not the slightest doubt that there will be a general outbreak this winter just as soon as the rainy season sets in we shall have the beginning of one of the most protracted and expensive wars the people of california have ever been engaged in the indians are quiet now but are evidently contemplating some hostile movement they told me a few days since that their father was gone and they would not live with the whites any longer i have studied the character of these indians as you know for more than two years and have acquired my experience in managing them under savage himself i do not speak lightly nor unadvisedly therefore when i assert that no more disastrous event could have occurred to the interests of this state than the murder of the gallant major savage it is possible that more details of savage's biography may be brought to light and it is with that hope coupled with a desire to give his memory just due that this material is presented for public perusal on the fresno river near the side of his old trading post rest the bones of the white chief in eighteen fifty five dr leach who had been associated with savage in trading with the indians journeyed to the king's river disinterred the remains and transferred them to their present resting place a ten-foot shaft of connecticut granite bearing the simple inscription major james d savage marks the spot on july fourth nineteen twenty nine the little city of madera california honored the memory of savage by placing an inscribed plaque on a city gate these memorials presumably are the only public reminders of the importance of james d savage in the history of the state the story of major savage may be concluded with a reference to his family ties as has been related californians were until nineteen twenty eight wholly mystified about his origin through the researches of louise savage ireland we are made to sense the human side of this saga and are brought to an understanding of his intimate family connections and his faithfulness to blood ties l h savage of el paso texas writes that his father john w savage first cousin of james d savage made a vain attempt to join the major in california returning miners in eighteen fifty told the illinois savages that jim invited them to come to california where he would make them rich john then a boy of nineteen years financed by older members of the family shipped for the golden state and sailed around the horn almost a year elapsed before he reached san francisco there he learned that his noted relative had met death six months before what became of any wealth that the major may have amassed remains a mystery the indians he struggled to protect and the lands he tried to save for them long ago passed out of the reckoning by way of explanation we quote from hutchings in the heart of the sierras the reservation on the fresno gradually became unpopular on this account because the indians craved their mountain homes but mainly from bad management was afterwards abolished by the government and finally its lands and buildings were gobbled up by sharp-sighted if not unprincipled men who like many others of that class became rich out of the acquisition one cannot but wonder what counteracting influences james d savage would have exercised in the fresno agency business had he been permitted to live End of chapter three chapter four of one hundred years in yosemite by carl parcher russell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four pioneers in the valley by march of eighteen fifty one the indian commissioners mckee barber and Vusencraft were actively assembling representatives of the numerous sierra indian tribes and driving sharp bargains with them to quit claim their lands 
on march nineteenth eighteen fifty one the commissioners in their camp camp fremont in the mariposa region reached an agreement with six tribes and proceeded to establish a reservation for them their report refers to one tribe the yosemitos who were expected at this confab but failed to appear the friendly indians who signed the treaty reported that this mountain tribe had no intentions of coming in it was therefore decided to send major savage and a part of his mariposa battalion after them on the evening of march nineteenth the day on which the camp fremont treaty was signed major savage set out with the companies of captains bowling and dill captain coikendale's company had traveled to the region of the san joaquin and king's rivers in which locality the commissioners planned to negotiate another treaty the force under the command of major savage followed a route very near that which is now known as the wawona road to yosemite valley on the south fork of the merced at what is now called wawona a nuchu camp was surprised and captured messengers sent ahead from this camp returned with the assurance that the yosemite tribe would come in and give themselves up old chief denaya of the yosemites did come into camp but after waiting three days for the others major savage became impatient and set out with the battalion to enter the much talked of yosemite retreat when they had covered about half the distance to the valley seventy-two indians were met plodding through the snow not convinced that this band constituted the entire tribe savage sent them to his camp on the south fork while he pushed on to the valley his route again was that followed by the present wawona road on march twenty five eighteen fifty one the party went into camp near bridal veil fall that night around the campfire a suitable name for the remarkable valley was discussed lafayette h bunnell a young man upon whom the surroundings and events had made a deeper impression than upon any of the others urged that it be named yosemite after the natives who had been driven out this name was agreed upon although the whites knew the name of the tribe they were apparently unaware that the indians had another name awani for their deep grassy valley the next morning the camp was moved to the mouth of indian canyon and the day was spent in exploring the valley only one indian was found an ancient squaw too feeble to escape parties penetrated tenaya canyon above mirror lake ascended the merced canyon beyond nevada fall and explored both to the north and to the south of the river on the valley floor no more indians were discovered and on the third day the party withdrew from the valley the indians who had been gathered while the party was on the way to the valley escaped from their guard while en route to the indian commissioner's camp on the fresno so this first expedition accomplished nothing in the way of subduing the yosemites in may eighteen fifty one major savage sent captain john bowling and his company back to yosemite to surprise the elusive inhabitants and to whip them well bowling followed the same route taken previously and arrived in yosemite on may ninth he made his first camp near the site of the present sentinel bridge chief denaya and a few of his followers were captured but the majority of the yosemites eluded their pursuers it was during this stay in yosemite that the first letter from the valley was dispatched on may fifteenth eighteen fifty one captain bowling wrote to major savage of his affairs and the letter was published in the alta california june twelfth eighteen fifty one it follows on reaching this valley which we did on the ninth instant i selected for our encampment the most secluded place that i could find lest our arrival might be discovered by the indians spies were immediately dispatched in different directions some of which crossed the river to examine for signs on the opposite side trails were soon found leading up and down the river which had been made since the last rain on the morning of the tenth we took up the line of march for the upper end of the valley and having travelled about five miles we discovered five indians running up the river on the north side 
all of my command except a sufficient number to take care of the pack animals put spurs to their animals swam the river and caught them before they could get into the mountains one of them proved to be the son of the old yosemite chief i informed them if they would come down from the mountain and go with me to the u s indian commissioners they would not be hurt but if they would not i would remain in their neighborhood as long as there was a fresh track to be found informing him at the same time that all the indians except his father's people and the chowchillas had treated he then informed me that if i would let him loose with another indian he would bring in his father and all his people by twelve o'clock the next day i then gave them plenty to eat and started him and his companion out we watched the others close intending to hold them as hostages until the dispatch bearers returned they appeared well satisfied and we were not suspicious of them in consequence of which one of them escaped we commenced searching for him which alarmed the other two still in custody and they attempted to make their escape the boys took after them and finding they could not catch them fired and killed them both this circumstance connected with the fact of the two whom we had sent out not returning satisfied me that they had no intention of coming in my command then set out to search for the rancheria the party which went up the left toward Canyarthia found the rancheria at the head of a little valley and from the signs it appeared that the indians had left but a few minutes the boys pursued them up the mountain on the north side of the river and when they had got near the top helping each other from rock to rock on account of the abruptness of the mountains the first intimation they had of the indians being near was a shower of huge rocks which came tumbling down the mountain threatening instant destruction several of the men were knocked down and some of them rolled and fell some distance before they could recover wounding and bruising them generally one man's gun was knocked out of his hand and fell seventy feet before it stopped whilst another man's hat was knocked off his head without hurting him the men immediately took shelter behind large rocks from which they could get an occasional shot which soon forced the indians to retreat and by pressing them closely they caught the old yosemite chief whom we yet hold as a prisoner in this skirmish they killed one indian and wounded several others you are aware that i know this old fellow well enough to look out well for him lest by some stratagem he makes his escape i shall aim to use him to the best advantage in pursuing his people i send down a few of my command with the pack animals for provisions and i am satisfied if you will send me ten or twelve of old pon watch's best men i could catch the women and children and thereby force the men to come in the indians i have with me have acted in good faith and agree with me in this opinion on may twenty one some members of the invading party discovered the fresh trail of a small party of indians travelling in the direction of the mono country immediate pursuit was made and on may twenty second the yosemites were discovered encamped on the shores of denaya lake in a spot much of which was snow covered they were completely surprised and surrendered without a struggle this was the first expedition made into the yosemite high country from the west and it was on this occasion that the name lake tenaya was applied to bunnell the old indian chief on being told of how his name was to be perpetuated sullenly remonstrated that the lake already had a name piwiak lake of the shining rocks the indians were on this second occasion successfully escorted to the fresno reservation tenaya and his band however refused to adapt themselves to the conditions under which they were forced to live they begged repeatedly to be permitted to return to the mountains and to the acorn food of their ancestors at last on his solemn promise to behave tenaya was permitted to go back to yosemite with members of his family in a short time his old followers quietly slipped away from the reservation and joined him no attempt was made to bring them back during the winter of eighteen fifty one fifty two no complaints against the yosemites were registered but in may of eighteen fifty two a party of eight prospectors made their way into the valley where two of them were killed by the indians 
a remarkable manuscript prepared by stephen f grover a member of this party was obtained by mrs a e chandler of santa cruz who in nineteen o one mailed it to galen clark upon clark's death it was turned over to the pioneer yosemite photographer george fisk when mr fisk died the papers were given to national park service officials for safe keeping in the yosemite museum grover's reminiscences are apparently authentically presented and divulge much that was not recorded elsewhere those familiar with yosemite history as it has been accepted since the appearance of bunnell's discovery of yosemite will recognize a number of incidents that are at variance with previous records grover's narrative a reminiscence on the twenty seventh of april eighteen fifty two a party of miners consisting of messrs grover babcock peabody tudor sherburne rose h and an englishman whose name i cannot now recall left coarse gold gulch in mariposa county on an expedition prospecting for gold in the wilds of the sierra nevada mountains we followed up coarse gold gulch into the sierras traveling five days and took the indian trail through the mariposa big tree grove and were the first white men to enter there then we followed the south fork of the merced river traveling on indian trails the entire time on reaching the hills above yosemite valley our party camped for the night and questioned the expediency of descending into the valley at all our party were all opposed to the project except sherburne tudor and rose they overpersuaded the rest and fairly forced us against our will and we finally followed the old mariposa indian trail on the morning of the second of may and entering the valley on the east side of the merced river camped on a little opening near a bend in the river free from any brush whatever and staked out our pack mules by the river i being the youngest of the party a mere boy of twenty-two years and not feeling usually well that morning remained in camp with h and the englishman to prepare dinner while the others went up the valley some prospecting and others hunting for game we had no fear of the indians as they had been peaceable and no outbreaks having occurred the whites travelled fearlessly wherever they wished to go thus we had no apprehension of trouble to my astonishment and horror, I heard our men attacked, and amid firing, screams, and confusion, here came Peabody, who reached camp first, wounded by an arrow in his arm, and another in the back of his neck, and one through his clothes, just grazing the skin of his stomach, wetting his rifle and ammunition in crossing the river as he ran to reach camp babcock soon followed and as both men had plunged through the stream that flows from the bridal veil falls in making their escape they were drenched to the skin on reaching us h immediately began picking the wet powder from babcock's rifle while i with my rifle stood guard and kept the savages at bay the best i could the other men, with the exception of Sherburn, Tudor, and Rose, came rushing into camp in wild excitement. Rose, a Frenchman, was the first to fall, and from the opposite side of the stream where he fell, apparently with his death wound, he screamed to us, "'Tis no use to try to save ourselves, we have all got to die." He was the only one of our company that could speak Indian, and we depended upon him for an interpreter. Sherburn and Tudor were killed in their first encounter, Tudor being killed with an axe in the hands of a savage, which was taken along with the party for cutting wood. The Indians gathered around as near as they dared to come, whooping and yelling and constantly firing arrows at us. We feared they would pick up the rifles dropped by our companions in their flight and turn them against us, but they did not know how to use them as we were very hard pressed and as the number of indians steadily increased we tried to escape by the old mariposa trail the one by which we entered the valley one of our number catching up a sack of a few pounds of flour and another a tin cup and some of our outer clothing and fled as best we could with the savages in hot pursuit we had proceeded but a short distance when we were attacked in front by the savages who had cut off our retreat death staring at us on almost every hand and seeing no means of escape we fled to the bluff i losing my pistol as i ran 
we were in a shower of arrows all the while and the indians were closing in upon us very fast the valley seemed alive with them on rocks and behind trees bristling like demons shrieking their war hoops and exulting in our apparently easy capture we fired back at them to keep them off while we tried to make our way forward hugging the bluff as closely as possible our way was soon blocked by the indians who headed us off with a shower of arrows two going through my clothing one through my hat which i lost when from above the rocks began to fall on us and in our despair we clung to the face of the bluff and scrambling up we found a little space in the turn of the wall a shelf-like projection where after infinite labor we succeeded in gathering ourselves secure from the falling rocks at least which were being thrown by indians under the orders from their chief the arrows still whistled among us thick and fast and i fully believe could i visit that spot even now after the lapse of all these years i could still pick up some of those flint arrow points in the shelf of the rock and in the face of the bluff where we were huddled together we could see the old chief Tenaya away up in the valley in an open space with fully one hundred and fifty Indians around him, to whom he gave his orders, which were passed to another chief just below us, and these two directed those around them and shouted orders to those on the top of the bluff who were rolling the rocks over on us. Fully believing ourselves doomed men, we never relaxed our vigilance, but with the two rifles we still kept them at bay, determined to sell our lives as dearly as possible. I recall with wonder how every event of my life up to that time passed through my mind, incident after incident, with lightning rapidity and with wonderful precision. We were crowded together beneath this little projecting rock. Two rifles were fortunately retained in our little party, one in the hands of H and one in my own every nerve strung to its highest tension and being wounded myself with an arrow through my sleeve that cut my arm and another through my hat when all of a sudden the chief just below us about fifty yards distant suddenly threw up his hands and with a terrible yell fell over backwards with a bullet through his body immediately the firing of arrows ceased and the savages were thrown into confusion, while notes of alarm were sounded and answered far up the valley and from the high bluffs above us. They began to withdraw, and we could hear the twigs crackle as they crept away. It was now getting dusk, and we had been since early morning without food or rest. Not knowing what to expect, we remained where we were, suffering from our wounds and tortured with fear till the moon went down about midnight then trembling in every limb we ventured to creep forth not daring to attempt the old trail again we crept along and around the course of the bluff and worked our way up through the snow from point to point often feeling the utter impossibility of climbing farther but with an energy born of despair we would try again helping the wounded more helpless than ourselves and by daylight we reached the top of the bluff a wonderful hope of escape animated us though surrounded as we were and we could but realize how small our chances were for evading the savages who were sure to be sent on our trail having had nothing to eat since the morning before we breakfasted by stirring some of our flour in the tin cup with snow and passing it around among us in full sight of the smoke of the indian camps and signal fires all over the valley our feelings toward the noble red man at this time can better be imagined than described starting out warily and carefully expecting at every step to feel the stings of the whizzing arrows of our deadly foes we kept near and in the most dense underbrush creeping slowly and painfully along as best we could those who were best able carrying the extra garments of the wounded and helping them along fully realizing the probability of the arrow tips with which we were wounded having been dipped in poison before being sent on their message of death in this manner we toiled on a suffering and saddened band of once hopeful prospectors suddenly a deer bounded in sight some objected to our shooting as the report of our rifle might betray us 
but said i as well die by our foes as by starvation and dropping on one knee with never a steadier nerve or truer aim the first crack of my rifle brought him down hope revived in our hearts and quickly skinning our prize we roasted pieces of venison on long sticks thrust in the flame and smoke and with no seasoning whatever it was the sweetest morsel i ever tasted hastily stripping the flesh from the hind quarters of the deer h and myself being the only ones able to carry the extra burden shouldered the meat and we again took up our line of travel in this manner we toiled on and crossed the mariposa trail and passed down the south fork of the merced river constantly fearing pursuit as night came on we prepared camp by cutting crotched stakes which we drove in the ground and putting a pole across enclosed it with brush making a pretty secure hiding place for the night we crept under and lay close together although expecting an attack we were so exhausted and tired that we soon slept an incident of the night occurs to me one of the men on reaching out his foot quickly struck one of the poles and down came the whole structure upon us thinking that our foes were upon us our frightened crowd sprang out and made for the more dense brush but as quiet followed we realized our mistake and gathering together again we passed the remainder of the night in sleepless apprehension when morning came we started again following up the river and passed one of our camping places we traveled as far as we could in that direction and prepared for our next night to camp and slept in a big hollow tree still fearing pursuit we passed the night undisturbed and in the morning started again on our journey keeping in the shelter of the brush and crossed the foot of the falls a little above crane flat so named by us as one of our party shot a large crane there while going over but it is now known as wawona we still traveled in the background passing through big tree grove again but not until we gained the ridge above chowchilla did we feel any surety of ever seeing our friends again traveling on thus for five days we at last reached coarse gold gulch once more barefooted and ragged but more glad than i can express an excited crowd soon gathered around us and while listening to our hair-breadth escapes our sufferings and perils and while vowing vengeance on the treacherous savages an indian was seen quickly coming down the mountain trail gaily dressed in war paint and feathers evidently a spy on our track and not three hours behind us a party of miners watched him as he passed by the settlement e whitney grover my brother and a german cautiously followed him the haughty red man was made to bite the dust before many minutes had passed my brother whitney grover quickly formed a company of twenty-five men who were piloted by h and started for the valley to bury our unfortunate companions they found only sherburne and tudor after a five days march and met with no hostility from the indians they buried them where they lay with such landmarks as were at hand at that time i have often called to mind the fact that the two men sherburne and tudor the only ones of our party who were killed on that eventful morning were seen reading their bibles while in camp the morning before starting into the valley they were both good men and we mourned their loss sincerely after we had been home six days rose who was a partner of sherburne and tudor in a mine about five miles west of coarse gold gulch where there was a small mining camp appeared in the neighborhood and reported the attack and said the whole party was killed and that he alone escaped on being questioned he said he hid behind the waterfall and lived by chewing the leather strap which held his rifle across his shoulders this sounded strange to us as he had his rifle and plenty of ammunition and game was abundant afterward hearing of our return to coarse gold gulch camp he never came to see us as would have been natural but shortly disappeared we thought his actions and words very strange and we remembered how he urged us to enter the valley and at the time of the attack was the first one to fall right amongst the savages apparently with his death wound and now he appears without a scratch telling his version of the affair and disappearing without seeing any of us 
we all believed he was not the honest man and friend we took him to be he took possession of the gold mine in which he held a one-third interest with sherburn and tudor and sold it years afterward in traveling at a distance and amongst strangers i heard this story of our adventures repeated as told by h and he represented himself as the only man of the party who was not in the least frightened i told them that i was most thoroughly frightened and h looked just as i felt stephen f grover santa cruz california the commander of the regular army garrison at fort miller was notified of these events and a detachment of the second infantry under lieutenant treadwell moore was dispatched on june eighteen fifty two five indians were captured in the yosemite valley all of whom were found to possess articles of clothing belonging to the murdered men these indians were summarily shot Tenaya's scouts undoubtedly witnessed this prompt pronouncement of judgment, and the members of the tribe fled with all speed to their Paiute allies at Mono Lake. The soldiers pursued the fleeing Indians by way of Tenaya Lake and Bloody Canyon. They found no trace of the Yosemites and could elicit no information from the Paiutes. The party explored the region north and south of Bloody Canyon and found some promising mineral deposits. In August, they returned to Tuolumne Soda Springs and then made their way back to Mariposa by way of the old Mono Trail that passed south of Yosemite Valley. Upon arrival at Mariposa, they exhibited samples of their ore discoveries. This created the usual excitement, and Lee Vining, with a party of companions, hastened to visit the region to prospect for gold. Lee Vining Canyon, through which the Tioga Road now passes, was named for the leader of this party. Tenaya and his refugee band remained with the Mono Indians until late in the summer of 1853, when they again ventured into their old haunts in the Yosemite Valley. Shortly after they had re-established themselves in their old home, a party of young Yosemites made a raid on the camp of their former hosts and stole a band of horses which the Monos had recently driven up from Southern California. The thieves brought the animals to Yosemite by a very roundabout route through a pass at the head of the San Joaquin, hoping by this means to escape detection. However, the Monos at once discovered the ruse and organized a war party to wreak vengeance upon their ungrateful guests. Surprising the Yosemites while they were feasting gluttonously upon the stolen horses, they almost annihilated Tenaya's band with stones before a rally could be effected. Eight of the Yosemite braves escaped the slaughter and fled down the Merced Canyon. The old men and women who escaped death were given their liberty, but the young women and children were made captive and taken to Mono Lake. The story of this last act in the elimination of the troublesome Yosemites was made known to Bunnell by surviving members of the tribe. In 1928, when I talked with Maria, a member of the original Yosemite tribe, her version of the massacre differed widely from the story told by Bunnell. Through her daughter, she stoutly assured me that no Indians died in Yosemite Valley except those killed by whites and those who were ill. I asked her how Tenaya died and where. She explained that while the Yosemites were at Mono Lake, they engaged in hand games with the Monos these games are stirring affairs among the indians a l crober states it is impossible to have seen a california indian warmed to his work in this game when played for stakes provided its aim and method are understood and any longer justly to designate him mentally sluggish and emotionally apathetic as is the wont it is a game in which not sticks and luck, but the tensest of wills, the keenest perceptions, and the supplest of muscular responses are matched. Seen in this light, the contortions, gesticulations, noises, and excitement of the native are not the mere uncontrolledness of an overgrown child, but the outward reflexes of a powerfully surcharged intensity." According to Maria, it was in the heat of such a game that a quarrel developed between Tenaya and his Mono allies. In the fight that followed, Tenaya and five of his Yosemite braves were stoned to death. At least this stoning feature agrees with former accounts of the killing. 
horse stealing and a gluttonous feast in yosemite valley do not figure in maria's story she insists that tom hutchings the yosemite indian befriended by j m hutchings attended to the burning of the bodies and packed the charred remains upon his own back from mono lake to heights cove there a great cry was held for two weeks the remaining yosemite indians and all their friends bewailed the loss of chief tenaya and the four tribesmen a number of parties of miners emboldened by the news of the disbanding of the yosemites visited the valley in the fall of eighteen fifty three during eighteen fifty four no white men were known to have entered yosemite valley by eighteen fifty five several accounts written by members of the three punitive expeditions that had entered yosemite had been published in san francisco papers the difficulties of overcoming hostile indians in the search for gold were far more prominent in the minds of these writers than the scenic wonders of the new-found valley nevertheless the mention of a thousand-foot waterfall in one of these published letters awakened james m hutchings then publishing the california magazine to the possibilities that yosemite presented hutchings organized the first tourist party in june eighteen fifty five and with two of the original yosemites as guides proceeded from mariposa over the old indian trail via wawona and inspiration point to the valley thomas ayers an artist was a member of the party and during this visit he made the first sketches ever made in yosemite ten of these original pencil drawings are now preserved in the yosemite museum in eighteen fifty three james alden then a commander in the united states navy came to california on a commission to settle the boundary between mexico and california he remained until eighteen sixty some time between eighteen fifty six and eighteen sixty he visited yosemite valley probably on his return to san francisco he came upon ayres's work which appealed to him as the best mementos of his yosemite experience and he procured ten originals and one lithograph mrs ernest w bowditch mrs c w hubbard and mrs a h eustace descendants of admiral alden and heirs to these priceless drawings have presented them to the yosemite museum which stands near the spot where some of them were made in the years that have elapsed since these drawings were created they have journeyed on pack mules sailed the seas in old united states men of war jolted about in covered wagons and at last made a transcontinental journey to come again to the valley that gave them birth End of chapter four Chapter 5 of One Hundred Years in Yosemite by Carl Parcher Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5 Tourists in the Saddle. Hutchings and his first sightseers spent five glorious days in luxurious scenic banqueting in the newly discovered valley and then followed their Indian guides over the return trail to Mariposa upon their arrival in that mountain city they were besieged with eager questioners among whom was l a holmes the editor of the mariposa gazette which had recently been established mr holmes begged that his paper be given opportunity to publish the first account from the pen of mr hutchings his request was complied with and in the gazette of july twelfth eighteen fifty five appears the first printed description of yosemite valley prepared by one uninfluenced by indian troubles or gold fever journalists the country over copied the description and so started the hutchings yosemite publicity which was to continue through a period of forty-seven years parties from mariposa and other mining camps and from san francisco interested by hutchings oral and printed accounts organized secured the same indian guides and inaugurated tourist travel to the yosemite wonder spot milton and houston mann who had accompanied one of these sightseeing expeditions were so imbued with the possibilities of serving the hordes of visitors soon to come that they set to work immediately to construct a horse toll trail from the south fork of the merced to the yosemite valley 
galen clark who also had been a member of one of the eighteen fifty five parties was prompted to establish a camp on the south fork where travelers could be accommodated this camp was situated on the man brothers trail and later became known as clark's station it is known as wawona now the man brothers finished their trail in eighteen fifty six old indian trails were followed by much of the mariposa yosemite valley route the toll was collected at white and hatches approximately twelve miles from mariposa at clark's station wawona the trail detached itself from the indian route and ascended alder creek to its headwaters here it crossed to the bridal veil creek drainage and passed through several fine meadows gradually ascending to the highest point on the route above old inspiration point on the south rim of yosemite valley from this point it dropped sharply to the floor of the valley near the foot of bridal veil fall the present-day alder creek and pohono trails traverse much of the old route several years after the pioneer trail was built sheep camps were established on two of the lush meadows through which it passed they were known as westfalls and ostrenders the rough shelters existing here were frequently used by tired travelers who preferred to make an overnight stop on the trail rather than exhaust themselves in completing the saddle trip to the valley in one day usually however westfalls or ostrenders were convenient lunch stops for the saddle parties in eighteen sixty nine charles paragoy built a hotel the mountain view house at what had been known as westfall meadow and with the help of his wife operated a much praised hospice every summer until eighteen seventy five when the coming of the stage road between wawona and yosemite valley did away with the greater part of the travel on the trail the Mann Brothers Trail, which was some 50 miles in length, was purchased by Mariposa County and made available to public use without charge before construction of the stage road from Mariposa had been completed. In 1856, the year that witnessed the completion of the Mariposa Yosemite Valley Trail, L. H. Bunnell, George W. Coulter, and others united in the construction of the Coulterville Free Trail very little if any of this route followed existing indian trails the coulterville trail started at bull creek to which point a wagon road already had been constructed and passed through deer flat hazel green crane flat and tamarack flat to the point now known as gentry and thence to the valley its total length was forty eight miles of which seventeen miles could be traveled in a carriage a second pioneer horse trail on the north side of the Merced began in the village of Big Oak Flat, six miles north of Coulterville, and followed a route north of the Coulterville Free Trail through Garrett to Hardin's Ranch on the south fork of the Tuolumne River, thence to its junction with the Coulterville Trail between Crane Flat and Tamarack Flat. Sections of all of these early routes passed over high terrain where deep snow persisted well into the spring early fall snowstorms in these vicinities sometimes contributed to the hazards of travel the trails found use during a relatively short season the merced canyon offered opportunity to establish a route at lower elevation but the difficulties of construction in the narrow gorge deterred all would-be builders until a short time prior to the wagon road era the heights cove route which came into use in the early seventies partly answered the need for a snow-free canyon trail heights cove where the john height mine was located in eighteen sixty one is on the south fork of the merced some distance above its confluence with the merced river a wagon road eighteen miles in length made it accessible from mariposa tourists using this route stopped overnight in heights cove and then traveled twenty miles in the saddle up the merced canyon to the valley another means of reaching the valley on horseback via the merced canyon was developed soon after wagon roads had been built some yosemite visitors perhaps because of the poor condition of the roads at certain seasons elected to leave the coulterville stage route at dudley's from where they went to jenkins hill on the rim of the steep walls of the merced gorge here a horse trail enabled them to descend to the bottom of the canyon thence up the merced to the valley 
This 30-mile saddle trip involved an overnight stop at Hennessy's, situated a short distance below the present El Portal. Travel in the saddle, of course, was regarded by the California pioneer with few qualms. Likewise, the conveyance of freight on the backs of mules was looked upon as commonplace, and the success attained by these early packers is, in this day and age, wonderful to contemplate. In Hutchings' California Magazine for December 1859 appears a most interesting essay on the business of packing as then practiced among the mountaineers of the gold camps. Pack animals and packers have not yet passed from the Yosemite scene, for much of the back country is, and always will be, we hope, accessible by trail only. Government trail gangs are dependent for weeks at a time upon the supplies brought to them upon the backs of mules. Likewise, those who avail themselves of High Sierra camp facilities are served by pack trains. Present-day packing differs in no essential way from the mode of the fifties, except that it is often done by Indians instead of the old-time Mexican mulatero. What one visitor of the pre-wagon days thought of the saddle trip into Yosemite Valley may be gathered from J. H. Beadle in his Undeveloped West. Beadle visited the Sierra in 1871 and approached the valley from the north. Thirty-seven miles from Garrett bring us to Tamarack Flat, the highest point on the road, the end of staging, and no wonder. The remaining five miles down into the valley must be made on horseback. While transferring baggage, very little is allowed, to pack mules, the guide and driver amuse us with accounts of former tourists, particularly of Anna Dickinson, who rode astride into the valley and thereby demonstrated her right to vote, drink cocktails, bear arms, and work the roads, without regard to age, sex, or previous condition of servitude. They tell us with great glee of Olive Logan, who, when told she must ride thus into the valley, tried practicing on the back of the coach seats, and when laughed at for her pains, took her revenge by savagely abusing everything on the road. When Mrs. Katie Stanton was here a few weeks since, she found it impossible to fit herself to the saddle, averring she had not been in one for thirty years our accomplished guide mr f a brightman saddled seven different mules for her she admits the fact in her report and still she would not risk it and while the guides laughed behind their horses and even the mules winked knowingly and shook their long ears comically still she stood a spectacle for men and donkeys in vain the skilful brightman assured her he had piloted five thousand persons down that fearful incline and not an accident she would not be persuaded and walked the entire distance equal to twenty miles on level ground and shall this much enduring woman still be denied a voice in the government of the country perish the thought with all these anecdotes i began to feel nervous myself for i am but an indifferent rider and when i observed the careful strapping and saw that my horse was enveloped in a perfect network of girths cruppers and circingles i inquired diffidently is there no danger that this horse will turn a somerset with me over some steep point oh no sir replied the cheerful brightman he is bitterly opposed to it we turn again to the left into a sort of stairway in the mountainside and cautiously tread the stony defile downward at places over loose boulders at others around or over the points of shelving rock where one false step would send horse and rider a mangled mass two thousand feet below and more rarely over ground covered with bushes and grade moderate enough to afford a brief rest it is impossible to repress fear every nerve is tense the muscles involuntarily make ready for a spring and even the bravest lean timorously toward the mountainside and away from the cliff with foot loose in stirrup and eye alert ready for a spring in case of peril
the thought is vain should the horse go the rider would infallibly go with him and the poor brutes seem to fully realize their danger and ours as with wary steps and tremulous ears emitting almost human sighs with more than brute caution they deliberately place one foot before the other calculating seemingly at each step the desperate chances and intensely conscious of our mutual peril mutual danger creates mutual sympathy everything animal everything that can feel pain is naturally cowardly and while we feel a strange animal kinship with our horses they seem to express a half-human earnestness to assure us that their interest is our interest and their self-preservative instinct in full accord with our intellectual dread we learn with wonder that of all the five thousand who have made this perilous passage not one has been injured if injured be the word for the only injury here would be certain death one false step and we were gone bounding over rocks ricocheting from cliffs till all semblance of humanity is lost upon the flat rock below such a route would be impossible to any but those mountain-trained mustangs to whom a broken stone staircase seems as safe as an ordinary macadamized road at length we reach a point where the most hardy generally dismount and walk two hundred feet descent in five hundred feet progress indeed half the route will average the descent of an ordinary staircase then comes a passage of only moderate descent and terror then another and more terrible stairway a descent of four hundred feet in a thousand i will not walk before and lead my horse as does our guide but trail my long rope halter and keep him before always careful to keep on the upper side of him springing from rock to rock and hugging the cliff with all the ardor of a young lover for now i am scared all pretense of pride is gone and just the thing i intend to risk is for that horse to stumble and in falling strike me over that fearful cliff at last comes a gentler slope then a crystal spring dense grove and grass-covered plat and we are down into the valley gladly we take the stage and are whirled along in the gathering twilight the vehicle that whirled beetle over the flat of the valley floor was brought to yosemite before roads were constructed and is now exhibited at the yosemite museum as the first wagon in yosemite valley the arrival of visitors prompted the building of shelters the first habitation to be constructed by white men in yosemite was a rough shack put up in eighteen fifty five by a party of surveyors of which bunnell was a member a company had been organized to bring water from the foot of the valley into the dry diggings of the mariposa estate it was supposed that a claim in the valley would doubly secure the water privileges the first permanent structure was built in eighteen fifty six by walworth and height it was constructed of pine boards that were rived out by hand and occupied the site of the eighteen fifty one camp of bowling's party near the foot of the present four mile trail to glacier point it was known as the lower hotel until eighteen sixty nine when it was pulled down and black's hotel was constructed on the spot in the spring of eighteen fifty seven beardsley and height put up a canvas covered house in the old village the next year this was replaced by a wooden structure the planks for which had been whipsawed by hand j m hutchings was again in the valley in eighteen fifty nine and his california magazine for december of that year tells of the first photographs to be made in yosemite c l weed a pioneer photographer apparently working for r h vance packed a great instrument and its bulky equipment through the mountains to the yosemite scenes photography was just then taking its place in american life mr weed's first yosemite subject was this upper hotel of beardsley and height hutchings and weed decided on this occasion that they must visit the fall now called illilouette and hutchings wrote the reader would have laughed could he have seen us ready for the start 
Mr. Beardsley, who had volunteered to carry the camera, had it inverted and strapped at his back, when it looked more like an Italian hurdy-gurdy than a photographic instrument, and he liked the grinder. Another carried the stereoscopic instrument and lunch. Another, the plate holders and gun, etc., and as the bushes had previously somewhat damaged our broadcloth unmentionables, we presented a very queer and picturesque appearance, truly. Hutchings published a woodcut made from the first photograph of the Yosemite hostelry in November of 1859. His book, In the Heart of the Sierras, again alludes to his presence in the valley when this first photograph was taken naturally students of california history have been interested in learning more about the work of weed but in spite of various attempts to procure more information on this photographer of eighteen fifty nine nothing was brought to light it was then something of a thrill to me to find myself in possession of an original print from the earliest yosemite negative that the print is genuine seems to be a fact and the incidents relative to its discovery are worth the telling here its donor arthur rosenblatt resided as a small boy within a few blocks of the hutchings san francisco home on pine street mr rosenblatt and his brother played with the hutchings children in eighteen eighty the hutchings home was destroyed by fire the small boys of the neighborhood searched the debris for objects worth saving and irving and wallace rosenblatt salvaged a pack of large water-stained photographs arthur rosenblatt with forethought mounted these pictures in an old scrapbook he has cherished them through the years that have passed in june nineteen twenty nine he visited the yosemite museum and was interested in the historical exhibits in his study of the displayed materials he came upon a photographic copy of the old drawing of the hutchings house which has been taken from in the heart of the sierras he recognized its subject as identical with one of the old photographs which he had preserved since 1880. He made his find known to the park naturalist and immediately phoned to his San Francisco home and requested that the scrapbook be mailed at once to the Yosemite Museum. Upon its receipt, the old hotel photograph was segregated from the others and comparisons were made with the drawing in the old Hutchings book and with the building itself. The print is obviously from the original weed negative. Hutchings' a visit of 1859 apparently convinced him of the desirability of residing in Yosemite Valley. During the next few years, he spared no effort in making its wonders known to the world through his California magazine. The spirited etchings of Yosemite wonders that were reproduced in the magazine from Weed's photos and from Ayer's drawings did much to convince travelers of the magnificence of Yosemite scenery. The stream of tourists who entered the valley grew apace in spite of the hardships to be endured on the long journey in the saddle. Horace Greeley was one of those who braved the discomforts in 1859 and gave his description of the place to hundreds of thousands in the east. Greeley, foolishly determined to make the 57-mile saddle trip via the Mariposa route in one day. He arrived at the upper hotel in Yosemite Valley at 1 a.m., more dead than alive, yet shortly afterward he wrote, I know no single wonder of nature on earth which can claim a superiority over the Yosemite. His visit was made in a season when Yosemite Falls contained but little water, and he dubbed them a humbug, but his hearty praise of the general wonders played a significant part in turning the interest of Easterners upon the new mecca of scenic beauty. In 1864, J. M. Hutchings came to the Upper Hotel, Cedar Cottage, in the role of proprietor. The mirth and discomfiture engendered among Hutchings' guests by the cheesecloth partitions between bedrooms prompted him to build a sawmill near the foot of the Yosemite Falls in order to produce sufficient lumber to hard finish his hostelry. It was in this mill that John Muir found employment for a time, the hotel was embellished with lean-tos and porches, and an addition was constructed at the rear in which was completely enclosed the trunk of a large growing cedar tree. 
hutchings built a great fireplace in this sitting-room and proceeded to make the novel gathering place famous as the big tree room a winter spent in the frigid shade of the south wall of yosemite valley convinced the hutchings family that their big tree room was not a pleasant winter habitation they built a new and moved into the warm sunshine of the north side of the valley with their own hands members of the family constructed a snug cabin among giant black oaks near the foot of yosemite falls and there spent the remainder of their yosemite days papers letters and photographs relating to the yosemite experiences of the hutchings family have been preserved by j m hutchings daughter mrs gertrude hutchings mills and by the family of his wife the walkingtons of england materials generously donated from these sources take important places in the collections of the yosemite museum and have greatly aided in the preparation of this volume j m hutchings invested heavily in the construction of the sentinel group of buildings and continued to be identified with the yosemite as publicity agent hotel proprietor resident official guardian and unofficial champion until nineteen o two in that year he met his death on the zigzags of the big oak flat road in the nineteen o two register of the hotel which was once the hutchings house is the following entry made by mrs hutchings the second wife of j m hutchings november eighth nineteen o two today leaving the yosemite and all i love best emily a hutchings thinking that some who come here may wish to know a little about the sad tragedy of mr j hutchings death i would like to write a few words because i had never seen yosemite in the autumn my dear husband brought me here for a short holiday on our way to san francisco we started from the calaveras big trees and came via parrot's ferry and its beautiful gorge the wonderful old mining center of columbia and its hitherto only surface skimmed gold fields sonora and its good approaches in its oiled and well graded roads and thence to chafee and chamberlains and to crockers and their hearty hospitality it has been a very pleasant experience to see many friends on the way most of them honored old-timers who have been the thews and sinews of the state and who still hold their own in the rugged strength which has brought them through to nineteen o two from crocker's we started on the last day of our journey october thirty one nineteen o two continuing through the glorious forests of the sierras the autumnal tents of which this year have been of unusual grandeur these beauties all being intensified in yosemite coming down the grade we were impressed beyond expression and when we reached the point where el capitan first presents itself my husband said it is like heaven there was no apparent danger near but one of the horses took fright probably a wild animal was at hand and dashed away when the angel of death reached mr hutchings a few moments later under the massive towering heights of that sun illumined cliff he found him in the full vigor of life and high energetic purpose but his grief-stricken wife prayed in vain that the ebbing tide would stay from the moment the sad accident was known the greatest sympathy and kindness were shown loving hands gave reverent aid and on sunday november second nineteen o two my dear husband was born from the big tree room and its time-honored memories the residents of the valley and many of the indians who had long known him followed we laid him to rest surrounded by nature in her most glorious garb and under the peaks and domes he had loved so well and had explored so fearlessly emily a hutchings november eighth nineteen o two in nineteen forty one and for several years thereafter yosemite valley was visited by cosey hutchings mills daughter of j m hutchings born october five eighteen sixty seven the second white child born in the valley elizabeth h godfrey of the yosemite museum obtained from mrs mills both written and oral statements regarding the pioneer experiences of the hutchings family in yosemite the interviews with mrs mills were recorded by mrs godfrey her manuscript 
chronicles of cosey hutchings mills and mrs mills written reminiscences are preserved in the yosemite museum end of chapter five Chapter Six of One Hundred Years in Yosemite by Carl Parcher Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six: Stagecoach Days. For twenty-three years after the coming of the first sightseers, Yosemite Valley was accessible only by horse trail. The twelve thousand tourists who frantically clung to their Yosemite-bound steeds during this period included many Easterners and Europeans not accustomed to mountain trails they had departed surcharged with enthusiasm but sometimes were caustic in their expressions regarding their mode of conveyance and the crudity of the facilities found at their disposal both en route and in the valley not a few of the comments made by visitors found their way into print yosemite bibliography is not limited to items printed in english the entire world sent representatives to the valley during that first period of travel and foreign literature carried the story of yosemite wonders quite as did american publications the reader may form some opinion of what the printed word has done for yosemite if he will scan the titles which are given in the bibliography appended to this volume in addition to these, of course, are hundreds of books and articles to which no reference has been made in the present work. The merchants of the towns along the routes of approach, as well as the businessmen within the valley itself, felt the need of providing more adequately for the greater numbers that might be brought to their attractions. Foremost among the provisions, naturally, was the construction of wagon roads to dr john t mclean the president of the coulterville and yosemite turnpike company belongs the honor of first making the yosemite valley accessible to wheeled vehicles the coulterville company was formed in eighteen fifty nine it had extended its road to crane flat and at the insistence of dr mclean arranged with the yosemite commissioners to build and maintain a toll road to the floor of yosemite valley the commissioners had agreed that this company should have exclusive rights on the north side of yosemite valley that is no other company was to build a road into the valley from the north for a period of ten years under this agreement the coulterville road was projected in eighteen seventy and completed to the merced river in eighteen seventy four the following paragraph from a letter sent by dr mclean to the president of the yosemite national park commission eighteen ninety nine gives interesting information on the discovery of the merced grove of big trees as well as a statement regarding the opening of the coulterville road while making a survey for this road a grove of big trees was discovered its existence not having been previously known except to indians before these explorations for the building of this road were prosecuted it was determined to carry the road directly through this grove which was named the merced grove by me because of its nearness to the merced river in order to carry the proposed road through this new-found grove of sequoia gigantea it was necessary in order to secure the best grades and shortest distances to yosemite to leave the road already built at hazel green instead of at crane flat six miles farther east it was thought the greater length of road required to start from hazel green and build through the merced grove would be compensated by the advantage the road would have of passing through this grove of over fifty sequoias on the way to yosemite the additional cost in construction of the road by reason of this new departure from hazel green instead of from crane flat was about ten thousand dollars the work of construction was vigorously prosecuted and on june seventeenth eighteen seventy four the yosemite was first opened to travel by wheeled vehicles over this road on that day a number of stage coaches and passenger and freight teams passing over it to the level of the valley the big oak flat and yosemite turnpike company applied to extend their road to yosemite valley after the commissioners had conveyed exclusive rights to the coulterville road the commissioners refused to violate their agreement with mclean's company but the big oak flat company secured the passage of an act by the state legislature which granted the privilege asked in july eighteen seventy four the big oak flat road was completed to the floor of yosemite 
needless to say this second road functioned to the everlasting detriment of the coulterville route in the fall of eighteen seventy four washburn chapman kaufman and company of mariposa sought the right to extend their mariposa road to yosemite valley the commissioners granted their request on the same terms as given to the coulterville company on july twenty second eighteen seventy five amid much celebrating the mariposa road was completed to the valley floor the easier mode of travel introduced by this road construction coupled with the increased publicity from the pen and brush of enthusiasts made for a substantial increase in the number of yosemite visitors in keeping with this wagon road building was the steady extension of the central pacific railroad stockton modesto copperopolis verinda merced and madeira were in turn the terminals seven routes to yosemite made bids for the tourist travel the milton and calaveras route permitted of railroad conveyance to milton those who were induced to take the Berlinda grant springs route took the train to raymond the madeira fresno flats route afforded the railroad coach transportation to madeira the modesto coulterville route meant leaving the rails at modesto the merced coulterville route involved staging from merced the Mariposa route also required detraining at Merced, but the stage route followed took travelers through Hornitos and Mariposa. Those tourists who chose the Milton Big Oak Flat route left the train at Copperopolis and traveled in the stage to Chinese camp, priests, and into the valley on the Big Oak Flat road. Dodgers, pamphlets, and guidebooks furnished by the competing towns and stage companies produced a confusion, to say the least. The conveyances were of two types. At the height of the season, when travel was heavy and roads dry, the standard Concord coach was employed. At other times, a vehicle commonly termed a mud wagon was put to use. During this era of horse-drawn vehicles, the trains of pack mules were, of course, replaced by great freight wagons. Today, in driving over the old wagon roads, one is led to wonder how passenger vehicles succeeded in passing the great freight outfits. Some years ago, in searching through the objects left in a deserted house in the ghost town Bodie, I came upon a manuscript describing staging as it was practiced in that famous mining camp. What the unknown author has to say about the business there applies to neighboring mountain regions and is a reminder of a phase of life of the 80s. The stagecoach is to California what the modern express train is to Indiana, and people unaccustomed to mountain life can form but little conception of the vast amount of transportation carried on by means of coaches and freight wagons even though california may truly be termed the eden of america yet there is not a county in the state but has more or less traffic for the stagecoach and in the northern and eastern part of the state especially there is an entire network of well-graded roads resembling eastern pikes these roads are mostly owned by corporations and consequently are toll roads over these are run the fast stages drawn by from two to ten large horses and the great freight wagons drawn by from fourteen to twenty mules the stage lines have divisions as do railroads and at the end of each division there is a change of horses thus giving the greatest possible means for quick conveyance over each line there are generally two stages per day one each way these carry passengers mail and all express traffic at each town is a wells fargo office and business is carried on in a similar manner to that of railroad express offices telegraph lines are in use along the most important roads the stage lines have time cards similar to railroads and in case a stage is a few minutes late it causes as much anxiety as does the delay of an o and m express a crowd is always waiting at the express office some are there for business others through some curiosity and to size up the passengers a stage from a mining town usually contains a bar of gold bullion worth twenty five thousand dollars which is being shipped to the mint bullion is shipped from each mine once a month but people always know when this precious metal is aboard by the appearance of a fat burly officer perched beside the stage driver with two or three double-barreled shotguns 
He, of course, is serving as a kind of scarecrow to the would-be stage robbers. The average fare for riding on a stage is 15 cents per mile. The manner in which freight is transported is quite odd, especially to the Hoosier. Wagons of the largest size are used. Some of these measure 12 feet from the ground to the top of the wagon bed. Then bows and canvas are placed over this, making a total height of 15 feet at least. Usually three or four of these wagons are coupled together, like so many cars, and then drawn by from 14 to 20 large mules. All these are handled by a single driver. A team of this kind travels, when heavily loaded, about 15 miles per day, the same being spoken of always as the slow freight. In some mining districts, however, where business is flush, extra stages are put on for freight alone. These are termed the fast freights. This business involves a large capital, and persons engaged in it are known as forwarding companies. Even the freight or express on goods from New York is sometimes collected a hundred miles from any railroad, and so, even to those living in the remote mountain regions, this is about as convenient, and they seem to enjoy life as well as if living in a railroad town. The city of Bodie has its entire freight and passenger traffic carried as mentioned above. A short time ago, its population was 10,000. There were three daily papers and free mail delivery, and all the improvements necessary to any modern town or city. The prospect of a hold-up always added to the thrill of staging. Yosemite literature is not replete with road agent episodes, but highwaymen did occasionally appear along the routes to the valley. Black Bart, whose fame as a gentleman stage robber was worldwide during the early 80s, met his downfall in the Yosemite region on his 28th robbery. Black Bart was a very unusual bandit. He took no human lives. In fact, he never fired a weapon in any of his exploits. He carried an unloaded shotgun and bluffed, successfully, 27 times. His forays began in 1877, and his returns were such that he was enabled to reside in San Francisco as a respected and rather dapper citizen. His absence from the city on the occasions of his robberies was accounted for through his story of visiting mines in which he held interests. His desire to be well-dressed and his penchant for clean linen proved his undoing. It was a laundry mark on a handkerchief which brought about his capture after his 28th robbery. Not all the hold-ups along Yosemite roads took place in the distant past. D.J. Foley's Yosemite Tourist for July 10, 1906, carries the following account of a robbery that brings the melodramatic influence of highwaymen into the very end of the period of stagecoach days. It was entitled, Five Stages Held Up by the Lone Highwayman of the Chowchilla, an event full of excitement and interest, and reads, this is the story of a plain, ordinary hold-up of the Raymond Wawona Yosemite stages, and the time was Saturday afternoon at ten minutes of four. The place was about six miles this side of Awani, upon the side of the Chowchilla Mountain, about a mile and a half this side of where a similar but less important event took place last August. The point, carefully selected by the bold robber, was an ideal one. The road here is in the form of the letter S, flattened out, and he selected the upper part of the letter, about all of the other parts being visible. The first stage was in charge of Will Palmer, one of the new drivers. Puffing and sweating, the team of four were rounding the turn in the road, when Walter Brody, who with Mrs. F. J. House occupied the front seat, yelled, Hold up! For up the road, a hundred or more feet away, he saw the fellow jump out from behind some brush, and with his old forty-four Winchester up to his shoulder, he was advancing toward them, and in tones, musical and soft, but determined, he said, "'Throw out that box!' The driver was not aware of the presence of the express box, but it was there, and Mr. Seth Hart threw it out like a gentleman." get out of that stage came the cool determined command supplemented with that ugly-looking forty-four and out they got then he requested one of the ladies miss bowen to pass the hat around which she did under protest 
the other stage was then about due and so he moved down the road a bit to a point where he could keep them well covered and yet not be seen by the approaching stage in the meantime all their hands were up for that big forty four was pointed their way around the turn came the second stage with josh wren as driver no special importance was attributed to the unusual sight believing it to be a joke but the illusion was quickly dispelled when out rang that soft and musical command get out of the stage and out they got the vicious looking forty four being much in evidence he lined them up with the others and then ordered a boy of about fifteen to pass the hat around the boy was badly scared and justly too and was about to comply with the request when up spoke c e mcstay a well-known businessman of los angeles who very kindly offered to take the boy's place to this the robber consented not suspecting the job that was so quickly put up on him for job it was and one too that saved the passengers many dollars and valuables i quickly thought of and settled this proposition said mr mcstay if that boy passes the hat and searches us for this is what he was ordered to do he will not use any discretion and we will all be heavy losers whereas if i can do that honour i shall take but little unless i have to all this and more too was thought out by mr mcstay in less time than it takes to write this and so he acted at once and to him is due the credit of the buncoing that followed for this mild-mannered soft-voiced lone highwayman of the chowchilla was most thoroughly buncoed in this change of hat passers and he suspected it even before the first stage was ordered to move on but that's another story and so in the fullness of his nerve it's the real california los angeles kind too mr mcstay became the apparent chief assistant of the lone highwayman of the chowchilla the third stage drove up in due time with the experience of the second stage duplicated the fourth wagon had a load of ladies and he did not order them to get out though thus honored it was from this wagon that he secured most of his coin the passengers of the fifth wagon lined up with the others on this stage in charge of the driver ed gordon was a sack for the sugar pine mills with over five hundred dollars in it from the zigzag below they saw the crowd lined up and they suspecting the cause helped the driver to hide the sack under the cushion of the seat during the forty-year period which rightly may be considered as the stagecoach era a combination of influences were at work politics sadly affected the management of the state grant brought into existence in eighteen sixty four and sheep threatened the upper country not under the jurisdiction of the yosemite commissioners a national park came into existence which physically encompassed the state park and figuratively engulfed the state management improvements grew apace new hotels and public campgrounds were created trails were built the road system was improved and enlarged electricity developed and a climax reached with the construction of a railroad almost to the very gates of the valley in nineteen o seven the yosemite valley railroad changed the entire aspect of stagecoach days by bringing its coaches to el portal with the advent of this new transportation the long stage ride was no longer necessary but great fleets of horse-drawn vehicles were still employed to convey visitors from the railroad to yosemite valley the various stage companies continued to operate but except for the big tree routes their traffic was greatly reduced the yosemite valley railroad menaced the business of staging but a far more ominous threat had already appeared on the scene motor-driven vehicles were proving to be a success the automobile was introduced to yosemite more than a decade prior to the time when its official entry was permitted by park regulations the first car to climb the yosemite grades was a stanley steamer and its driver was a e holmes of san jose in a letter to v j lloyd mr holmes testifies as follows the trip was made in the month of july nineteen hundred by way of madeira and raymond in a stanley steamer car that was manufactured just outside of the city of boston i was accompanied on this trip by my brother f h holmes 
at that time boyson took our photographs in the valley one at the foot of yosemite falls and another near mirror lake the body that is shown in the photograph is not the original body that came with the car but one that was made just for the trip into the yosemite to what extent noisy automobiles were regarded as a menace may be sensed upon considering the following instruction posted about the park and published with rules and regulations during the later years of the stagecoach era four bicycles the greatest care must be exercised by persons using bicycles on meeting a team the rider must stop and stand at side of road between the bicycle and the team the outer side of the road if on a curve or grade in passing a team from the rear the rider should learn from the driver if his horses are liable to frighten in which case the driver should halt and the rider dismount and walk past keeping between the bicycle and the team nine miscellaneous automobiles and motorcycles are not permitted in the park what the railroad did to the stagecoach the automobile aided by storm did to the railroad on december eleventh nineteen thirty seven as a result of prolonged and heavy warm rains which melted the early snow cover at elevations as high as ten thousand feet a flood developed in the basins of yosemite and tenaya creeks and to a lesser degree in the other yosemite watersheds the notch at the top of yosemite falls was filled almost to the brim with muddy water that was estimated to leap a hundred and fifty feet away from the cliff at the top in the valley itself yosemite creek was half a mile wide and the merced river overflowed its banks in a similar rampage flood scars were clearly visible in the chutes of the valley walls nine years later in the merced canyon far below the valley several miles of both the all-year highway and the yosemite valley railway were destroyed the expense of replacing miles of twisted rails and missing roadbed the loss of passenger traffic to automobile travel and finally the loss of freight revenue when the yosemite sugar pine lumber company sold its major holdings combined to put the railway out of business in 1945, wrecking crews took up the track, and another pioneer railroad disappeared. End of chapter 6「Seven of One Hundred Years in Yosemite » by Carl Parcher Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 – Explorers the influx of travelers even in the days of horse trails and the stagecoach brought a demand to know more of the valley and the region as a whole maps were needed and the desires of travelers for dependable information brought survey parties into the park the first of these the geological survey of california was in yosemite in the years eighteen sixty three eighteen sixty seven Josiah Dwight Whitney was director of the survey, and William H. Brewer his principal assistant. A guidebook based upon their investigations was published in 1868. Most of the mapping was done by Clarence King, Charles F. Hoffman, and James T. Gardner. King was later to become the first director of the United States Geological Survey and to write a dramatized account of his adventures in Yosemite and the Sierra as one of the important contributions to the literature of the range, mountaineering in the Sierra Nevada. Later mountaineers have not always been able to find terrain hazards he described, but they have enjoyed his story, admittedly written for an armchair audience, and have made due allowance for an aspect of greater severity that existed in the Sierra of his day. A party of the Wheeler Survey under George Montague Wheeler, in general charge of the geographical surveys west of the 100th meridian, was in Yosemite in the late 70s and early 80s, and in 1883 produced a large-scale topographic map of Yosemite Valley and vicinity. Lieutenant M. M. Maycum was responsible for the Yosemite work during july and august of eighteen ninety professor george davidson of the united states coast and geodetic survey together with his assistants occupied the summit of mount conus for the purpose of closing a link in the main triangulation which connected with the transcontinental surveys 
large instruments and much equipment had to be transported to the summit of the mountain by pack animals and upon the shoulders of men astronomical observations were made at night and during the daylight hours horizontal angles were measured on distant peaks in the coastal ranges from which heliotropes were constantly showing toward mount conus a small square wooden observatory eight by eight feet housed the twenty inch theodolite mounted upon a concrete pier sixteen twisted wire cables fastened the observatory to the granite mountain top and kept it from being blown away the officers of the coast and geodetic survey party under professor davidson were j j gilbert isaac winston fremont morse and frank w edmonds as a result of his own travels and surveys in the region j n leconte prepared a map of the sierra adjacent to yosemite and hetch hetchy valleys which was published by the sierra club in eighteen ninety three and army officers in charge of park administration did much important map making in the eighteen nineties the united states geological survey began its mapping of the region embraced within the present park in eighteen ninety one and completed the surveys in nineteen o nine r b marshall and h e l fusier surveyed the yosemite dardanelles and mount lyle sheets a h sylvester and george r davis the bridgeport quadrangle operating as they did with limited funds their efforts spread over a vast territory and confronted with a short season they inevitably made some errors on their maps in correct editions of these maps some ridges lakes and canyons have been moved but today's travelers may still find lakes and glaciers which are not on the map and may find a few of these features on the map but not on the ground it is not the errors of sierra map makers however but the measure of success they achieved which is remarkable in the higher reaches of the sierra today it is extremely difficult to discover after a particularly heavy winter which snowfield conceals a lake and which covers merely a meadow or an expanse of ice nor is the sierra itself utterly static at least two small lakes which formed behind dams of glacial moraine have disappeared recently when the dams were undermined perhaps the ultimate in yosemite mapping from the geomorphologist's point of view is the yosemite valley sheet prepared by the united states geological survey in cooperation with the state of california the map is of large scale and the topography the work of francois e mattes is extremely accurate giving it something of the quality of a relief map on a plain surface even the overhangs of the cliffs are depicted the nineteen forty six edition of this sheet falls short in that detail has been lost through the overprinting of topographical shading considered for their practical guidance to the user of yosemite trails the u s geological survey maps of the back country are most important the seven hundred odd miles of maintained trails which make much of the park accessible to the hiker and rider appear upon these topographical maps in true relationship to the physical features through which they pass a useful guidebook covering the routes in and around yosemite valley as well as many of the park trails south of the tuolumne river is the illustrated guide to yosemite valley by virginia and ansel adams in this volume road and trail diagrams are stylized to impart simply and directly information on distances altitudes and relative positions walter a starr jr's a guide to the john muir trail in the high sierra region includes a section part one on the trails of the yosemite national park region and the map which accompanies it relates the high country trails to the road systems of both the east and west slopes this guide published by the sierra club is kept up to date through the production of frequent editions early indian routes before the story of trail building within the national park is presented it is worth while to review briefly the history of the approach routes outside the present limits of the park the trails followed by the indian fighters and miners 
most of the early routes of the white man across the yosemite sierra and out of the valley itself followed indian trails the discovery of arrow points and knife blades on the slopes of some of the higher yosemite peaks indicates that the miwok indians entered the high rough country in pursuit of game their regularly established trade with the monos also is a matter of record indian canyon and the vernal and nevada falls gorge of the merced provided two much used routes out of the valley to the east and the old inspiration point wawona fresno flats coarse gold route gave access to the foothill country to the west there were other ancient routes on the valley walls accessible to an able-bodied indian however except in emergency they probably found little use walker westbound in eighteen thirty three followed the miwok mono trail on the divide between the merced and tuolumne watersheds having reached this divide in all likelihood via the maze of canyons formed by the tributaries of the east walker river and the feeder streams of the tuolumne river white men in pursuit of eastward fleeing indians in eighteen fifty one penetrated to the tenaya lake basin and one party in eighteen fifty two crossed to the east side via bloody canyon as already described this party returned to the san joaquin on a branch of the mono trail which crossed cathedral pass thence into little yosemite valley mono meadows paragoy meadows and wawona in all these travels definite trails of the aborigines could be followed even though many parts of the routes were buried in snow in the foothill region west of the park ancient indian paths enabled gold seekers to reach much of the terrain in which they were interested barrett and gifford nineteen thirty three page one twenty eight report that a mr woods discovered gold on woods creek near the present jamestown tuolumne county in june eighteen forty eight several months before the general rush of miners into the territory of the southern miwok in this locality indian trails connected the several rancherias near the present town sonora with similar indian villages on the merced in the tuolumne country also a primitive transmountain route gave access via sonora pass to the favored locality now known as bridgeport valley the wagon road which was opened here very early in the gold rush period followed closely the route of the indians that there were prehistoric lanes of travel in the high mountains which connected the sonora pass and mono bloody canyon routes seems likely but no record of such north-south trails of the indians has been handed down other than the statements made by walker and leonard regarding their route from the walker river country to the tuolumne merced divide the country south of the merced drainage system was popular both with the miwok and the chukchansi group of the yukats indians grober nineteen twenty five page four forty six four eighty one eighty two five twenty six has recorded the distribution of ancient miwok villages on the south fork of the merced on mariposa creek and on the chowchilla and fresno rivers the primitive trails which connected these villages provided a network of lanes through the hills well known to j d savage and his contemporary forty niners who frequented the hills and stream courses north of the san joaquin river these indian trails became the first routes followed by the miner and his pack outfits a few were improved by their first white users to become fairly good horse trails and later some of them were transformed into wagon roads today the old routes are not easily distinguished from the more recent logging roads which lace back and forth everywhere through the pine country south of the park but the investigative motorist who will check against the maps made prior to the period of logging at the turn of the century may identify the old routes and follow them in exploring the country surrounding wawona mariposa miami nipponawasi heights cove fish camp bear Valley, valley ornitos and several other historic and prehistoric sites in the mariposa region the chukchansi and northernmost of the yokuts occupied the country south of the fesno river and at times crossed that stream and overlapped upon the lands of the miwok 
Prior to the Yosemite Indian War with the whites, 1850-52, they seem to have been on friendly terms with the Miwok. Chukchansi villages close to the border of Miwok territory existed at Fresno Flats, near the present Oakhurst, Madeira County, coarse gold, magnet, and on the San Joaquin near Hutchins. As was true of the Miwok villages, primitive trails connected these rancherias and extended into the country of the Chukaimina on the south and into the Mono territory to the east. In this part of the Sierra, the Monos claimed a goodly part of the west slope, including the present Bass Lake region and the higher country drained by the San Joaquin and Kings rivers. At the time of the Yosemite Indian War, these West Slope Paiutes, Monos, were allied with the Chowchillas and the Chukchansi. The intricate trail system of the densely populated belts, characterized by the Digger Pine, Upper Sonoran Zone, and the Oaks and Ponderosa Pine, Transition Zone, fed westward into the major routes to the Great San Joaquin Valley and eastward to high passes on the crest of the Sierra. Of these last-mentioned routes, those across Sonora Pass, Bond Pass, Buckeye Pass, Bloody Canyon, Agnew Pass, Mammoth Pass, Mono Pass, headwaters of the South Fork of the San Joaquin River, Pine Creek Pass, and Paiute Pass were especially important to the Indians of the Yosemite region. At least some of these passes were traversed by horses before the advent of the white man. More than a few of the Indians of the Yosemite region had, prior to the gold rush, lived in the Spanish mission towns along the coast. Adam Johnston, Indian agent at the time of the Yosemite Indian War, stated of the Chowchilla and Chukansi, the most of them are wild, though they have among them many who have been educated at the missions and who have fled from their real or supposed oppressors to the mountains. These speak the Spanish language as well as their native language. Russell, 1931, page 172. As might be expected, the mountain tribes maintained their long-established contact with the Indian population of the lower valleys, and numerous routes led from the rancherias of the hill tribes out upon the San Joaquin Valley and to the coast. As we have seen, the first penetration of the Yosemite Valley by white men was the result of miners' activities in the Mariposa Hills. In reaching the hills and in entering the valley, the white prospectors of the Gold Rush period followed well-defined trails long used by Indians. Within a few years after the close of hostilities with the Sierra tribes, the events described in the chapter on early mining excitements east of Yosemite took place. Here also the primitive paths of the Indian opened the way. The sheep herder, contemporary with the miner of the high country, also followed the trails of the Indian, and his flocks, together with the cattlemen's herds, did their part in grading the roots and making them conspicuous. Trail Builders when Yosemite National Park was created in 1890, the U.S. Army took over the administration of the federal area, which almost surrounded the state reservation. To aid patrolling in the park, a full program of exploration and mapping was launched. Captain Alexander Rogers, Colonel Harry G. Benson, Major W. W. Forsyth, and Lieutenants N. F. McClure and Milton F. Davis made particularly important contributions to the work. The existing fine system of trails so important to protection and enjoyment of Yosemite National Park had its inception in the plan of the U.S. Army. Almost at once after assuming responsibility for the care of the park, commanding officers initiated construction of trails, and at this juncture the location of primitive Indian trails was no longer a prime consideration in defining routes. The story of trail building by the U.S. Army will be told in a later part of this chapter. It was inevitable that in the exploration for trails and passes, certain peaks should be climbed. The first recorded ascents of Yosemite's peaks are attributed to members of the various survey parties. Perhaps the first was the ascent of Mount Hoffman in 1863 by Whitney, Brewer, and Hoffman. 
King climbed it in 1864, and with Gardner climbed Mount Conness that same year, following with an ascent of Mount Clark, not without adventure, in 1866. Muir climbed Mounts Dana and Hoffman, and far more difficult Cathedral Peak, three years later. Probably the first Yosemite ascent for the challenge of it by a casual tourist was that of Mount Lyell, highest peak in the park, in 1871. According to Hutchings, members of the State Geological Survey Corps, having considered it impossible to reach the summit of this lofty peak, the writer was astonished to learn from Mr. A. T. Tillotson, John Boyce Tillotson, of Boston, after his return to the valley from a jaunt of health and pleasure in the High Sierra, that he had personally proven it to be possible by making the ascent incredible as it seemed at the time three of us found mr tillotson's card upon it some ten days afterward mr tillotson writing to his wife from clark and moores after the climb on mount lyell explained that he ascended nearly to the snow line on august twenty eighth eighteen seventy one and next morning climbed the mountain and reached the top of the highest pinnacle inaccessible according to the state geological survey before eight Tillotson, 1922, pages 89 to 90. John Muir reached the summit of Mount Lyell later that year. Muir undoubtedly climbed in part as a response to the challenge of summits, but could hardly be considered a casual tourist. Four years later, another summit, of which Whitney had said it never has been and never will be trodden by human foot, was ascended by a man climbing merely for the fun of it. In 1875, George G. Anderson, continuing where John Conway, a valley resident, had been stopped by difficulty and danger, tackled the climb of Half Dome with ideas of his own. According to Muir, Anderson began with Conway's old rope, which had been left in place, and resolutely drilled his way to the top, inserting eye bolts five or six feet apart and making his rope fast to each in succession, resting his feet on the last bolt while he drilled a hole for the next above. Occasionally some irregularity in the curve or slight foothold would enable him to climb a few feet without the rope, which he would pass and begin drilling again, and thus the whole work was accomplished in less than a week. Anderson's climb was the beginning of a search for routes to prominent heights in Yosemite that continues today. The fame of Yosemite's wonders was spreading throughout the world, and the advent of stage roads brought a multitude of visitors who preferred to see the region without having to drill to do so. It was imperative that officials in charge of the state reservation improve and multiply the faint Indian trails in order that eager visitors might reach the valley rim and the high Sierra beyond. Because appropriations made by the state legislature for the use of the Yosemite Valley Commission were too small to enable that executive body to undertake a program of trail building, toll privileges were granted to certain responsible individuals in return for the construction of some of the much-needed trails. Albert Snow, John Conway, James McCauley, Washburn and McCready, and James Hutchings were prominent in this contractual arrangement with the Yosemite Commissioners. Two trails antedated the regime of the Yosemite Valley Commissioners, the trail to Mirror Lake and the Vernal Fall Trail. No record exists identifying the builders of these pioneer trails. Albert Snow, 1870, built a horse trail from Register Rock on the Vernal Fall Trail via Clark Point to his La Casa Nevada on the flat between Vernal and Nevada Falls. In 1871, John Conway, working for Macaulay, started construction of the four-mile trail from the base of Sentinel Rock to Glacier Point. The project was completed in 1872. The old mono trail of the Indians between Little Yosemite and Glacier Point was followed by Washburn and McCready when they constructed their toll route here in 1872. 
In 1874, James Hutchings met the cost of a horse trail up Indian Canyon, which by 1877 already had fallen into such disrepair as to make it accessible only to hikers. The disintegration progressed rapidly, and the improved aboriginal route to the North Rim found use during a comparatively few years of Yosemite tourist travel geographically and topographically it has much to commend it in the current master plan of yosemite national park it is carried as the trail proposal calculated to provide the best all-year access to the upper country on the north side of the valley early action is expected which will place it on the map again the Yosemite Falls Trail, started by John Conway in 1873 and completed to the North Rim in 1877, was carried by its builder and owner still higher to the summit of Eagle Peak, highest of the three brothers. John Conway's homemade surveying instruments used in trail building are preserved in the Yosemite Museum by eighteen eighty two the state legislature initiated a program of purchasing and maintaining the yosemite trails which had been privately built and operated on a toll basis the four-mile trail to glacier point was first on the docket a number of the other toll trails reverted to the state at this time through the expiration of leases in eighteen eighty six rights to all remaining trails and to those portions of the coulterville and big oak flat roads within the boundary of the yosemite grant were purchased by the state and made free to the public at the time yosemite national park was established a great part of the northern section of the reservation was quite unknown except to cattlemen sheepmen and a few prospectors and trappers as previously mentioned the u s army officers responsible for the administration of the national park at this time opened a new era in high sierra trail development from eighteen ninety one to nineteen fourteen a succession of officers with a number of troops of cavalry worked with diligence and with great ingenuity in locating trails in contracting for their construction and in counteracting the forces of exploiters who looked upon this great mountain domain as their own at that time the back country trails were limited to the tioga road which had deteriorated to the status of a horse trail a trail along the southern boundary from wawona to crescent and johnson lakes and chiquito pass thence to devil's post pile the old indian route from wawona to tuolumne meadows via cathedral pass two trails to hetch hetchy and lake eleanor from hog ranch near the present mather ranger station and a trail from tuolumne meadows to mount conus this dearth of marked routes was corrected quickly regular patrol routes for protective purposes were established and the soldiers located marked and supervised the construction of the trails needed in policing the area the large t blazed on the trees along the routes of the cavalry remain as evidences of the army's activities and are still familiar signs in much of the yosemite back country by the time of the return of the yosemite grant and the mariposa grove of big trees to federal administration in 1906 the army had worked wonders in providing a system of trails c frank brockman 1943 page 96 summarizes the story as follows the original trail system of 1891 had been extended to include a trail up little yosemite valley to merced lake vogelsang pass and thence down rafferty creek to tuolumne meadows a route that is familiar to all high sierra hikers of the present day the iceberg pass trail to the east boundary of the park had been marked and fernandez pass farther to the south had also been rendered accessible by a trail that branched from the original trail along the southern boundary the present trail from tuolumne meadows up the lyle fork of the tuolumne to donahue pass also dates from this period from tuolumne meadows a trail also reached out into the remote northern portion of the park to the vicinity of glen allen thence up alkali creek to cold virginia and matterhorn canyons from the latter point this route continued westward to schmedberg lake down rogers canyon eventually passing through pleasant valley and over rancheria mountain to hetch hetchy valley 
the ten lakes area was accessible by means of a trail originating on the tioga road near white wolf and from hetch hetchy valley trails radiated to tilt hill mountain miguel meadow lake eleanor vernon lake and up moraine ridge to a point near what is today known as the golden stairs overlooking the lower portion of jack main canyon a route approximating the present forsyth trail from little yosemite around the southern shoulder of clouds rest to tenaya lake had been established and from tenaya lake the point now known as glen Allen could be reached by the mcgee lake trail the routes taken by these early trails were essentially the same as those of the present day and points mentioned will be familiar to all who enjoy roaming about the yosemite back country when the national park service came into existence in 1916 the broad design of the trail system was essentially as it is at present the more important trails constructed during the last years of army administration and in the first years of the national park service regime include the tenaya zigzags built in 1911 the glen allen pate valley route 1917 to 1925 the Babcock Lake Trail, the Yosemite Creek Ten Lakes Trail, the Ledge Trail to Glacier Point, 1918, the Hardin Lake Pate Valley Trail, 1919, Pate Valley Pleasant Valley Trail, 1920, and the Ottaway Lakes Washburn Lake Trail in 1941. Gabriel Sovaluski, who for more than 30 years supervised the construction of Yosemite trails, once outlined for me the amazing story of the evolution of the trail system from Indian routes and sheep trails, Sovaluski, 1928, page 25 to 28. Mr. Sovaluski stated, most of these improvements were made on my suggestion and sometimes at my insistence, yet it is necessary to bear in mind that the credit is not all due to me, even though I did work hard. I share the credit with all the superintendents under whom I have served. They gave me freedom to do the work which I have enjoyed immensely. Colonel H. C. Benson, one of the superintendents referred to by Mr. Zawalewski, wrote in 1924, The successful working out of the trails and the continuation of developing them is due largely to the loyalty and hard work of Mr. Gabriel Zawalewski. Too much credit cannot be given to this man for the development of Yosemite National Park. Brockman, 1943, page 102. The John Muir Trail a fitting climax to the High Sierra Trails in Yosemite National Park is found in that portion of the trail system which has been designated the John Muir Trail. Beginning at the LeConte Lodge in Yosemite Valley, this route follows the Merced River Trail to Little Yosemite, thence along the ancient Indian route over Cathedral Pass to Tuolumne Meadows, up the Lyle Fork of the Tuolumne to Donahue Pass, where the trail leaves the National Park along the east slope to Island Pass, then back to the headwaters of westward-flowing streams to Devil's Post Pile and Red's Meadow on the San Joaquin, south to Mono Creek and other tributaries of the South Fork of the San Joaquin, into Kings Canyon National Park at Evolution Valley, over Muir Pass to the headwaters of the Middle Fork of the Kings, over Mather Pass in the South Fork of the Kings, over Pinchot Pass, Glen Pass, and into Sequoia National Park at Forester's pass thence south to mount whitney at whitney pass the route descends the east slope until it connects with the spur of the el camino sierra at whitney portal above the town of lone pine along the route are a hundred and forty eight peaks more than thirteen thousand feet in height the sierra crest itself is more than thirteen thousand feet above the sea for eight and one half miles adjacent to mount whitney the trail traverses one of the most extensive areas yet remaining practically free from automobile roads in sequoia national park the high sierra trail from giant forest to mount whitney enters the john muir trail on wallace creek a tributary of the kern thus does the john muir trail connect the national parks of the sierra traversing in some two hundred and sixty miles most of the grandest regions of the high sierra 
the national park service the forest service and the state of california have cooperated in making the john muir trail a reality the phenomenal route had its inception during the nineteen fourteen sierra club outing when it was suggested to officers of the club that the state of california might well appropriate funds with which to develop trails in the high sierra upon the death of john muir president of the club appropriation bills were introduced for the purpose of creating a memorial trail the first appropriation of ten thousand dollars enabled the state engineer wilbur f mcclure to explore a practical route along the crest of the sierra from yosemite to mount whitney mcclure made two trips into the sierra and then conferred with the sierra club and officers of the u s forest service before designating the route during the next twenty years several state appropriations were forthcoming and the federal agencies most concerned the forest service and the national park service entered into the program of locating and building the trail the earlier explorations of muir solomons leconte and numerous state and federal survey parties contributed to the success of the undertaking the maps of the geological survey greatly facilitated the work while Stephen T. Mather was still Assistant Secretary of the Interior, and before the National Park Service was created, the Mather Mountain Party of 1916 assembled in Yosemite Valley preparatory to an inspection of the John Muir Trail. This expedition received the support of the Geological Survey. Frank B. Ewing, at that time an employee of the Geological Survey, was Chief Guide and General Manager as an employee of the national park service he has remained in yosemite national park ever since that early march along the john muir trail and has been a principal party to the national park service trail developments previously described the section of the john muir trail in yosemite national park was born and has matured under ewing's personal supervision mr mather's expedition of nineteen sixteen helped to crystallize ideas regarding the muir trail and established it in the official minds and master plans of the new national park service and the u s forest service robert sterling yard a member of the mather party and later editor for the new bureau wrote a sparkling account of the expedition yard nineteen eighteen the route at that time was the same within yosemite national park as it is today but the physical condition of the trail has improved mightily the mather party traveled the john muir trail to evolution valley beyond which the trail was described as impassable to horses from there the party moved westward to the north fork of the kings then south to the tehipite valley kanawires on the south fork and yet further southward to the giant forest today the giant forest is more accessible from the john muir trail via the high sierra trail in promoting the development of the john muir trail and in fostering the use of high sierra trails generally the sierra club has ever been preeminent among the advocates of mountaineering among its members are many individuals who have contributed to the shaping of national park service policies this club which was organized about the same time that yosemite national park was created defined its purposes to explore enjoy and render accessible the mountain regions of the pacific coast to publish authentic information concerning them to enlist the support and cooperation of the people and the government in preserving the forests and other natural features of the sierra nevada for nearly half a century the sierra club has centered its attention upon the security and well-being of the natural attributes of yosemite and has worked to make those attributes known and appreciated the national parks national forests and state parks generally have benefited greatly by the continuous interest of the club and the trail and road system of yosemite national park especially have received its study a new emphasis on the high country with the completion of an all-year highway into yosemite valley and the realignment of portions of the big oak flat and tioga roads the accessibility of yosemite national park to the motorist reached its peak and since that time serious thought has been given to modification of the road system the commonwealth club in a comprehensive report entitled should we stop building new roads into california's high mountains 
concluded that accessibility had already reached if it had not passed a desirable maximum on the basis of a stand for the preservation of mountain wilderness values made by many sportsmen's organizations and the sierra club the national park service gave consideration in its yosemite master plan to the abandonment and obliteration of certain roads which were either superseded by highways or which could be relocated to reduce any detrimental effects upon the mountain landscape colonel c g thompson led in establishing this trend studies were made by the park administration the concessionaire and various organizations outside of the park of means by which present-day visitors who were now arriving by automobile in hurried throngs numbering as many as thirty thousand persons on a single holiday weekend might enjoy the park to some degree at least in the manner that the pioneers had enjoyed it improvement of the trails of outlying facilities education in the means of trail travel and the development of an all-season program that would help to spread the peak of travel into a plateau were steps taken and which are being taken in the attempt to halt the tendency of the public to make of yosemite valley an urban resort high sierra camps were developed as described elsewhere in this book they were visited by travelers afoot or in the saddle and foot burners and pack outfits visited the remote regions of the park where no improvements upon nature are permitted other than those which a man can carry in and carry back out again when he leaves the numbers of people who are attracted to the back country have increased mightily but the congestion of crowds in yosemite valley is still great this fact in itself constitutes a reason for increasing the effort to introduce visitors to the wonders of the wild high country david r brower an officer of the sierra club and an ardent proponent of rock climbing as a sport and an accomplished skier has reviewed the development of these forms of recreation in yosemite he has kindly agreed to my use of the following portion of an enlightening account most of which has not previously appeared in print to a few people fortunately perhaps a very few even a trail detracts a little from the feeling of roughing it too clearly the foot of man or of mule has trod there before them consequently those who would get especially close to nature have become skilled in woodcraft so as to take care of themselves and have then struck off not only from the highways and roads but also from the horse trails and footpaths muir and anderson were pioneers in this form of recreation a few have carried on where they left off routes were found through trailless tenaya canyon to the high country above muir gorge in the grand canyon of the tuolumne presented an obstacle where the waters of that river were confined in a narrow vertical walled box canyon but it has proved not to be an obstacle to good swimmers in periods of low water muir discovered a fern ledge and crossed it along the tremendous face of the yosemite falls cliff until he was under the upper fall itself charles michael years later and william catt to this day followed muir's footsteps and made new ones of their own on other yosemite byways such as the gun sight to the top of bridal vale fall mount star king the lower brother for the most part these men and others of similar bent climbed alone michael was almost to regret it when on an ascent of paiute point he fell a few feet broke his leg and was just able to drag himself back to the valley to climb again when the break had knitted these pioneers of the byways were limited not by lack of enterprise but by lack of modern equipment and the technique for its use both of these required assets came to yosemite in nineteen thirty three a year before that a rock climbing section was formed in the sierra club and its members brought alpine technique which they had practiced and improved in local metropolitan rock parks to yosemite 
skillfully using rope and piton technique and developing their balance climbing to a point where they were able to ascend half dome without recourse to any artificial aids much less cableways members of this and similar sections men and women alike have pioneered many new routes on the valley walls some extremely difficult the present total of routes to the rim exclusive of the trails is forty five spires and pinnacles not accessible by other means were especially challenging the higher and lower cathedral spires were climbed in nineteen thirty four by the party of jules m eichhorn richard m leonard and bester robinson the routes for this and other climbs are described in the yosemite valley section of a comprehensive climber's guide to the high sierra being published serially by the sierra club constructed at present as the ultimate in technical rock climbing was the ascent september second nineteen forty six of the lost arrow by the party of jack arnold robin hansen fritz lippmann and anton nelson the party used more than a thousand feet of rope and many pounds of mountaineers hardware they first managed to throw a light line over the summit two men remained in support at the rim the other two went down a rope to the notch separating the pinnacle from the valley wall and with expert technique were able to climb one hundred feet of the rock's outer face nearly three thousand sheer feet above the valley floor until they could reach the lower end of the line with this they pulled rope over the summit another one hundred feet of climbing on that rope with help from the men on the rim brought them to the top on the evening of the third day on the crowded rounded summit they drilled small holes for two expansion bolts anchored ropes to them and in the moonlight worked across the gap to the rim on the airy swinging ropes needless to say such climbs as this should not be undertaken without the necessary background of experience foolhardy attempts by the over-optimistic to take shortcuts or cross-country routes into unknown hazards all too often result in arduous and dangerous rescue operations by park rangers the national park service requires in yosemite and in other mountaineering parks that persons desiring to climb off the trail register first at park headquarters where as a matter of the visitor's own protection he can be advised whether he has the adequate equipment or skill for his proposed undertaking and where he announces his destination so that rangers will know where to look for him in case of trouble if trails or cross-country routes have afforded the summer visitor a fuller knowledge of yosemite national park and its hidden wild places certainly the improvement of access to various park areas in winter has also increased the enjoyment of the superlative scenery for which yosemite was set aside as a national park in the first place in the first days of winter sports in yosemite snowballing tobogganing skating and sliding down small hills on toe-strapped skis was enough for the winter visitor snow to californians at least was novelty enough in itself but the surge of interest in skiing as a sport of skill that arrived after world war i the resulting vast improvement in ski equipment and apparel and the winter accessibility brought about by use of snow removal equipment inevitably stimulated skiers to demand greatly improved facilities for skiing the national park service required by law to be custodians of outstanding scenic resources for all the people in all seasons for present and future enjoyment very properly made haste slowly other areas administered by agencies whose obligations were less exacting developed facilities far more rapidly and the pressure on the national park service in yosemite and elsewhere was greatly increased ski development in yosemite involved serious scenic economic and geographic considerations the development should not damage the scenic values for which the park was created it should nevertheless be so situated that the skier could enjoy that scenery without going far beyond the areas in which utilities were available otherwise the facilities would be used primarily by persons who wanted only to ski and not to enjoy the yosemite scene such persons could be better accommodated elsewhere 
the area developed for skiing should not be so close to the valley rim as to be dangerous from the concessionaire standpoint the development should make use of and not duplicate hotel facilities already available otherwise it would not be worth the financial risk where the park service was concerned economically it should be close enough to the valley not to require excessive road maintenance and snow removal and should not be too difficult to administer for the park service after all could only spend what congress appropriated in the annual budget as for the man who skied in yosemite for the sake of skiing his wants were simple in the aggregate he wanted high and low cost accommodations built at an elevation where the best snow lay the longest and the slopes were most open he wanted satisfactory uphill transportation to enable him to spend most of his time and energy sliding down he wanted cleared runs and marked trails outlying huts for touring and excellent ski instruction patterned after the best european ski schools he wanted ski competitions scheduled and long courses on which to race he moreover wanted all this in a quantity that would take care of four thousand or more skiers on a weekend without overcrowding the facilities or overburdening his purse what could the national park service do the development at badger pass was the result the ski house up ski rope toes constam lifts the runs of various types the ski school the cleared roads and parking area the ranger ski patrol the marked touring trails and the touring hut at ostrander lake are all part of a development that is compatible with the national park concept improvements will inevitably follow in the development so far full enjoyment has been provided for the tens of thousands of skiers who although they like improvements would still prefer that the administrators of the national parks continue to make haste slowly in any attempt to improve upon the natural scene End of chapter seven Chapter 8 of One Hundred Years in Yosemite by Carl Parcher Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Hotels and Their Keepers. The early public interest manifested in the scenic beauties of Yosemite prompted a few far sighted local men of the mountains to prepare for the influx of travelers that they felt was bound to occur j m hutchings had no more than related his experiences of his first visit in eighteen fifty five before milton and houston mann undertook the improvement of the old mariposa indian trail leading to the valley the next year bunnell developed a trail from the north side of the gorge the first visitors were from the camps of the southern mines chiefly but there were a few from san francisco and interior towns as well during those first years of travel the few visitors expected to rough it they were men and women accustomed to the wilds and comforts were hardly required yet those pioneer hotel keepers who had provided crude shelters found that their establishments were patronized hotel keeping takes a place very near the beginning of the yosemite story the valley was then public domain although unsurveyed it was generally conceded that homesteads within it might be claimed by whosoever persevered in establishing rights the prospect of great activity in developing fremont's mariposa estate caused certain citizens of mariposa to turn their attention to yosemite valley as the source of a much-needed water supply Bunnell reveals that commercial interests had designs upon the valley as early as eighteen fifty five a survey of the valley and the canyon below was made in that year by l h bunnell and george k peterson with the idea of making a reservoir the first house to be constructed there was built in eighteen fifty six by the company interested in this water project bunnell states it was of white cedar puncheons plank split out of logs the builders of it supposed that a claim in the valley would doubly secure the water privileges we made this building our headquarters covering the roof with our tents the first permanent hotel structure was also started that year it became known as the lower hotel during the next decade it and the upper hotel found no competitors at the close of the sixties however the hotel business of yosemite valley flashed rather prominently in the commerce of the state a volume might be written on the efforts of honest proprietors to serve the early tourist 
on the scheming of less scrupulous claimants to capitalize on their yosemite holdings on the humorous reaction of unsuspecting visitors within the early hostelries and finally on the story of later-day developments which now care for the throng that annually partakes of yosemite offerings the full history of yosemite hotels is eminently worth the telling but the present work will be content in pointing to interesting recorded incidents in the story the lower hotel messrs walworth and height were the first to venture in serving the yosemite public height was a member of that family whose fortune was made from the golden treasure of a mine at height's cove walworth seems to have left no record of his affairs or connections the partners selected a site opposite yosemite falls very near the area that had been occupied by captain bowling's camp in eighteen fifty one and set up their hotel of planks split from pine logs the building, started in 1856, was not completed until the next year, and in the meantime a second establishment was started near the present Sentinel Bridge, so the first became, quite naturally, the lower hotel. Cunningham and Beardsley, the same Beardsley who packed Weed's camera in 1859, elected to finish construction of the lower hotel, and they employed Mr. and Mrs. John H. Neal to run it for them j c holbrook the first to preach a sermon in yosemite writes of his stop with mrs neal in eighteen fifty nine i secured a bed such as it was for my wife in a rough board shanty occupied by a family that had arrived a few days before to keep a sort of tavern the woman being the only one within fifty or sixty miles of the place for myself a bed of shavings and a blanket under the branches of some trees formed my resting place a london parson in his to san francisco and back of the late sixties offers the following description of his visit to this earliest of yosemite hotels there are in it uh, the valley two hotels as they call themselves but the accommodation is very rough when g and i were shown to our bedroom the first night we found that it consisted of a quarter of a shed screened off by split planks which rose about eight or ten feet from the ground and enabled us to hear everything that went on in the other rooms which were simply stalls in the same shed ours had no window but we could see the stars through the roof the door opening out into the forest was fastened with cow hinges of skin with the hair on and a little leather strap which hooked on to a nail we boasted a rough gaping floor but several of the other bedrooms were only strewed with branches of arbor vitae as a grizzly bear had lately been seen wandering about a few hundred yards from our hotel we took the precaution of putting our revolvers under our pillows i dare say this was needless as the bears have mostly retired to the upper part of the valley a few miles off but it gave a finish to our toilette which had the charm of novelty next morning however seeing the keeper of the ranch with his six-shooter in his hand and noticing that it was heavily loaded i asked him why he used so much powder oh he said i've loaded it for bears at first g and i were the only visitors at this house but several were at the other one about half a mile off and more were soon expected cunningham a g black p longhurst and g f leidig all took their turn at operating the crude establishment it was under the management of black when clarence king arrived on his pioneer trip with the geological survey of california and one longhurst apparently even then anticipated future proprietorship by engaging in guiding its guests about the valley king describes longhurst as a weather-beaten round-the-worlder whose function in the party was to tell yarns sing songs and feed the inner man his account in mountaineering in the sierra of nevada continues we had chosen as the headquarters of the survey two little cabins under the pine trees near black's hotel black was then owner of the lower hotel they were central they offered us a shelter and from their doors which opened almost upon the merced itself we obtained a most delightful sunrise view of the yosemite next morning in spite of early outcries from longhurst and a warning solo of his performed with spoon and frying pan we lay in our comfortable blankets pretending to enjoy the effect of sunrise light upon the yosemite cliff and fall all of us unwilling to own that we were tired out and needed rest breakfast had waited an hour or more when we got a little weary of beds and yielded to the temptation of appetite 
a family of indians consisting of two huge girls and their parents sat silently waiting for us to commence and after we had begun watched every mouthful from the moment we got it successfully impaled upon the camp forks a cloud darkening their faces as it disappeared forever down our throats but we quite lost our spectators when longhurst came upon the boards as a flapjack friar a role to which he bent his whole intelligence and with entire success scorning such vulgar accomplishment as turning the pancake over in mid-air he slung it boldly up turning it three times ostentatiously greasing the pan with a fine centrifugal movement and catching the flapjack as it fluttered down and spanked it upon the hot coals with a touch at once graceful and masterly i failed to enjoy these products feeling as if i were breakfasting in sacrilege upon the works of art not so our indian friends who wrestled affectionately for frequent unfortunate cakes which would dodge longhurst and fall into the ashes in eighteen sixty nine a g black tore down the lower hotel and on its site constructed the rambling building which became known as black's upper hotel prior to their interest in the lower hotel s m cunningham and buck beardsley had essayed to start a hotel and tent shelter on the later side of the cedar cottage cunningham of later big tree fame dropped this venture so beardsley united with g height and in the fall of eighteen fifty seven began the preparation of the timbers which made the frame of the cedar cottage mechanical sawmills had not yet been brought so far into the wilderness and the partners whipsawed and hewed every plank rafter and joist in the building it was ready for occupancy in may eighteen fifty nine the proprietors of the upper hotel fared none too well in the returns forthcoming from guests ownership changed hands a number of times and business dwindled to a point of absolute suspension in 1864, it was possible for J.M. Hutchings to purchase the building and the land claim adjoining for a very nominal price. At this time, the proposed state park was being widely talked of, and, as a matter of fact, Hutchings stepped into the ownership of the upper hotel property, but a few months before the Yosemite Valley was removed from the public domain and granted to the state to be inalienable for all time mr hutchings was and is to this day sharply criticized by some citizens for his presumption in purchasing public lands that had not been officially surveyed whatever may have been his legal claim it must be admitted that his was the moral right to expect compensation for the expenditure of thousands of dollars for physical improvements made upon his yosemite property hutchings brought his family to the upper hotel in eighteen sixty four and assumed a proprietorship that awakened lengthy comments from many of his journalistic guests being well educated a great lover of nature a journalist himself and blessed with a generous share of sentiment it can be understood why some of his guests felt that there are better things which he could do better testimonies agree that if he was not a huge success as a resort manager his rich fund of information and hospitable enthusiasm more than compensated for his defects charles loring brace visited yosemite a few years after hutchings became a local character there he stopped at the hutchings house and later wrote about his experience one of the jokes current in the valley is to carefully warn the traveller before coming to this hotel not to leave his bedroom door unlocked as there are thieves about on retiring to his room for the night he discovers to his amazement that his door is a sheet and his partition from the adjoining sleep chamber also a cotton cloth the curtain lectures and bedroom conversations conducted under these circumstances it may be judged are discreet the house however is clean and the table excellent and hutchings himself enough of a character alone to make up for innumerable deficiencies he is one of the original pioneers of the valley and at the same time is a man of considerable literary abilities and a poet he has written a very creditable guide-book on the canyon no one could have a finer appreciation of the points of beauty and the most characteristic scenes of the valley he is a guide in the highest sense and loves the wonderful region which he shows yearly to strangers from every part of the world 
but unfortunately he is also hotel keeper waiter and cook employments requiring a good deal of close practical attention as earthly life is arranged thus we come down very hungry to a delicious breakfast of fresh trout venison and great pans of garden strawberries but unfortunately there are no knives and forks a romantic young lady asked in an unlucky moment about the best point of view for the yosemite fall madam there is but one you must get close to the upper fall just above the mist of the lower and there you will see a horizontal rainbow beneath your feet and the most exquisite here a strong-minded lady whose politeness is at an end but here hutchings we have no knives and forks oh beg a thousand pardons madam and he rushes off but meeting his wife on the way she gives him coffee for the english party and he forgets us entirely and we get up good-naturedly and search out the implements ourselves again from an amiable lady please mr hutchings another cup of coffee certainly madam when the english lady from calcutta asked him about some wild flowers he goes off in a botanical and poetical disquisition and in his abstraction brings the other lady with great eagerness a glass of water sometimes sugar is handed you instead of salt for the trout or cold water is poured into your coffee but none of the ladies mind for our landlord is as handsome as he is obliging and really full of information maria theresa longworth known as theresa yelberton by countess avonmore visited yosemite in 1870 where she wrote zanita a tale of the yosemite published in 1872 she made the hutchings entourage a place of her melodrama and florence eldest daughter of the hutchingtons was the heroine zanita john muir of whom in real life the viscountess was enamoured was the hero ken muir a good analysis of yelverton's relationships actual and fictional with the hutchings family and the other pioneer residents of the valley is contained in lenny marsh wolf's great book son of the wilderness not all of the hutchings house features were within its walls j d catton who availed himself of the hutchings hospitality in eighteen seventy walked over to the foot of the yosemite falls and lingered by the way to pick a market basket full of enormous strawberries in hutchings garden one of the first acts of the homesteaders was to plant an orchard and cultivate the above-mentioned strawberry patch the strawberries long ago disappeared but many of the one hundred and fifty apple trees still thrive and provide fruit for permanent yosemite residents during his regime of ownership hutchings added rock cottage oak cottage and river cottage to his caravansary in eighteen seventy four the state legislature appropriated sixty thousand dollars to extinguish all private claims in yosemite valley and the hutchings interests were adjudged to be entitled to twenty four thousand coulter and murphy then became the proprietors of the old hutchings group and in eighteen seventy six they built the sentinel hotel their period of management was brief and the entire property passed to j k barnard in eighteen seventy seven who for seventeen years maintained it as the yosemite falls hotel this unit among the pioneer hostelries was torn down in nineteen thirty eight nineteen forty clark's ranch now wawona galen clark accompanied one of the eighteen fifty five yosemite bound parties that had been inspired by hutchings when that pioneer related his experiences in mariposa upon his first trip to the valley over the old indian trail from mariposa he recognized in the meadows on the south fork of the merced a most promising place of abode his health had been impaired in the gold camps he had in fact been told by a physician that he could live but a short time the lovely vale of the nuchu indians offered solace and in april of eighteen fifty seven he settled there on the site of the camp occupied by the mariposa battalion in eighteen fifty one nowhere in his writings does clark intimate that he expected to be overtaken by early death at the time of his homesteading rather we may believe that it was with foresight and careful plan that he erected his cabin beside the new trail of the sightseer and prepared to accommodate those saddle-weary pilgrims who mounted horses at mariposa and made their first stop with him en route to the new mecca his first cabin was crude a rough pine table surrounded by three-legged stools facilitated his homely service 
as the number of visitors increased clark enlarged his ranch house when ten years of his pioneer hotel keeping had passed charles loring brace was among his visitors brace writes about fourteen miles an easy ride we all reached clark's ranch at a late hour ready for supper and bed this ranch is a long rambling low house built under enormous sugar pines where travelers find excellent quarters and rest in their journey to the valley clark himself is evidently a character one of those men one frequently meets in california uh, the modern anchorite a hater of civilization and a lover of the forest handsome thoughtful interesting and slovenly in his cabin were some of the choicest modern books and scientific surveys the walls were lined with beautiful photographs of the yosemite he knew more than any of his guests of the fauna flora and geology of the state he conversed well on any subject and was at once philosopher savant chambermaid cook and landlord from the scores of books written by early yosemite visitors one might extract a great compendium of remarks on clark and his ranch the proprietor like the grizzly giant was impressive he was invariably remembered by his guests they wrote of his generous hospitality his simplicity kindness honesty wit wisdom and unselfish devotion to the mountains he loved had they known they might have written that he gave too freely of all his mental and physical assets and that as a business man he was not a success the season of eighteen seventy found the ownership of his ranch divided with edwin moore moore assumed general management and clark's became known as clark and moore's the ladies of moore's family introduced a new element in the hospitality of the place and for a few years it assumed an aspect of new ambition extensive improvements however resulted in foreclosure of mortgages and the firm of washburn kaufman and chapman secured ownership in eighteen seventy five and changed the name to wawona a p vivian stopped at wawona in january eighteen seventy eight and wrote although still called a ranch this establishment has long ceased to be mainly concerned with agriculture clark himself exists no longer at any rate in this locality that individual sold his interests some years ago to messrs washburn who run the stage and are now the bosses of the route between this and merced the ranch is now a small but comfortable and roomy inn and during the tourist season is filled to overflowing besides having constructed the twenty-five miles of capital road hence into the yosemite valley messrs washburn are again showing their enterprise by making a road direct to merced the object of which is to save thirty miles over the present mariposa route the yosemite park and curry company now owns and operates wawona it has become one of the largest and most favorably known family resorts in the sierra nevada and retains some of the flavor of its earlier years black's hotel a g black was a pioneer of the coulterville region in the late fifties he resided at bull creek on the coulterville trail visitors who entered the valley from the north during the first years of tourist travel have left a few records of stops made at the blacks of that place the blacks of yosemite valley had not come into existence until the advent of the sixties when mrs black is reported to have purchased the old lower hotel in eighteen sixty nine this first structure was torn down and an elongated shed-like structure built on its site near the foot of the present four-mile trail to glacier point this was the blacks that for nineteen years served a goodly number of yosemite tourists in eighteen eighty eight after the opening of the stoneman house there was among the commissioners a unanimity of feeling that the old shanties and other architectural bric-a-brac that had long done service for hotels and stables and the like should be torn down black's hotel was accordingly removed in the fall of eighteen eighty eight and the lumber from its sagging walls went into the construction of the kennyville property which stood on the present side of the awani hotel Leidig's. The family of George F. Leidig arrived in Yosemite Valley in 1866. For a time, the old lower hotel was in their charge, but when its owner, A. G. Black, assumed its management personally, the Leidig's secured rights to build for themselves. They selected a site just west of the old establishment and constructed a two-story building to become known as Leidig's. This was in 1869 
Charles T. Leidig, the first white boy to be born in the valley, was born in the spring of that year. Mrs. Leidig's ability as a cook was quickly noted by visitors, and no doubt the popularity of her table did much to draw patrons. Many are the printed comments in the contemporary publications of her guests. Here is an example. Leidig's is the best place in the line of hotels. Mrs. L. attends to the cooking in person. The results are that the food is well cooked and intelligently served. There is not the variety to be obtained here as in places more accessible to market. After traveling a few months in California, a person is liable to think less of variety and more of quality. At this place, the beds are cleanly and wholesome, although consisting of pulu mattresses placed upon slat bedsteads. This house stands in the shadow of Sentinel Rock and faces the Great Yosemite Fall, is surrounded with porches, making a pleasant place to sit and contemplate the magnificence of the commanding scenery from Carolyn M. Churchill, 1876. When A.P. Vivian continued on to Yosemite in January of 1878, he found the Leidig family in the valley and commented as follows on his winter reception. Our host was glad enough to see us, for tourists are very scarce commodities at this time of the year, and he determined to celebrate our arrival by exploding a dynamite cartridge that we might at the same time enjoy the grand echoes. These were doubtless extraordinary, but I am free to confess I would rather have gone away without hearing them than have experienced the anxiety of mind and real risk to body which preceded the pleasure. Leidig's, with blacks, was torn down after the Stoneman House provided more fitting accommodations. The little chapel, which had been built near these old hotels in 1879, was moved to its present site in the old village. In 1928, the picturesque old well platform and crane, which had marked the Leidig site, was destroyed. Only a group of locust trees now indicates where this center of pioneer activity existed. The Cosmopolitan, 1872-1932 But the wonder, among the buildings of Yosemite, is the Cosmopolitan, containing saloon, billiard hall, bathing rooms, and barber shop, established and kept by Mr. C. E. Smith. Everything in it was transported twenty miles on mules, mirrors full length, pyramids of elaborate glassware, costly service, the finest of cues and tables, reading room handsomely furnished, and supplied with the latest from eastern cities, and baths with unexceptional surroundings, attest the nerve and energy of the projector. It is a perfect gem. The end of the wagon road was twenty miles away when the enterprise began, and yet such skill was used in mule packing that not an article was broken. I have not seen a finer place of resort for its size. The arrangements for living are such that one could spend the summer there delightfully, and we found several tourists who remained for weeks. The foregoing from J. H. Beadle is but one of scores of enthusiastic outbursts from amazed tourists who wrote of their Yosemite experiences. To say that C. E. Smith figured in early Yosemite affairs is hardly expressive. His baths, his drinks, and the various unexpected comforts provided by his cosmopolitan left lasting impressions that vied with El Capitan when it came to securing space in books written by visitors. The ladies exclaimed over the cleanliness of the bathtubs, a profusion of towels, fine and coarse, delicate toilette soaps, bay rum, Florida water, arnica, court plaster, needles, thread, and buttons, and lay copies of the Alta and the Bulletin for fresh bustles. The men found joy in a running accompaniment of brandy cocktails, gin slings, barber poles, eye openers, mint julep, sansom with a hair on, corpse revivers, rattlesnakes, and other potent combinations. The Cosmopolitan boasted of a certain grand register, a foot in thickness, Morocco-bound, and mounted with silver. Within it were the autographs and comments of thousands of visitors, both great and lowly. The relic is now a part of the Yosemite Museum collection. Tommy Hall, the pioneer barber of Yosemite, found sumptuous quarters in the Cosmopolitan. The old building continued to house a barber shop until it was destroyed by fire on December 8, 1932. La Casa Nevada 
For fifteen years after the coming of visitors, the wonders of the Merced Canyon above Happy Isles were accessible only to those hardy mountaineers who could scramble through the boulder-strewn gorge without the advantage of a true trail. In 1869-70, one Albert Snow completed a horse trail from Yosemite Valley to the flat between Vernal and Nevada Falls, and there opened a mountain chalet, which was known as La Casa Nevada. The popularity of the saddle trip to the two great falls of the Merced was immediate, and the pioneer trail builder, John Conway, extended the trail from Snows to Little Yosemite Valley the next year. It then was usual for all tourists to ascend the Merced Canyon to La Casa Nevada and Little Yosemite. Some hikers undertook the trip from Little Yosemite to Glacier Point but another fifteen years were to elapse before glacier point was made accessible by a truly good horse trail from nevada fall snows was opened on april twenty eighth eighteen seventy one of the prized possessions of the yosemite museum is a register from this hostelry which dates from the opening to eighteen seventy five upon its foxed pages appear thousands of registrations and numerous comments of more than passing interest among these is a very interesting two-page manuscript by john muir describing an eighteen seventy four trip to snows via glacier point and the illy louette p a h lawrence once editor of the mariposa gazette contributed to its value by inscribing within it an account of his visit to yosemite valley in eighteen fifty five years before the chalet was built a party with n h davis united states inspector general commented upon their destination and added this party defers further remarks until some further examinations are made under the date of the original entry is a significant second autograph by a member of the general's party a preliminary examination develops an abundance of mountain dew a great pile of broken containers which had once held the mountain dew is about the only remnant of la casa nevada which may be viewed by present-day visitors for the chalet was destroyed by fire in the early nineties paragoys another pioneer hotel is represented in the yosemite museum collections by a register it was known as the mountain view house and occupied a strategic spot on the old horse trail from clark's to yosemite valley its site is known to present-day visitors as paragoy meadows and the remains of the log building now repose quite as they fell many years ago the hospitality of its keepers mr and mrs charles e paragoy was utilized by those travelers who coming from clark's took lunch there or by those who departed from the valley via glacier point and made it an overnight stopping place the mountain view house register indicates that guests were entertained as early as the fall of eighteen sixty nine it was not however until the spring of eighteen seventy that the little resort made a bid for patronage its capacity for overnight accommodation was sixteen so it is not surprising that a number of writers of the seventies were forced to record in their published yosemite memoirs that they arrived late and sat around the kitchen stove all night in june of eighteen seventy two fifty six tourists were overtaken by a snowstorm in the neighborhood of paragoys it is to be surmised that on that night even the little kitchen did not accommodate the overflow the construction of the wawona road in 1875 revised the route of all yosemite travel south of the merced paragoys was left far from the line of travel and no longer functioned in the scheme of yosemite resorts the harris campgrounds by 1878 the demand for recognition of private camping parties introduced the idea of public campgrounds in yosemite large numbers of visitors were bringing their own conveyances and camping equipment so as to be independent of the hostelries the commissioner set aside a part of the old layman property in the vicinity of the present awani hotel as the grounds upon which to accommodate the new class of visitors mr a harris was granted the right to administer to the wants of the campers he grew fodder for their animals offered stable facilities sold provisions and rented equipment the harris campground was the forerunner of the present-day housekeeping camps and public auto camps which accommodate by far the greater number of yosemite visitors 
an exceedingly interesting register kept for the comments of campers of that day was recently presented to the yosemite museum by the descendants of harris for ten years yosemite campers recorded their ideas of yosemite its management and particularly the kindness of harris upon its pages the following is representative yosemite valley tuesday july twentieth eighteen eighty we have tented in the valley and been contented too so would like to add a chapter to this bible for review of campers who come hither for study or for fun in this valley of god's building the grandest neath the sun when you come into the valley for information go to the owner of this record and directly he will show you where to go and how to go and what to see when there and will sell you all things needful at prices that are fair like moses in the wilderness he'll furnish food and drink for all the tribes that come to him cheaper than you'd think his bread is not from heaven but san francisco bay and that is next thing to it so san franciscans say the water that he gives you running through granite rock is the same as that which moses gave his wonder-stricken flock if you ask him where to angle he'll tell you on the sly down in the indian camp with silver hook and fly in a word this mr harris is a proper kind of man and as a friend to campers in the valley leads the van william b lake fred w lake san francisco e d lake nat webb sacramento if the reader thinks this poetry don't judge me by the style for tis the kind that rhymesters make to pedal by the mile w b l it may be said that from the harris service grew the idea of camp rental which was first practiced by the commissioners in eighteen ninety eight and is now a recognized business of the housekeeping camps department of the present operators in the park glacier point mountain house after the construction of snow's trail to little yosemite in 1871 some good mountaineers made the glacier point trip via little yosemite and the illilouette basin prior to this time j m hutchings had been guiding parties of hikers to the famous point over a most hazardous trail which he had blazed up the ledge and through the chimney occasional references to a shack at glacier point indicate that paragoy had made some attempt to locate there about the same time that his mountain view house of paragoy meadows was open for business however the real claim for glacier point patronage came from one james macaulay who in eighteen seventy seventy one met the expense of building a horse trail from blacks and leidigs over a four-mile route up the thirty two hundred foot cliff to the famous vantage point this new route was at first a toll trail for sixty years it has been climbed and descended by countless thousands of riders and hikers it has been known as the four mile trail for more than half a century and it was not until nineteen twenty nine that its grades surveyed and built by john conway were changed by more skilled engineers it is likely that macaulay owner of the four mile trail made use of the insufficient little buildings on glacier point while his trail was in the making few records regarding the shack or his later mountain house are to be found but lady c f gordon cumming wrote on the tenth of may eighteen seventy eight the snow on the upper trail four mile had been cleared by men who are building a rest house on the summit after arriving at glacier point she records the cold breeze was so biting that we were thankful to take refuge with our luncheon basket in the newly built wooden house later on our way down through the snow cuttings we had rather an awkward meeting with a long file of mules heavily laden with furniture or rather portions of furniture for the new house it is believed that the first firefall from glacier point was the work of james macaulay in eighteen seventy one or eighteen seventy two he sold his trail to the state his mountain house was operated on a lease basis from the commissioners one of his visitors of the early eighties was derrick dodd who concocted something of a classic in the way of glacier point stories it is too good to pass into oblivion derrick dodd's tough story as a part of the usual program we experimented as to the time taken by different objects in reaching the bottom of the cliff 
an ordinary stone tossed over remained in sight an incredibly long time but finally vanished somewhere about the middle distance a handkerchief with a stone tied in the corner was visible perhaps a thousand feet deeper but even an empty box watched by a field glass could not be traced to its concussion with the valley floor finally the landlord appeared on the scene carrying an antique hen under his arm this in spite of the terrified ejaculations and entreaties of the ladies he deliberately threw over the cliff's edge a rooster might have gone thus to his doom in stoic silence but the sex of this unfortunate bird asserted itself the moment it started on its awful journey into space with an ear-piercing cackle that gradually grew fainter as it fell the poor creature shot downward now beating the air with ineffectual wings and now frantically clawing at the very wind that slanted her first this way and then that thus the hapless fowl shot down down until it became a mere fluff of feathers no larger than a quail then it dwindled to a wren size disappeared then again dotted the site a moment as a pin's point and then it was gone after drawing a long breath all round the women folks pitched into the hen's owner with redoubled zest but the genial macaulay shook his head knowingly and replied don't be alarmed about that chicken ladies she's used to it she goes over that cliff every day during the season and sure enough on our road back we met the old hen about half up the trail calmly picking her way home in eighteen eighty two the glacier point road was built traffic to the mountain house was of course doubled by the coming of those who would not walk or ride a horse up steep trails glacier point trails did not fall into disuse however on the contrary attempts were made to make them more attractive anderson's trail from happy isles to vernal fall was constructed at great loss to its builder in eighteen eighty two the present eleven-mile trail from nevada fall to glacier point was built in eighteen eighty five in spite of the variety of routes offered it was planned as early as eighteen eighty seven to provide a passenger lift to the famous vantage point the plan progressed as far as the making of a preliminary survey accommodations at the point remained unchanged until nineteen seventeen when the glacier point hotel was built by the desmond park service company adjacent to the mountain house the two structures function as a unit of the yosemite park and curry company operation the john degnan bakery and store the degnan concession in the old village is not and never was a hotel or lodge however it has catered to yosemite tourists since eighteen eighty four and is the oldest business in the park john degnan an irishman built his first yosemite cabin on the site of the present degnan store soon thereafter on the occasion of a spring meeting of the yosemite valley commissioners of which the governor of the state was a member mr degnan appeared before the managing body to obtain the privilege of building a suitable home the board listened to his plea and the governor observed he seems to be the kind of man we want as an all-year resident one who will take care of the place when it needs care mr degnan in an interview with the national park service official in nineteen forty one stated after that meeting the commissioners came over to my cabin and the governor then assigned to me the land which i now occupy extending from the road to the cliff mrs degnan who was a party to all of mr degnan's pioneering in yosemite valley met the tourist demand for bread gradually her bakery expanded until her ovens could turn out one hundred loaves at a baking the business and the home grew as did the degnan family mary ellen degnan one of the several children born to mr and mrs degnan now manages the modern store and restaurant which evolved from the pioneer venture the record of john degnan's activities in yosemite national park stands as ample testimony to the accuracy of the governor's appraisal he seems to be the kind of man we want he was a respected party to much of the early physical improvement in and about the valley and to the general growth and development of facilities and services mrs degnan died december seventeenth nineteen forty and mr degnan's death occurred on february twenty seventh nineteen forty three the stoneman house 
the demand for more pretentious accommodations than those afforded by the pioneer hotels of yosemite was met in eighteen eighty seven when the state built a four-story structure that would accommodate about a hundred and fifty guests the legislature in eighteen eighty five appropriated forty thousand dollars to be expended on this building another five thousand dollars was secured for water supply and furniture a site near the present camp curry garage was selected and the building contract led to carley croyley and abernathy upon its completion j j cook who had been managing black's hotel was placed in charge the bulky structure was not beautiful architecturally and the first few years of its existence demonstrated that its design was faulty in 1896 the stoneman house burned to the ground camp curry mr and mrs d a curry originated an idea in tourist service which rather revolutionized the scheme of hostelry operation in yosemite and other national parks the curries came to yosemite in 1899 they were teachers who had turned their summer vacations into profitable management of western camping tours in such localities as yellowstone national park their first venture in yosemite involved use of seven tents and employment of one paid woman cook the services of several college students were secured in return for summer expenses the site chosen for that first camp is the area occupied by camp curry success of the hotel camp plan was immediately apparent the first year two hundred and ninety two people registered at the resort however success was not attained without striving the camp was dependent upon freight wagon service requiring two weeks to make the round trip to merced sometimes even this service failed informal hospitality has always characterized camp curry popular campfire entertainments have been a feature from the beginning in one of the first summers in yosemite d a curry revived the firefall which it is presumed originated with james macaulay of the mountain house employees from camp curry were occasionally sent to glacier point to build a fire and push it off for a special party this was done more and more frequently until it became a nightly occurrence mr curry's hello his all's well and farewell delivered with remarkable volume won for him the appellation the stentor of yosemite the coming of the yosemite valley railroad in 1907 gave a powerful new impetus to the growth of camp curry automobile travel of course provided the climax in 1915 the camp provided accommodations for 1000 visitors today it maintains nearly 500 tents and 200 bungalow and cabin rooms the successful operations of the curry business induced would-be competition camp yosemite later known as camp lost arrow was started in 1901 near the foot of yosemite falls it continued to function until 1915 camp awani at the foot of the four mile trail was established in 1908 and continued for seven years the desmond park service company secured a 20-year concession to operate camps stores and transportation service in 1915 this company purchased the assets of the sentinel hotel camp lost arrow and camp awani the two camps were discontinued and a new venture made in the present yosemite lodge the desmond company prevailed until 1920 when reorganization took place and it became the yosemite national park company the curry camping company maintained its substantial position through all of the years of varying fortunes of its less substantial contemporaries in 1925 the yosemite park and curry company was formed by the consolidation of the curry company and the yosemite national park company the new organization was contracted with the government to perform all services demanded by the public in the park some one thousand two hundred and fifty people are employed during the summer months and the investment in tourist facilities totals five million five hundred thousand dollars david a curry did not live to witness the realization of all his plans however prior to his death in nineteen seventeen the march of progress had so advanced as to make evident the place of leadership the curry operation was to maintain
mother curry as manager emeritus still devotes personal attention to the business of the pioneer hotel camp but the active management is in the hands of persons trained by her and her daughter mary curry tresseter her son-in-law dr donald b tresseter until nineteen forty three actively managed the operation and still retains the presidency of the extensive yosemite park and curry company which has grown from the modest start made in eighteen ninety nine big trees lodge the yosemite national park company in nineteen twenty established a tent camp in the upper section of the mariposa grove which consisted of a rustic central building constructed around the base of the tree montana and a group of cabins and tents the camp persisted in this form until nineteen thirty two when it was raised by the yosemite park and curry company and a new lodge was built near sunset point in the grove in its design the new building reflects the charm of pioneer structures of the sierra nevada high sierra camps in nineteen twenty three superintendent lewis advocated the creation of a service that would enable the hiker to enjoy the wonders of the yosemite high country and yet be free from the irksome load of blankets and food necessary to the success of a trip away from the established centers of the park T. E. Farrow of the Yosemite Park Company projected tentative plans for a series of hikers' camps, and in the fall of 1923, I was dispatched on a journey of reconnaissance for the purpose of locating campsites in the rugged country drained by the headwaters of the Merced and Tuolumne. The sites advocated were Little Yosemite, Merced Lake, Booth Lake, the Lyle Fork, Mount Lyle, Tuolumne Meadows, and Glen Allen and Tanaha Lake. In 1924, these sites, with the exception of Lyle Fork and Glen Allen, were occupied by simple camps, consisting of a mess and cook tent, a dormitory tent for women, and a dormitory tent for men. Attendants and cooks were employed for each establishment. With two exceptions, the camps were removed from roads, and equipment and supplies were of necessity packed in on mules. Yet it was possible to offer the facilities of these high mountain resorts at a very low price, and it became apparent that saddle parties, as well as hikers, would take advantage of them. Consequently, they have become known as High Sierra Camps. The camp beside the White Cascade at Glen Allen was established in 1927 and has been very popular. In 1938, the Tanaha Lake Camp was moved to a beautiful location in a grove of hemlocks on May Lake, just east of Mount Hoffman. New trails were built to make this spot more readily accessible from the Snow Creek Trail and from Glen Allen. The Booth Lake Camp, after a few years of operation, was abandoned in favor of a new camp near the junction of the Vogelzang, Rafferty Creek, and Lyle Fork Trails. In 1940, this camp was rebuilt on the banks of Fletcher Creek. The Tuolumne Meadows Lodge is now the only one of these camps situated on a road. Each camp has a setting of a distinctive mountain character on lake or stream. All the camps represent a joint effort on the part of the National Park Service and the concessionaire to encourage and assist travel beyond the roads, where the visitor may appreciate the wild values of the park, which he can hardly observe from the highways. The Awani Hotel, 1927 to date. The Yosemite Park and Curry Company opened the Awani in 1927. Its interior has received quite as much study as has its exterior architectural values. California Indian patterns have been used throughout the hotel in many ways. In the lobby, six great figures set in multiple borders, rendered in mosaic, give color and interest to the floor. In the downstairs corridor and the dining room, other borders and simpler Indian motifs are rendered in acid-etched cement. Painted Indian ornaments play a number of different roles in the building. In the main lounge, the great beams have been related to the contents of the room with borders, spots, and panels of Indian motifs in the colors that appear in the rugs and furniture coverings, while the entire mantel end of the room serves as a bond between the ceiling and the floor with a composite of Indian figures built into one great architectural structure. 
at the top of each of the ten high windows is a panel of stained glass each one different the series forming a rhythmical frieze that bands the room they are all composed of indian patterns the arts of the whole world have been called together to give the awani character and color there are colonial furniture pottery and textiles furniture cottons and linen lights and a clock from england cottons from norway and irons from flanders more iron and furniture and fabrics from france embroideries from italy rugs from spain designs from greece and designs from turkey rugs jars and tiles silks and cottons from persia more rugs from the caucasus and tent strips from turkestan porcelains and paintings from china the sturdy tumoku ware from japan fabrics from guatemala terracotta from mexico and so back to california whence comes the basic motif of the whole the indian design on june twenty three nineteen forty three the awani hotel was taken over by the united states navy and operated as a hospital it functioned as the naval special hospital until its formal decommissioning on december fifteenth nineteen forty five and six thousand seven hundred and fifty two patients were treated the greatest number at one time being eight hundred and fifty three a large and varied naval staff was assigned to duty at the awani including officers nurses waves and enlisted men representatives of the american red cross veterans administration and the united states employment service also participated in the hospital program the awani as a hospital became an adequately equipped and functioning rehabilitation center capable of handling full programs of physical training occupational therapy and educational work the department of occupational therapy especially was recognized as outstanding among service hospitals the program of rehabilitation extended to the out of doors both summer and winter end of chapter eight chapter nine of one hundred years in yosemite by carl parcher russell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine east side mining excitement frequently each summer those who climb to the sierra crest within the yosemite national park come upon the remains of little cities near the mountain tops because the story of these deserted towns now within the boundaries of the park is so interwoven with the story of mono mining affairs in general this chapter will of necessity take some account of the events of the mono basin immediately east of yosemite the first white men to visit the mono country were undoubtedly the american trappers followed shortly afterward by the explorers and immigrants the first records of mineral finds in this region however are those that pertain to lieutenant treadwell moore's indian fighting expedition to the yosemite in june eighteen fifty two which crossed the sierra at the northern mono pass and brought back samples of gold ore the miners who soon followed and with a few others continued to work in the mono region were apparently unthought of by their former associates west of the sierra john b trask in his report on mines and mining in california made to the legislature of california in eighteen fifty five says in my report of last year it was stated that the placer ranges were at that time known to extend nearly to the summit ridge of the mountains but this year it has been ascertained that they pass beyond the ridge and are now found on the eastern declivity having nearly the same altitude as those occurring on the opposite side within the past season many of these deposits have been examined and thus far are found to be equally productive with those of similar ranges to the west and with a favorable season ensuing they will be largely occupied it is probable that trast's statements were based on reports of the work done by lee vining's party at any rate in eighteen fifty seven it became known among the miners of the mother lode that rich deposits had been found at dogtown and monoville and a rush from the tuolumne mines resulted 
the mono trail from big oak flat through tamarack flat tenaya lake tuolumne meadows and bloody canyon following in general an old indian route was blazed at this time and came into great use the sonora pass route was used also and it was over this trail that the discoverer of the famous bodie district later to become the center of all mono mining made his way it is not my purpose however to write the history of mono county or even to make this a lengthy story of mono mining camps rather would i present a concise account of the origin of the relics found by sierra enthusiasts and incidentally tell something about the astonishing town of bodie the name tioga and the beautiful region which its mention suggests are now familiar to thousands who annually drive over the route that bisects yosemite national park the original location of the mineral deposit now known as the tioga mine was made in eighteen sixty consequently it is here that our present chronicle of yosemite summit events should begin in eighteen seventy four william brusky a prospector came upon a prospect hole shovel pick and an obliterated notice at this place the notice indicated that the mine had been located as the sheep herder in eighteen sixty it was presumed by brusky that the original locators were returning to mariposa or tuolumne from mono diggings bodie or aurora when they made the find he flattered the claim by supposing that the original locators probably perished as it is not likely that they would abandon so promising a claim he relocated it as the sheep herder in eighteen seventy eight e b burdick samuel baker and w j bevan organized the tioga district most of the mines were owned by men of sonora although some eastern capital was interested the district extended from king's ranch at the foot of bloody canyon over the summit of the sierra and down the tuolumne river to limbert's soda springs it was eight miles in extent from north to south at one time there were three hundred and fifty locations in the district bennettville now called tioga was headquarters for the great sierra mining company offices which concern was operating the old sheep herder as the tioga mine the company apparently suffered from no lack of funds and operations were launched on a grand scale great quantities of supplies and equipment were packed into the camp at enormous expenditure of labor and money at first the place was accessible only via the bloody canyon trail and mexican packers contracted to keep their pack animals active on this spectacular mountain highway a trail was then built from the busy camp of lundy and that new route to tioga proved most valuable the homer mining index of march fourth eighteen eighty two describes the packing of heavy machinery up four thousand feet of mountainside to tioga in winter the transportation of sixteen thousand pounds of machinery across one of the highest and most rugged branches of the sierra nevada mountains in midwinter where no roads exist over vast fields and huge embankments of yielding snow and in the face of furious windstorms laden with drifting snow and the mercury dancing attendance on zero is a task calculated to appall the sturdiest mountaineer and yet j c kemp manager of the great sierra consolidated silver company of tioga is now engaged in such an undertaking and with every prospect of perfect success at an early day so complete has been the arrangement of details and so intelligently directed is every movement the first ascent from mill creek to the mouth of lake canyon is nine hundred and ninety feet almost perpendicular from that point to the south end of lake oneida a distance of about two miles is a rise of eight hundred and forty five feet most of it in two hills aggregating half a mile in distance the machinery will probably be hoisted straight up to the summit of mount warren ridge from the southwest shore of lake oneida an almost vertical rise of two thousand one hundred and sixty feet from the summit the descent will be made to saddlebags lake thence down to and along levining creek to the gap or pass in the dividing ridge between levining and slate creeks and from that point to tunnel a distance of about one mile is a rise of about eight hundred feet most of it in the first quarter of a mile 
the machinery consists of an engine boiler air compressor ingersoll drills iron pipes etc for use in driving the great sierra tunnel it is being transported in six heavy sleds admirably constructed of hardwood another or rather a pair of bobsleds accompanies the expedition the latter being laden with bedding provisions cooking utensils etc the heaviest load is four thousand two hundred pounds ten or twelve men two mules four thousand five hundred feet of one inch manila rope heavy double block and tackle and all the available trees along the route are employed in snaking the machinery up the mountain the whole being under the immediate supervision of mr kemp who remains at the front and personally directs every movement it is expected that all the sleds will be got up into lake canyon to-day and then the work will be pushed day and night with two shifts of men meantime the tunnel is being driven day and night with three shifts of men under jeff mcclelland such difficulties prompted the great sierra mining company to construct the tioga road that they might bring their machinery in from the west side of the sierra the road was completed in eighteen eighty three at a cost of sixty four thousand dollars in eighteen eighty four one of those financial disasters which always seem to play a part in mining camp history overtook the great sierra mining company and all work was dropped records show that three hundred thousand dollars was expended at tioga and there is no evidence that their ore was ever milled persons who have climbed into that interesting summit region above gaylor lakes have no doubt pondered over the origin of the picturesque village of long deserted rock cabins clustered about a deep mine shaft this is the mount dana summit mine one of the important locations of the tioga district its owners were determined to operate in winter as well as in summer in the homer mining index lundy of october thirty eighteen eighty we are told that the superintendent of this mine visited lundy and employed skilled miners to spend the winter there in december of the same year one of them descended to bodie to obtain money with which to pay those miners he got tripped up on bodie whiskey and was drunk for weeks some of the miners returned to lundy from the summit mine the distance is but seven miles but they were two days making the trip and suffered many hardships later f w pike took charge of the summit mine but no record appears to have been handed down of the final demise of the camp another camp of the main range of the sierra that received much notice and actually produced great wealth was lundy situated but a few miles north of tioga prior to eighteen seventy nine w j lundy was operating a sawmill at the head of lundy lake his product helped to supply bodie's enormous demand for timber in the spring of eighteen seventy nine william d wasson took his family to mill canyon near lundy lake and engaged in prospecting he was followed by c h nye and l l homer who located rich veins of ore j t mcclinton of bodie investigated and was persuaded by what he found to bring capital to the new camp at once homer district was organized at wasson's residence at immigrant flat in mill creek canyon september fifteenth eighteen seventy nine prior to this time the region was included in the tioga district but because the books of the tioga recorder were kept at an inconvenient point a new district was formed l l homer for whom the district was named bowed down by financial troubles committed suicide in san francisco a few months later it is worthy of mention that in eighteen eighty one the sierra telegraph company extended its line from lundy to yosemite valley where it made connection with streets line to sonora a trail was built from tioga over the divide from lee vining canyon into lake canyon thence down mill creek canyon to lundy in eighteen eighty one archie leonard renowned as a yosemite guide and ranger put on a ten horse saddle train between lundy and yosemite the trip was made in a day and a half and the fare was eight dollars one way reports of the state mining bureau indicate that something like three million dollars was taken from the may lundy mine the town of lundy proved to be substantial for many years and the homer mining index printed there is the best of all the newspapers that were produced in the ephemeral camps of mono 
something of the spirit of mining camp journalism may be gathered from the following note taken from a december eighteen fifty number of the index the index wears a cadaverous aspect this week it is the unavoidable result of a concatenation of congruous circumstances the boss was gone to bodie on special business the devil has been taking medicine so that his work at the case has been spasmodic and jerky the printing office is open on all sides and the snow flies in wherever it pleases in the morning everything is frozen solid then we thaw things out and the whole concern is deluged with drippings it is hard to set type under such conditions when the office is dry it is too cold to work when it is warm the printer needs gum boots and oilskins in fact it has been a hell of a job to get this paper out like the other camps lundy is now defunct the may lundy mine has not operated for some years and the building of a dam has raised lundy lake so that a part of the town site is submerged another old camp that many yosemite fishermen and hikers come upon is the aggregation of dwellings about the golden crown at the very head of bloody canyon within mono pass are to be found sturdily built log cabins in various stages of decay from the homer mining index it has been possible to glean occasional bits of information regarding this old camp it is stated in an 1880 number of the index that fuller and Haight or hoyt discovered large ledges of antimonial silver there in 1879 the mammoth city herald of september three eighteen seventy nine contains a glowing account of the wealth to be obtained from the golden crown as the mine was christened and predicts that thousands of men will be working at the head of bloody canyon within one year the mammoth city herald of august twenty seventh eighteen seventy nine under the heading something besides pleasure in store for yosemite tourists contains an enthusiastic letter regarding these prospects when one observes the great number of mining claims staked out throughout the summit region about White Mountain, Mount Dana, Mount Gibbs, and Kuna Peak, it is not surprising to learn that some Yosemite Valley businessmen ventured to engage in the gamble. Albert Snow, proprietor of the famous La Casa Nevada between Vernal and Nevada Falls, owned a mine in Parker Canyon, and A. G. Black of Black's Hotel owned the Mary B. Mine on Mount Dana some twenty miles south of the tioga district in a high situation quite as spectacular in scenic grandeur as any of the camps of the main range of the sierra was lake district in which mammoth and pine city flourished for a time a very brief time in june of eighteen seventy seven j a parker b n lowe b s martin and n d smith located mineral deposits on mineral hill at an altitude of eleven thousand feet lake district was organized here that same summer activity was not great until eighteen seventy nine when great riches seemed inevitable and a rush of miners swelled the population of mammoth and pine city a mill was built for the reduction of ores that were not in sight, and two printing establishments cut each other's throats, the Mammoth City Herald, first on the ground, and the Mammoth City Times. For a time, hope was high. J.S. French built a toll trail from Fresno to Mammoth City. French's saddle trains met the Yosemite stages at Fresno Flats and traveled to Bayshaw, or Besor, Meadows, Little Jackass Meadows, Sheep Crossing, Cargyle Meadow, Red's Meadow, through Mammoth Pass, and then to Mammoth City, a distance of 54 miles. Livestock to supply the Mammoth markets was driven from Fresno Flats over this trail also the first winter after propaganda had inveigled capital to take a chance on mammoth all activities persisted through the winter like those hardy men who suffered the hardships of winter on mount dana the inhabitants of mammoth contended with great difficulties after the winter of eighteen seventy nine eighty it became apparent that the mammoth enterprise was unwarranted the mill constructed with such optimism was poorly built had it been mechanically perfect the fate of the camp would have been no better for the expected ore was not forthcoming mammoth was another of those camps which engulfed capital and produced little or nothing in the winter of eighteen eighty eighty one the place closed 
benton bodie and aurora are quite removed from the area likely to be reached by sierra travelers yet to close this account without some mention of their birth growth and death would be to omit some of the most important affairs of mono mining the first settlement in the region immediately south of mono was made by george w parker who located the adobe meadows in eighteen sixty in 1861, E.C. Kelty sent Black Taylor, a partner of the discoverer of Bodie District, to winter some cattle in Hot Springs Valley, where he was killed by Indians. William McBride entered the region in 1853 and engaged in ranching. Float Rock was found in October 1863 by Robinson and Stewart in the foothills of the White Mountains, east of Benton. In February 1864, these men organized the Montgomery District and succeeded in attracting some attention to their find. The region flourished for a season, but soon declined and became deserted. A few very rich deposits existed, but there seemed to have been no continuous veins. Explanation of Sketch Map of Yosemite Region Discovery in 1833, the Joseph Walker Party crossed the Sierra, entering the Yosemite National Park region from the northeast and approximately following the route shown, Green Creek, Glen Allen, present Tioga Road route. Several members looked into Yosemite Valley on a scouting trip from a camp along the Merced Tuolumne Divide. The party discovered the big trees, Tuolumne or Merced Groves. First Entry in 1849-50, J.D. Savage maintained a trading post and mining camp below Yosemite Valley at the confluence of the Merced and its South Fork. In the spring of 1850, this station was attacked by Indians. Savage then removed his post to a safer location on Mariposa Creek. In December 1850, Indians destroyed this post and murdered those in charge. Savage had established a branch store on the Fresno River, and this station was also burned in December 1850. As a result, the white settlers organized a volunteer company to punish the Indians. A camp of 500 Indians was found on a tributary of the San Joaquin River. The savages were routed. General McDougall then authorized organization of the Mariposa Battalion. On March 19, 1851, they set out for Yosemite, Mariposa Wawona Old Inspiration Point. The battalion's first Yosemite Valley camp was near Bridal Veil Creek. Their second was at Indian Canyon. They explored the valley to the vicinity of Snow Creek Falls and the foot of Nevada Fall. Later, in 1851, Captain Bowling and party returned to Yosemite to make final disposition of the Indians, Fort Miller, Mariposa, Wawona. After two weeks of scouting, they located the Indians at Tenaya Lake via Indian Canyon. The entire tribe was captured and brought to the reservation on the Fresno River. Old Chief Tenaya was later permitted to take his family back to Yosemite. Other members of his tribe soon ran away to join him. In 1852, eight prospectors entered the valley and two of them were killed by the Yosemites. As a result, regular soldiers from Fort Miller under Lieutenant Moore made a third expedition to Yosemite. They followed the fleeing Indians to Mono Lake, Tenaya Lake, Soda Springs, Mono Pass, but captured none of them. On Moore's return, Soda Springs, Little Yosemite, Glacier Point vicinity, Wawona, to Mariposa, he exhibited mineral specimens found in the summit region, and Levining was induced to go to the region to prospect. In 1853, according to Bunnell, Rathi Mono Indians, trailing stolen horses, came over the mountains and ended all Yosemite Indian troubles by virtually exterminating Tenaya's band. But Maria Labrador, a survivor, denied this. East Side Mining Excitement in 1857, five years after Lieutenant Moore's findings, word reached miners west of the range that rich placers had been found at Mono Diggings, Monoville. A rush from the Tuolumne region followed. This excitement lasted but a few years. In 1860, the sheep herder mine was located at Tioga. A prospect hole, shovel, pick, and obliterated notice were found in 1874 by William Bruschi, who relocated the load. The Tioga district was organized October 18, 1878. 
In 1859, Brodigan, Doyle, Garrity, and W.S. Bodie had located rich ground at Bodie. By 1879, there were 8,000 people in Bodie. More than $24 million has been produced here. In 1879, the Homer District was organized at Lundy on ground discovered by C.H. Nye. In 1882-83, a wagon road following the old alignment of the present Tioga Road was built from Crocker's to Bennettville, Tioga, in order that machinery might be brought up the west slope. Road construction cost $64,000, and approximately another $300,000 was spent on development at Tioga. The mine never produced. Present-day Culture the sketch map also shows the Yosemite National Park boundary as of 1946. The boundaries at one time included Mount Ritter and the present Devil's Postpile National Monument. Cherokee Joe found lead ore in a long, low granite hill, which rises abruptly out of the valley west of the White Range, and it was here that Benton started in 1865. James Larne built the first house, and soon the camp became quite populous. Like the others, it attracted a printer, and for a time the Mono Weekly Messenger flaunted taunts at neighboring camps and exploited the virtues and possibilities of Benton. Like the others, too, the camp failed, and the printer moved, this time to Mammoth, where he founded the short-lived Mammoth City Herald. When, in the late 70s, the turbulent town of Bodie was attaining its reputation as a tough place, a newspaper of Truckee, California, quoted the small daughter in a Bodie-bound family as having offered the following prayer, "'Goodbye, God, I'm going to Bodie!' An editor of one of the several Bodie papers rejoined that the little girl had been misquoted. What she really said was, "'Good, by God, I'm going to Bodie!' According to accounts printed when excitement at Bodie was high, the discoverer of the Bodie wealth, W.S. Bodie, came to California on the sloop Matthew Vassar in 1848. He had lived in Poughkeepsie, New York, and there left a wife and six children. In November 1859, Bodie, Garrity, Doyle, Taylor, and Brodigan crossed Sonora Pass to test the Mono possibilities. On their way back to the west side of the mountains, they dug into placer ground in a gulch on the east side of Silver Hill, one of those now pockmarked hills just above Bodie. The partners apparently remained on the ground and equipped themselves to work their claims. In March 1860, Bodie and Black Taylor went to Monoville for supplies and en route were overtaken by a severe snowstorm. Bodie became exhausted, and Taylor attempted to carry him, but was forced to wrap a blanket around him and leave him. Taylor returned to their cabin, obtained food, and then wandered about all night in a vain search for his companion. It was not until May that Bodie's body was found, when it was buried on the west side of the Black Ridge, southwest of the present town. Taylor's fate has already been mentioned. Other miners came into the vicinity and at a meeting with E. Green presiding, Body Mining District was organized. Subsequent usage changed Body to Bodie. In the summer of 1860, prospectors located loads a few miles north of Bodie that were destined to put the Bodie find in the shade for some years to come. This was the Aurora discovery upon which the Esmeralda District, organized in 1860, centered. Aurora forged ahead and became a wildly excited camp, but its bloody career was little more than a drunken orgy. The rich ores which had induced extravagance and wild speculation disappeared when shafts had been sunk about 100 feet, and the excitement came to a sudden end. It is worthy of note that the first board of county supervisors of the county of Mono met in Aurora June 13, 1861. By 1864, it was discovered that the camp was some miles within the state of Nevada, so Bridgeport was named the county seat. Just before the move was made, a substantial courthouse had been built in Aurora, and the old building still stands. E. A. Sherman, first editor of the Esmeralda Star of Aurora, journeyed to the eastern states prior to 1863-64 and took with him a 50-pound specimen of rich Aurora ore. This chunk of rock had been sold and resold at mining camp auctions to swell the sanitary fund, the Civil War Red Cross. Thousands of dollars were added to the fund by this one specimen, just as had been done through repeated sale of the celebrated Austin, Nevada sack of flour. 
mr sherman met mr davis of the pilgrim society in plymouth massachusetts and exchanged the aurora ore for a piece of plymouth rock this fragment of plymouth rock was brought back to aurora and when the mono county courthouse was built there the plymouth rock fragment was placed in the cornerstone the fifty pound chunk of aurora ore still may be seen in the plymouth society's venerable museum mark twain at one time resided in aurora and engaged in his humorous exaggerations his cabin there which even in eighteen seventy eight when wasson wrote his bodie and esmeralda had become somewhat mythical was recently located and moved to reno nevada where it is now exhibited at any rate an aurora cabin was found which might have been occupied by mark twain one part of the original mark twain cabin certainly did not reach reno according to the mammoth times of december sixth eighteen seventy nine bob howland who had lived with mark twain in aurora returned to their old domicile in eighteen seventy nine and took down the flagpole he had it made into canes which he distributed among his friends the truly important activity in the esmeralda region prompted the building of the sonora pass wagon road the mono county supervisors ordered that road bonds on the sonora and mono road be issued on november five eighteen sixty three the road was projected in eighteen sixty four and opened to travel in eighteen sixty eight bodie in the meantime had not given up the ghost although only a comparatively few miners occupied the camp from its discovery until eighteen seventy seven an average of twenty votes were polled each year in eighteen seventy eight however the bodie mining company made a phenomenally rich strike of gold and silver ore and the entire mining world was startled stock jumped from fifty cents to fifty four dollars a share the news swept all western camps like wildfire and by eighteen seventy nine bodie's crowd and reputation were such that the little girl's prayer of good-bye god i'm going to bodie was representative of the opinion held by contemporaries even w s bodie whose body had mouldered in a rocky grave for nearly twenty years was not undisturbed by the activity in 1871, J. G. McClinton had discovered the forgotten Bodie grave while searching for a horse. He made no move to change the burial site, however, until someone of Bodie's several newspapers launched erroneous reports of the whereabouts of Bodie's remains. In the fall of 1879, McClinton and Joseph Watson exhumed the skeleton, exhibited it to Bodie's motley populace, and then gave it an elaborate burial, not excluding an eloquent address by the Honorable R. D. Ferguson. Now these honored bones occupy a grave that is quite as neglected as the sage-grown niche in which they originally rested, but at least they share a place with the other several hundred dead disposed of in Bodie's forgotten cemetery. To make Bodie's story short, let it suffice to say that for four years the camp maintained the same high-pressure activity. Men mined, milled, played, fought, and hundreds died some fifty companies tunneled into bodie bluff and all but turned it inside out probably twenty-five millions in bullion were conveyed in bodie stagecoaches to the railroad at carson city nevada perhaps an amount almost as great was sunk into the hills by the numerous companies that carried on frenzied activity but produced no wealth only the Standard and the Bodie had proved to be immensely profitable, and in 1881 the stock market went to pieces. Bodie's mines, one after another, closed down. In 1887, the Standard and the Bodie consolidated and operated sanely and profitably for some twenty years longer. But the camp's mad days of wild speculation and excessive living were gone. Gradually, activity ceased, and a few years ago the picturesque blocks of frame buildings were consumed by flames. To meet the opportunities of 1941, some several hundred people occupied Bodie to salvage minerals from her old mine dumps, but there was little progress in rebuilding the town. It is interesting to note, however, that the Bodie Miners Union Hall of the 70s still stands. Within it, Mr. and Mrs. D. V. Kane have exhibited the relics of Bodie's boom days. End of chapter 9
Chapter 10 of 100 Years in Yosemite by Carl Parcher Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 The Interpreters. The superlative qualities of the scenic features and such outstanding biological characteristics as the forests of the Yosemite region compelled the interest of scientists as soon as the area received wide mention in the press. The miners' concern with mineral values directed the attention of mining engineers upon the sections both east and west of Yosemite Valley. As early as 1853, Professor John B. Trask attempted to explain the geology of the Tuolumne Merced watersheds. The California State Geological Survey was established in 1860. Josiah Dwight Whitney of Harvard University was made state geologist. He enlisted the services of several young men who were destined to become leaders in American geological and topographical work. William H. Brewer, William Ashburner, Chester Averill, Charles Hoffman, William M. Gabb, James T. Gardner, and Clarence King were among the members of the Whitney Survey. Over a period of ten years, they penetrated the remote and unknown canyons and climbed the peaks of the Sierra Nevada, recording their findings and mapping the wild terrain. They made the first contribution to accurate and detailed knowledge of the region embraced in the present Yosemite National Park. In 1863, Whitney himself began studies in the Yosemite region. He concluded that the Yosemite Valley resulted from a sinking of a local block of the Earth's crust. His assistant, King, recognized evidences of a glacier's having passed through the valley, but Whitney, although he published this fact in his official report, later stoutly denied it. Whitney at first believed the domes to have risen up as great bubbles of fluid granite. Galen Clark, while not a trained geologist, was a careful observer and commanded considerable respect from the public. He believed that Yosemite Valley originated through the explosion of close-set domes of molten rock and that water action then cleared the gorge of debris and left it in its present form. King, although he was the first to observe glacier polish and moraines in the Yosemite Valley, did not attribute any great part of the excavation of the valley to the glacier. He regarded the Yosemite as a simple crack or rent in the crust of the earth. John Muir, who followed these early students, maintained that ice had accomplished nearly all the Yosemite sculpturing. H. W. Turner, on the other hand, found no reason to believe that anything other than stream action, influenced by the peculiar rock structure, had had an important role in the origin of the valley, although he recognized that it had been the pathway of a glacier. Joseph LeConte, W. H. Brewer, M. G. Maycomb, George Davidson, I. C. Russell, George F. Becker, Willard D. Johnson, E. C. Andrews, Douglas W. Johnson, F. L. Ransom, J. N. LeConte, A. C. Lawson, Elliot Blackwelder, Ernest Cluse, John P. Buwalda, M. E. Beatty, and George D. Lauderback have all studied the geology of the Yosemite Valley or the Yosemite region and have published the results of their work. The influences of the topography of the Sierra Nevada upon meteorological conditions were studied and reported upon by W. A. Glassford in the early 90s. Prior to 1913, however, no one had made a comprehensive study of the geology of the entire Yosemite region. Ideas regarding the origin of the valley and related features were still hazy. In 1913, at the instance of the Sierra Club, the U.S. Geological Survey sent out a party of scientists to begin a systematic and detailed investigation. These men were Francois E. Mates and Frank C. Calkins. The former was to study especially the history of the development of the Yosemite Valley, the latter to study the different types of rocks. In the years that have elapsed, Mathes has carried his investigations over the entire Yosemite region and into the areas to north and south. Thus, he has worked out quite definitely, back to its beginning, the story of the origin of the Yosemite and of the other valleys of the same type in the Sierra Nevada. His conclusions, published by the government, have stood the test of criticism by other members of his profession. An extensive bibliography of the geology of Yosemite appears in A Bibliography of National Parks and Monuments West of the Mississippi River, Volume 1, 1941, pages 95 to 106. 
The list of Mate's contributions to Yosemite literature is long. Probably the most significant and generally useful item is Geologic History of the Yosemite Valley. This is a thorough report on the author's study and also contains a paper by Frank C. Calkins on the granite rocks of the Yosemite region. Indians provided the motive for the first penetration of the whites into Yosemite Valley, but the ethnology of the region received scant attention during the first years of contacts with the Aborigines. Lafayette H. Bunnell, a member of the Discovery Party of 1851, has provided satisfying accounts of the primitive Awaniches in the valley, and Galen Clark, who was intimately acquainted with members of the original band, recorded their history, customs, and traditions many years after his early contacts with them. In the early 70s, Stephen Powers gave to them the attention of a professional ethnologist, and Constance F. Gordon Cumming studied them in the 80s. In 1898, the Bureau of American Ethnology investigated the Indians of the Tuolumne country, and William H. Holmes published the findings. Samuel A. Barrett first published on the geography and dialects of the Miwok, of which the Yosemite Indians were a part, in 1908. Barrett's work with the Miwok continued for many years, and he is credited with several important papers. Alfred L. Kroeber, a leading authority on California Indians, first published on the Miwok in 1907, and since has published extensively on the Awaniches and all their neighbors. E. W. Gifford, who has been associated with both Barrett and Kroeber in the ethnological work of the University of California, has made important contributions to the published history and culture of the Miwok. His first paper on his work in the Yosemite region appeared in 1916. C. Hart Merriam devoted careful study to the myth, folk tales, and village sites of the Yosemite Indians early in the 1900s, and his published accounts appeared in 1910 and 1917. Mrs. H. J. Taylor, working in Yosemite Valley, obtained much important data from one of the last members of the Yosemite band, Maria Labrado, and since 1932 has published several significant items. In 1941, Elizabeth H. Godfrey of the Yosemite Museum staff compiled a popular summary of the work done on the Yosemites entitled Yosemite Indians Yesterday and Today, Yosemite Nature Notes, 1941. The Yosemite Museum collections of objects and documents include valuable local Indian materials which provide a most interesting and convincing story of the Awaniches. In the field of biology, the Yosemite forest attracted the first attention of scientists. Botanists generally agree that in the big tree, the sugar pine, the yellow pine, ponderosa and jeffrey, the red and white firs, and the incense cedar of the Sierra is the finest and most remarkable group of conifers in the world. The big tree, Sequoia gigantia, of course is the most phenomenal and claims first place, chronologically, in the scientific literature. In the number of workers concerned with it, and in the quantity of their writings, the big tree also holds a respected place. Among the early writers who dealt with the big tree groves of the present Yosemite National Park were Hutchings, Whitney, Asa Gray, Isaac Bromley, J. Otis Williams, Muir, Bunnell, and Clark. The latter was among the first to study the sequoia groves of the Yosemite, but he did not publish for nearly half a century after he made his first observations. Following the early announcements of the existence of the Tuolumne, Merced, and Mariposa groves, another group of botanists and semi-professional workers concentrated upon the study of the big tree. Walter G. Marshall, Charles Palash, Paul Shoup, Julius Stark, George Dollar, and W. R. Dudley made their contributions at this time, and Muir redoubled his initial efforts. After the turn of the century, botanists and foresters in numbers concentrated upon the big tree. Their publications are too numerous to list, but special mention must be made of the work of Willis L. Jepson, George B. Sudworth, Ellsworth Huntington, James C. Shirley, L. F. Cook, and the continued inspired writing of Muir. The sequoia, oldest living thing, is now and always will be a fascinating subject for scientific and philosophical study. 
until a thorough investigation of the ecology of a grove of giant sequoias has been made and its result published there remains a practical need for research in this realm botanical studies other than investigations of the big tree were limited in the pioneer days to the work of john muir in the early 1900s harvey m and carlotta c hall did important work in the present national park and their published works continue to be dependable guides for present-day botanists enid michael long a resident in yosemite valley was untiring in her field studies and her many published articles about the flora of the park are of importance to all investigators carl w sharsmith has studied intensively in the high mountain gardens of the park mary c tresseter published a very useful guide to the trees of the park in 1932 emil f ernst has studied the forests and forest enemies in the park for many years willis l jepson's work constitutes a substantial basis for all botanical studies in yosemites as it is for other parts of the state and the investigations of leroy abrams nineteen eleven have been important to subsequent workers the studies of george m wright during his residence in the park in the nineteen twenties resulted in significant papers on life zones in yosemite and were the groundwork for the later important studies by him and his associates in founding and conducting broad biological surveys in the entire national park system an undertaking briefly described later in this chapter the yosemite fauna elicited no particular attention from pioneers other than james capon adams who in eighteen fifty four captured grizzly bears for exhibit purposes and john muir who applied himself to certain bird and mammal studies quite as enthusiastically as he did to botany and geology in the opening years of the twentieth century a few bird students among them w otto emerson w k fisher virginia garland c a keeler m s ray and o widman published on their observations in the present park but not until joseph grinnell initiated his publication program in nineteen eleven did yosemite zoology find reasonable representation in scientific journals grinnell and his staff from the museum of vertebrate zoology of the university of california began formal field work in yosemite in the fall of nineteen fourteen and continued through nineteen twenty in making a complete survey of the vertebrate natural history of the region grinnell tracy i storer walter p taylor joseph dixon charles l camp gordon f ferris charles d holliger and donald d mclean participated in the work the results of this survey grinnell and storer's animal life in the yosemite published by the university of california press in nineteen twenty four constitutes an exhaustive and most useful reference on the subject david starr jordan considered it the best original work on life histories published in the west this study like the geological works by mattis was endorsed and facilitated by the sierra club after the museum of vertebrate zoology paved the way wildlife studies in the park increased and yosemite found better representation in the biological literature most of the workers who had participated in grinnell's survey published extensively others who made notable contributions are charles w and enid michael barton w everman a b howell vernon bailey j m miller john a comstock e o essig and edwin c van dyke after 1920, when the National Park Service instituted a park naturalist program in Yosemite, the regular and seasonal employees of the naturalist department made many contributions to the scientific knowledge of the park. Among the permanent park naturalists who conducted biological investigations are Ansel F. Hall, Carl P. Russell, George M. Wright, C. A. Harwell, C. C. Presnell, A. E. Borrell, M. E. Beatty, James Cole, C. Frank Brockman, M. V. Walker, Harry Parker, and Russell Grader, D. D. McLean, who participated in the Grinnell survey, also made further contributions as a regular employee of the Naturalist Department. Dr. H. C. Bryant, first as a seasonal employee and later as a regular member of the director's staff, published extensively on his studies in the park and was influential in starting many other workers on investigations of biological nature. One important development in biological research in Yosemite had an influence on the wildlife program of the entire National Park Service. 
george m wright ranger and assistant park naturalist during the late 1920s sensed the dangers of the uncoordinated wildlife policy of the national park service and determined that there should be better administrative understanding of the normal biotic complex of yosemite and all other national parks in 1929 wright was placed on a field status in order that he might organize a central unit of wildlife investigators to survey the wildlife problems of the national park service and recommend a broad service-wide policy of wildlife management joseph s dixon and ben w thompson were employed by wright to assist him in this undertaking their work during the next several years was conducted from headquarters in berkeley california and from washington d c it demonstrated that a wildlife division was an important administrative adjunct in the director's organization in nineteen thirty six wright lost his life while in the course of his significant work such progress had been made in establishing policy and procedure that the program persisted. It holds a strategic place in the regular administrative setup of the director's office and reaches all field areas with its guidance. The bibliography of scientific work done in Yosemite National Park since World War I is too extensive to be included here. A goodly part of it is contained in A Bibliography of National Parks and Monuments West of the Mississippi River references to research projects published since the appearance of that bibliography appear in the publications of the yosemite natural history association particularly the monthly journal yosemite nature notes especially significant items dealing with wildlife policy and trends in park management are included in the references appended to the present volume in brief, it may be said that the wildlife problems of Yosemite National Park are now fairly well defined and that administrative and technical practices are so aligned as to assure preservation of the faunal and floral characteristics of the reservation within the concept of public enjoyment and use of today and tomorrow. As director of the National Park Service, Newton B. Drury has said, it is national park policy to display wildlife in a natural manner. The normal habits of animals are interfered with as little as possible, and artificial management is refrained from except for protective purposes and then only as a last resort. The pauperizing or domestication of the native animals is avoided, as is also the herding or feeding of these animals to provide shows. Under this policy, the park is a wildlife refuge, but it is neither a circus or a zoo. The wildlife of Yosemite, like its forests and wildflower displays, its renowned cliffs and waterfalls, its glacial pavements, its meadows and valleys, and its spectacular mountaintops, has enthralled its lay visitors quite as it has galvanized the scientist and technician. When Stephen T. Mather assumed the directorship of the national parks in 1916, he determined at the outset to provide park visitors with the information on the natural and historical features which they wanted. Educational endeavors were made a part of this projected program even before a staff had been organized. Surveys of outdoor educational methods and nature teaching as practiced in several European countries had been made in 1915 by C. M. Goethe, and his reports of the success of this work had inspired a few Americans to establish similar educational work in the United States. The California Fish and Game Commission in 1918 sent its educational director, Dr. Harold C. Bryant, into the Sierra to reach vacationists with the message of the conservationist. Yosemite National Park and the playground areas about Lake Tahoe witnessed the introduction of nature guiding several years prior to the inclusion of the work in the broad field program of the National Park Service. In 1920, Mr. Mather and some of his friends joined in supporting this nature teaching in Yosemite, and Dr. Bryant and Dr. Loy Holmes Miller were employed to lay the foundation of what has continued to be an important part of the program of the branch of natural history. A personal letter from Dr. Miller, University of California, Los Angeles, provides a first-hand account of his pioneering in interpretive work in Yosemite. I think John Muir was the first Yosemite guide, see A Son of the Wilderness by L. M. Wolfe. 
we smaller folk could only strive to emulate my first experience in the valley involved a six-week period during the summer of 1917 under private auspices. Professor M. L. McEllen, geology, and I, biology, held a summer school for public school teachers who were largely from Long Beach, California. The work consisted of lectures and field trips about the valley floor and the trails to the rim and to Merced Lake. During the summer of 1919, I was doing similar work at Tahoe when Mr. Stephen T. Mather came through on a flying trip. He asked me to confer with him on the subject of nature guide work in Yosemite and urged me to come at once to the valley and begin the work there. It was late in the season and I had spent most of my free time for the year. Furthermore, it seemed to me that there should be some preparation made for the work, including a measure of publicity in the park guidebooks. I therefore urged Mr. Mather to wait until 1920 for the inauguration of an official nature guide service. He agreed, and we parted with a definite plan for 1920. In the meantime, Mr. C. M. Goethe of Sacramento had become interested in the movement and had engaged Dr. H. C. Bryant in a tour of certain summer camps. I also urged the appointment of Dr. Bryant for the Yosemite work in 1920. My university schedule was such that Dr. Bryant was able to report earlier than I. He therefore gave the first official work in the valley. We cooperated in it after my arrival. I knew that I could not devote many summers to the service because of other duties as an officer of the university. Furthermore, it seemed to me that Dr. Bryant was just the man to carry on to a larger field of development. I therefore urged repeatedly that he make a full-time activity of the movement. This end was ultimately realized. Bryant made all the official reports of our work, with my endorsement. Those reports are in the files of the superintendent's office in the park. During the month of January 1921, Dr. Bryant and I gave our services to the cause in an extended lecture tour through the eastern and middle western states. This effort was underwritten personally by Mr. Mather. The purpose and theme in this series was to publicize and stimulate interest in the natural history values of the park and the appreciation of nature through an increased knowledge and understanding. I returned to Yosemite in the summer of 1921, again in cooperation with Dr. Bryant. The movement seemed to be well on its feet, so I withdrew at the end of that summer. We were appointed as temporary rangers with duties informally defined. Each morning a field trip was conducted by one or the other of us alternately, the alternate holding office hours for questions by visitors. Questions averaged 45 to the hour. In the afternoon, a children's field class was held. In the evening, we alternated with talks at Camp Curry and the old village near Sentinel Bridge. They were busy days, but interest was good. Weekends were devoted to overnight trips by one or the other of us. At the urgent request of Mr. Ansel Hall, I initiated the same type of work at Crater Lake Park, Oregon, in 1926, and continued it in 1927. My son, Alden Miller, was associated with me and two students, Miss Lee Marion Larson and Miss Ruth Randall, acted as volunteers in charge of wildflower display. Reports of this work should be in the Crater Lake files. During the summer, we were visited by Mr. Mather, by Dr. John C. Merriam, and by Mr. John D. Rockefeller and family. The interest of these men was immediate and finally bore material fruit in improvement of Crater Lake Park and the whole nature guide movement in America. Just as had been the case at Yosemite, we were appointed as rangers. My duties at Crater Lake included nature guiding, directing traffic, comforting crying babies, rounding up stray dogs, and a wild drive down the mountain to Medford Hospital with a writhing appendicitis patient and his distracted wife in the rear seat. I have not been officially connected with the work since, but have sent many graduate students to the Yosemite Field School with what I hope was the right point of view. My own retirement at 70 years leaves me out of the picture except in an advisory capacity. Just last week, in conference with my associates here, I urged park naturalist activity as one of the public services for which our department should train young men. So you see that my interests are still with the movement. It is a field of infinite horizon. 
Sincerely yours, Loy Miller, March 18, 1946. Dr. H. C. Bryant, the co-worker referred to by Dr. Miller, became Assistant Director of the National Park Service in charge of interpretive work for all national parks. To Dr. Miller's statement may be added Bryant's words about interpretive work. In the spring of 1921, through a cooperative arrangement with the California Fish and Game Commission, the National Park Service instituted a free nature guide service in Yosemite. The aim of this service was to furnish useful information regarding trees, wildflowers, birds, and mammals, and their conservation, and to stimulate interest in the scientific interpretation of natural phenomena. The means used to attain this aim were trips afield, formal lectures, illustrated with lantern slides or motion pictures, 10-minute campfire talks, given alternately at the main resorts of the park, a stated office hour when questions regarding the natural history of the park could be answered, a library of dependable reference works, and a flower show where the common earth wildflowers, properly labeled, were displayed. Occasionally, visiting scientists helped by giving lectures. About this same time, a Yosemite ranger, Ansel F. Hall, conceived the idea of establishing a Yosemite museum to serve as a public contact center and general headquarters for the interpretive program. Superintendent W. B. Lewis endorsed the plan, and the old Chris Jorgensen Artist Studio was made into a temporary museum. Hall was placed in charge as permanent educational officer. The same year found a museum program underway in Yellowstone National Park, where Milton P. Skinner was made park naturalist, and in Mesa Verde National Park, where Superintendent Jesse Nussbaum organized a museum to care for the archaeological treasures brought to light among the ruins of the prehistoric man's abode. Glacier, Grand Canyon, Mount Rainier, Rocky Mountain, Sequoia, and Zion quickly organized educational programs similar to those established by Yosemite and Yellowstone, and in 1923, Hall, with headquarters in Berkeley, was designated to coordinate and direct the interpretive work in all parks. Working with Dr. Frank R. Ostler, Hall, in 1924, organized a comprehensive plan of educational activities and defined the objectives of the naturalist group. In 1924, C.J. Hamlin was president of the American Association of Museums. The opportunities opened by National Park Museums were called to his attention by Hall, and the American Association of Museums immediately investigated the possibilities of launching adequate museum programs in the parks. In response to recommendations made by the Association and the National Park Service, the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial made funds available with which to construct a fireproof museum in Yosemite National Park. This, one of the first permanent national park museums, became the natural center around which revolves the educational program in Yosemite. Even before the Yosemite Museum installations had been opened to the public, demonstration of the effectiveness of the institution as headquarters for the educational staff and visiting scientists convinced leaders in the American Association of Museums that further effort should be made to establish a general program of museum work in national parks parks. Additional funds were obtained from the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial, and new museums were built in Grand Canyon and Yellowstone National Parks. Dr. Herman C. Bumpus, who had guided the museum planning and construction in Yosemite, continued as the administrator representing the association and Rockefeller interests, and Herbert Meyer was architect and field superintendent on the construction projects. It was Dr. Bumpus who originated the focal point museum idea. When the museums of Yosemite, Grand Canyon, and Yellowstone had demonstrated their value to visitors and staff alike, they were accepted somewhat as models for future work, and upon the strength of their success, the service found it possible to obtain regular government appropriations with which to build several additional museums in national parks and monuments. When PWA funds became available, further impetus was given to the museum program, and a museum division of the service was established in 1935. 
embracing historic areas of the east as well as the scenic national parks it was my privilege to serve as the first head of this unit the work of the museum division has expanded until there are more than one hundred small national park and monument museums and historic house museums more are planned for the future in order to stimulate balanced development of interpretive programs ray lyman wilbur secretary of the interior appointed a committee of educators under the chairmanship of dr john c merriam to study the broad educational possibilities in national parks see wilbur nineteen twenty nine in 1929, this committee recommended that an educational branch with headquarters in Washington be established in the service. It was further recommended that the committee continue to function on a permanent basis as an advisory body, whose duty it shall be to advise the Director of National Parks on matters pertinent to educational policy and developments. Dr. Bryant, who since 1920 had served as a summer employee on the Yosemite Educational Staff and who had been a member of the Committee on Study of Educational Problems in National Parks, was made head of the new branch on July 1, 1930. Antedating the establishment of the branch by one year was the previously mentioned Wildlife Survey instituted in National Parks by George M. Wright, who began his career in the National Park Service as a park ranger in Yosemite in 1927. Thus, it is evident that the pioneer interpretive work done in Yosemite projected its influence and its personnel into the wider fields of nature guiding and museum programs throughout the National Park Service. It may be shown also that the educational work done by the Yosemite staff has been instrumental in advancing the naturalist programs in state parks and elsewhere where out-of-door nature teaching is offered to the public. Some 300 public areas and agencies in the United States provide naturalist services modeled on the Yosemite plan. Only 10% of these are in the National Park Service. One of the far-reaching influences of the Yosemite Naturalist Department is the Yosemite School of Field Natural History, a summer school for the training of naturalists, where emphasis is placed on the study of living things in their natural environment. The school was founded in 1925 by Dr. H. C. Bryant in answer to a demand for better trained naturalists for the Yosemite staff. There was need for a training not furnished by the universities. The California Fish and Game Commission cooperated with the National Park Service in starting this school program. The staff is composed of park naturalists and the regular Yosemite Ranger Naturalist Force, aided by specialists from universities and other government bureaus. The last week of the field period is spent in making studies at Timberline. As the name implies, emphasis is placed on field work. The work is of university grade, although no university credit is offered. Graduates of this school are filling positions as nature guides in parks and summer camps throughout the country. Many of the naturalist and ranger naturalist positions in the National Park Service are held by graduates of this field school. The park naturalist position in Yosemite National Park has been held by Ansel F. Hall, 1922-23, Carl P. Russell, 1923-29, C.A. Harwell, 1929-40. C. Frank Brockman, 1941-1946, and now Donald Edward McHenry. These men and their assistants have supervised the naturalist activities, including the Yosemite Museum Program, directed the Yosemite School of Field Natural History, and the activities of the Yosemite Natural History Association, including the editing and publishing of Yosemite Nature Notes. This last-named organization has existed since 1924 as a society cooperating with the National Park Service in advancing the work of the Yosemite Naturalist Department. It is the successor of the Yosemite Museum Association, formed by Ansel F. Hall in 1920. On April 24, 1925, members of its Advisory Council and Board of Trustees defined these purposes of the association. 1. To gather and disseminate information regarding birds, mammals, flowers, trees, Indians, history, geology, trails, scenic features, and other subjects so well exemplified by nature in Yosemite National Park and elsewhere in the Sierra Nevada. 
two to develop and enlarge the yosemite museum in cooperation with the national park service and to establish subsidiary units such as the glacier point lookout and branches of similar nature three to contribute in every way possible to the development of the educational activities of the yosemite nature guide service four to publish in cooperation with the national park service yosemite nature notes a periodical containing articles of scientific interest concerning the matters referred to in this statement of purposes five to promote scientific investigation along the lines of greatest popular interest and to publish from time to time bulletins or circulars of a non-technical nature six to maintain in yosemite valley a library containing works of historical scientific and popular interest seven to study the living conditions past and present of the remaining indians of the yosemite region for the purpose of preserving their arts custom and legends eight to strictly limit the operations business property and assets of the association to purposes which shall be scientific and educational in order that the association shall not be organized constituted or operated for profit and so that no part of the net income of the association shall inure to the benefit of any member or other party thereto these objectives in almost every particular are also the objectives of the naturalist department of yosemite national park in nineteen thirty seven the congress authorized park naturalists and other government employees to devote their regular working hours to the program of the yosemite natural history association and similar cooperating societies in national parks which might be designated by the secretary of the interior in effect the yosemite natural history association is an auxiliary of the naturalist department for nearly twenty-five years it has adhered to its defined purposes and the support it has given to the interpretive program has furthered research in the park enriched the collections of the yosemite museum and promoted the dissemination of the yosemite story the function of the interpreters has been and their purpose must be to enrich the mountain experience of the yosemite traveler and thereby demonstrate that a national park is far more than a tourist way station upon today's visitor and his full awareness of national park values the future of the national park concept must depend a public which in its enjoyment of the parks comprehends the importance of the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein will insist that they remain unimpaired End of chapter ten chapter eleven of one hundred years in yosemite by carl parcher russell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven guardians of the scene part one in the body of indian fighters who first entered yosemite valley there appears to have been but one man who sensed the possibilities of public good to be derived from the amazing place just discovered a year prior to the entry of the mariposa battalion l h bunnell in climbing the trail from ridley's ferry bagby to bear valley had descried in the eastern mountains an immense cliff which apparently loomed column-like to the very summit of the range he looked upon the awe-inspiring sight with wonder and admiration and turned from it with reluctance to resume the search for coveted gold when on march twenty five eighteen fifty one bunnell stood at inspiration point with other members of savage's command and gazed upon the extravagance of natural wonders he recognized the immensity of rock which had the previous year astonished him from afar he writes haze hung over the valley light as gossamer and clouds partially dimmed the higher cliffs and mountains this obscurity of vision but increased the awe with which i beheld it and as i looked a peculiar exalted sensation seemed to fill my whole being and i found my eyes in tears with emotion he withdrew from the trail and stationed himself on a projecting rock where he might contemplate all that was spread before him major savage bringing up the rear of the column brought him out of his soliloquy in time to join the battalion in its descent to the floor of the valley 
the party that night discussed the business of naming the valley as they sat about their first campfire near the foot of bridalvale fall bunnell comments it may appear sentimental but the coarse jokes of the careless and the indifference of the practical sensibly jarred my more devout feelings while this subject was a matter of general conversation as if a sacred subject had been ruthlessly profaned or the visible power of deity disregarded bunnell's later discussion with residents of the mariposa hills and his very tangible evidence in the form of personal funds expended in the coulterville trail to yosemite indicate that he was the first to strive for public recognition of the assets available in the new scenic wonderland other men of the region were understandably slow to develop aesthetic appreciation for that which only thrilled and produced no gold by eighteen fifty five rumor and conjecture regarding the mysteries of the valley had created sufficient interest among the old residents and the many newcomers in the mining camps to prompt fascination in j m hutchings and his story when he returned to mariposa after his first scenic banqueting under yosemite falls with the publication of the hutchings articles and the heirs drawings curiosity may be said to have become general and the trek to the valley was started the entire mountain region was of course public domain and though it had not been surveyed it was generally conceded that preemption claims could be made upon it homesteaders were establishing themselves in numerous mountain valleys above the gold region and such squatting was done with the assent of state and federal officers it is hardly surprising that some local aspirants laid claim to parts of yosemite valley the company that expected to develop a water project in eighteen fifty five was apparently the first to attempt to establish rights then came the series of would-be hotel owners whose activities have been described james c lamon was a mountaineer who came to yosemite in eighteen fifty nine and aided in the building of the cedar cottage while so engaged he established himself in the upper end of the yosemite valley and there developed the first bona fide homestead by settlement for many years his log cabin was a picturesque landmark in the valley and today two orchards near camp curry serve as reminders of his pioneering with the advent of the sixties california began to recognize the aesthetic value of some of her mountain features the acclaim of leaders from the east and the expressed wonder of notables from abroad played a part in the development of a state pride in the beauties of yosemite and gradually it became apparent that only poor statesmanship would allow private claims to affect an area of such world-wide interest on march twenty eighth eighteen sixty four senator john conness of california introduced in the u s senate a bill to grant to the state of california tracts of land embracing the yosemite valley and the mariposa grove of big trees on may seventeen his bill was reported out of committee on the occasion of the debate which followed senator conness entered into the record of american conservation the first evidences of national consciousness of park values as we conceive of them today he started the long train of legislative acts which have given the united states the world's greatest and most successful system of national parks it is a fact of course that the senate action of eighteen sixty four did not create a national park but it did give federal recognition to the importance of natural reservations in our cultural scheme and charged california with the responsibility of preserving and presenting the natural wonders of the yosemite senator conness explained to the senate that it was the purpose of his bill to commit them yosemite valley and the mariposa grove of big trees to the care of the authorities of that state for their constant preservation that they may be exposed to public view and that they may be used and preserved for the benefit of mankind the plan of preservation comes from gentlemen of fortune of taste and of refinement the bill was prepared by the commissioner of the general land office who also takes a great interest in the preservation both of the yosemite valley and the big trees grove the bill was passed by the senate on may seventeen referred to the house committee on public lands on june second 
debated and passed by the house on june twenty nine and signed by president lincoln on july one eighteen sixty four these deliberations which designated the first scenic reservation for free public use were consummated under the stress of waging war in order to eliminate friction and delays in the operation of legislative machinery proponents of the yosemite bill secured its passage without recognition of the private claims made by yosemite settlers Lehman, clearly a bona fide homesteader, Hutchings, who had a short time before the passage of the act purchased the upper hotel property, Black, the owner of Black's Hotel, and Ira Folsom, interested in the Leidig property, pressed their claims and involved the new state park in prolonged litigation. The State Park Act provided that the Yosemite Grant and the Mariposa Big Trees should be managed by a board of commissioners, of whom the governor of the state was to be one. On September 28, 1864, three months after the grant was made, Governor F. K. Lowe proclaimed that trespassing upon the tracts involved must desist. His board of Yosemite commissioners was appointed in the same proclamation. Frederick Law Olmsted, even then an accomplished landscape architect, was made chairman of the board. As Brockman, 1946, page 106, has revealed in his article on Olmsted, the chairman was also the first administrative officer of the Yosemite Grant. Olmsted's statement of 1890 substantiates this fact. I had the honor to be made chairman of the first Yosemite Commission, and in that capacity to take possession of the valley for the state, to organize and direct the survey of it, and to be the executive of various measures taken to guard the elements of its scenery from fires, trespassers, and abuse. In the performance of these duties, I visited the valley frequently, established a permanent camp in it, and virtually acted as its superintendent legal acceptance of the gift could not be made until the next session of the state legislature on april second eighteen sixty six the necessary provisions for administration were secured the board of commissioners made the best possible selection of a guardian the yosemite pioneer galen clark and invited the settlers of the valley to vacate their holdings j m hutchings as might be expected was wrathy it is probable that james layman after eight years of permanent residence on his land saw no justice in the act the other claimants held out for what might be in it hutchings and layman refused to surrender their property and a test suit was brought against hutchings which was decided in his favor this was carried to the supreme court of the state and then to the federal supreme court in these last actions the commissioners were sustained that hutchings and layman were deserving of consideration and remuneration cannot be denied but millions of americans are today indebted to the board of commissioners who pursued the case to a settlement favorable to the people private titles of the type held by the yosemite valley settlers would have been disastrous to all administration in the years that were to come on the other hand hutchings and layman were deserving of certain sympathy no man had done more than j m hutchings to call attention to the fact that the yosemite was a wonderland eminently worthy of the distinction bestowed upon it by the state for a decade prior to the creation of the state park he had devoted himself to disseminating knowledge on its charming realities much of this was done through his california magazine and the lithographic reproductions of the heir's drawings some of it was accomplished with his volume scenes of wonder which ran through several editions the many published testimonials of his worth as guide and informant while operating his hutchings house in yosemite valley indicate that his efforts to engender a public love for the place were not spared even after his difficulties arose with the state and finally, during the ten-year fight for reimbursement, he lectured throughout the country, bringing home to the dwellers in eastern cities the fact that a phenomenally beautiful area in California was worthy of their visit. Some of the manuscripts of these eastern lectures are possessed by the Yosemite Museum. Their text reveals none of the commercialism and selfishness with which Hutchings sometimes has been charged. 
the earnest efforts which hutchings had expended in interesting the public in yosemite had not failed to create an interest in him as well the court had refused further consideration of the claims of the settlers, but the state legislature, influenced by public feeling and the expressed approval of the Yosemite commissioners, appropriated $60,000 to compensate the four claimants. Of this, Hutchings received $24,000, Lehman $12,000, Black $13,000, Folsom $6,000, and the remaining $5,000 was returned to the state treasury. Because of this prolonged litigation, the commissioners did not secure full control of the grant until 1875. To what extent such troubles would dissipate the best directed efforts of a board of managers of any business can well be imagined. Further difficulties developed when road privileges were granted. The state legislature failed to sustain the position of the commissioners in the matter of exclusive rights for a road on the north side of the valley, and again a controversy arose which directed heated criticism upon the management of the state park. Public hostility alternated with general indifference the state failed to provide adequate funds with which to accomplish the important work before the commissioners and the lack of a well-defined policy handicapped the administration to a point of ruin in eighteen eighty a new law removed the first board and appointed a new one the next decade saw important developments take place in the park but policies adopted were sure to displease some one or some faction criticism still prevailed Gradually, the seethings of the press brought about the development of intelligent public interest in Yosemite affairs. Indifference was replaced by discriminating attention, and Yosemite administration arrived in a new era. In these pages, not enough has been said about John Muir. His contributions to the preservation of Yosemite National Park, to the determination of scientific facts regarding it, and to public understanding of its offerings, place him in the front rank of conservationists who have been instrumental in saving representative parks of the American heritage. The role he played as explorer, researcher, interpreter, and defender of the public interest in the Yosemite may well become the subject of another book of Muriana. However, at this juncture, it is only possible to relate him rather inequitably to the field of Yosemite administrative history. John Muir arrived in Yosemite for the first time in 1868. Intent upon making deliberate studies of all that fascinated him, he determined to remain a resident of the Yosemite region. In order to do so, he attached himself to a sheep ranch. He gave the first winter to work on the Foothill Ranch and the next summer to herding in the Yosemite Sierra. With the intimate acquaintance so made with sheep and their ways, he was destined to create a wave of public interest in Yosemite that would eclipse all former attentions and revolutionize the administrative scheme. For eight years after his first Sierra experience, John Muir rambled over his range of light. He tarried for some time in Yosemite Valley and was employed by J. M. Hutchings at times to operate a sawmill which Muir immortalized merely by inhabiting it. Some impression of his first employment in Yosemite Valley and his early outlook upon the Yosemite scene may be gained from these paragraphs of his memoirs published by Badi. I had the good fortune to obtain employment from Mr. Hutchings in building a sawmill to cut lumber for cottages that he wished to build in the spring from the fallen pines which had been blown down in a violent windstorm a year or two before my arrival. Thus I secured employment for two years, during all of which time I watched the varying aspects of the glorious valley arrayed in its winter robes, the descent from the heights of the booming, outbounding avalanches like magnificent waterfalls, the coming and going of the noble storms, the varying songs of the falls, the growth of frost crystals on the rocks and leaves and snow, the sunshine sifting through them in rainbow colors, climbing every Sunday to the top of the walls for views of the mountains in a glorious array along the summit of the range, and so forth. 
I boarded with Mr. Hutchings family, but occupied a cabin that I built for myself near the Hutchings winter home. This cabin, I think, was the handsomest building in the valley, and the most useful and convenient for a mountaineer. From the Yosemite Creek, near where it first gathers its beaten waters at the foot of the fall, I dug a small ditch and brought a stream into the cabin, entering at one end and flowing out the other, with just current enough to allow it to sing and warble in low, sweet tones, delightful at night while I lay in bed. The floor was made of rough slabs, nicely joined and embedded in the ground. In the spring, the common terrace ferns pushed up between the joints of the slabs, two of which, growing slender like climbing ferns on account of the subdued light, I trained on threads up the sides and over my windows in front of my writing desk in an ornamental arch. Dainty little tree frogs occasionally climbed the ferns and made fine music in the night, and common frogs came in with the stream and helped to sing with the hylas and the warbling tinkling water my bed was suspended from the rafters and lined with libocedrus plumes altogether forming a delightful home in the glorious valley at a cost of only three or four dollars and i was loath to leave it when he was not running hutchings mill he was making lonely trips of discovery or guiding visitors above the valley walls Perhaps Muir knew of the use he would make of the natural history data he was gathering, but few of his associates sensed the fact that he would soon make the nation quicken with new views of Yosemite values. He first made his influence felt in the early 70s when he began publishing on Yosemite in journals and periodicals. His material awakened responses everywhere. On February 5, 1876, he published an article in the Sacramento Record Union, which was one of the initial steps in his forceful appeal to America to save the Yosemite high country from the devastation of sheep and the incendiary fires of sheep herders. It is likely that few who today enjoy the Yosemite high Sierra realize that sheep, hoofed locusts, were responsible for the creation of Yosemite National Park. The people of California, awakened to the danger by the warnings of Muir and others, attempted to secure an enlargement of the state park. Selfish local interests frustrated the plan. In 1889, John Muir allied himself with the Century magazine, and a plan was launched which was designed to arouse a public sentiment that could not be shunted. Muir produced the magic writings, and Robert Underwood Johnson, editor of the Century, secured the support of influential men in the East. On October 1, 1890, a law was enacted which set aside an area larger than the present park as reserved forest lands. Within this reserve were the state-controlled Yosemite and Mariposa Grove grants. The reactions of residents of the regions adjacent to the new national park to this legislation was typical of the period. Citizens of the counties affected could not foresee the coming of unbroken streams of automobile traffic, which eventually would bring millions of dollars to their small marts of trade. The thought of losing some thousands of acres of taxable land caused county seats to seethe with unrest. The local press painted pictures of dejected prospects and near ruin. The following summary of a lengthy wail from a contemporary paper reveals the fears that prevailed. Let us summarize the results of our analysis. On the one side, we have 932,600 acres of land taken away from the control and use of the people at large and of the people of Mariposa, Tuolumne, Mono, and Fresno counties in particular for the ostensible purpose of preserving timber, mineral deposits, and natural curiosities or wonders within said reservation, for whose benefit the act does not say, but presumably for the benefit of tourists. 
on the other hand we find that the avowed object of preserving forest appears to be only a false pretense to cover up the real object of the scheme whatever it may be that to preserve mineral deposits will prevent untold treasures from being employed in industry and commerce and prevent the employment of thousands for many years to come in the exploration of these mineral deposits that to preserve natural curiosities and wonders it is not necessary to fling away nearly a million acres of land when all that is necessary can be accomplished by attaching to each wonder as much land as through natural formation contributes in any measure towards its maintenance that if on the one hand these claims are respected it will condemn hundreds of american settlers to poverty if on the other hand these claims are bought out it will entail an expense of many millions on the country whilst the claimants themselves will never receive anything like the amount their properties would be worth in the course of time if this matter of the country is left to its own development without government interference and all the settlements now existing will be left to fall into decay and ruin or will have to be worked by a system of tenantry a curse as contemporary history shows which ought never to be allowed to take root in our country the preservation of the full watershed of the yosemite valley is not only a legitimate but a desirable object the same holds good with the hetch hetchy valley or any other grand work of nature every alienation of land beyond this is of evil this local feeling resulted in immediate attempts to change the park boundaries the first attempt was frustrated largely through the efforts of the sierra club this organization came into existence shortly after yosemite national park was created and has always been one of the most important agencies that have promoted the safety of yosemite treasures its publication the sierra club bulletin which first appeared in eighteen ninety three is a rich source of yosemite history for twenty-two years john muir was the president of the club his vim in leaping to the defense of the great natural preserve was no less than had been his vigor in working for its creation muir aided in the preservation of national monuments as well in early May 1903, Theodore Roosevelt, then president, visited Yosemite via Raymond and the Mariposa Grove. Governor George C. Pardee, Benjamin Ide Wheeler, president of the University of California, and John Muir were among those who interpreted the scene for the president. Conservation matters were discussed by Muir, and the legislation which was to become famous as the Antiquities Act of 1906 was given some definition at this time it was truly an important occasion chief among the sierra club defenders of yosemite who have carried on since the death of muir is william e colby he served forty-four years as secretary of the organization two years as president and is now as a director a frequently sought source of counsel he led the club's summer outings for more than three decades Throughout this period, Colby has unceasingly built the Sierra Club's prestige in the field of conservation. For the past six years, he has served as a member of the Yosemite Advisory Board and has been in close touch with past and current park problems. The failure of the national government to provide funds with which to extinguish private claims within the park involved the administration in difficulties which are being felt even yet by 1904 relations between administrative officers and the large number of owners of private holdings had become so strained that legal action was imperative boundary revisions were required major hiram c chittenden headed the commission appointed to investigate possible boundary changes upon the recommendation of this commission large areas on the east and west were lopped off in 1906 a tract on the southwest was cut off and since that time small changes have been rather numerous private lands still exist within the park and constitute an ever-present source of trouble from the first the control of yosemite national park has been vested in the secretary of the interior 
Immediately after the passage of the Act of Creation, military units were detailed to take charge of all national park lands. The state retained its plan of administration of the original Yosemite grant, and so came about the dual control which for 16 years colored the Yosemite administration with petty misunderstandings and hindered progress in the maintenance of the entire region galen clark's old ranch wawona became headquarters for the acting superintendent of the federal preserve from this eccentric hub patrols of cavalrymen were sent into the unbounded wilderness area of the new preserve a trail system and accurate maps did not exist one of the first undertakings of the early superintendents was to make the rough country accessible by horse trail the topography was studied and a good map was prepared Following the practice established in Yellowstone National Park, patrolling stations were established, and the United States Army had the safety of Yosemite's fauna and flora fairly within its keeping. Since pioneer days, sheep and cattlemen had enjoyed unrestricted use of the excellent range which was now forbidden them. Naturally, they were reluctant to abandon it. Their trespass was the most formidable threat with which the troopers were confronted, and concerted ingenious work was necessary to expel the intruders. When the first culprits were taken into custody, it was found that no law provided for their punishment. Congress had failed to provide a penalty for the infraction of park rules. Nothing daunted, the superintendents put the captured herders under arrest and escorted them across the most mountainous regions to a far boundary of the park. There they were liberated. The herder's sheep were driven out of the reserve at another distant point. By the time the herder had located his animals, his losses usually were so great as to represent a more severe punishment than could have been meted out by the court had the law applied several years of this practice caused neighboring ranchers to keep their animals out of the forbidden territory captain abram epperson wood was the first superintendent with detachments from the fourth cavalry he arrived in the park on may nineteen eighteen ninety one and continued in charge until his death in eighteen ninety four each year the troopers came in april or may and withdrew in the fall during the winter, two civilian rangers attempted to patrol the area. With such inadequate winter protection, it is small wonder that poachers grew to feel that the wildlife of the reserve was their legitimate prey. It was not until 1896, in fact, that a determined effort was made to keep firearms out of the park at any time of the year. For 23 years, the Department of the Interior continued to call upon the War Department for assistance in administering Yosemite National Park. Eighteen Army officers took their turn at the helm. Some of them assumed leadership after some years of Yosemite experience as subordinate officers. Others were placed in command with no previous service in the park. Lieutenant, later Colonel, Harry C. Benson and Major W. W. Forsythe were perhaps the most distinguished of the superintendents. Benson was certainly more than a superintendent. He was an explorer, map maker, trail builder, fish planter, and nemesis of the sheepmen. Among the subordinate officers and enlisted men, a number left their mark by way of accomplishments. N. F. McClure and Milton F. Davis are remembered for their explorations and excellent map-making. William F. Breeze and W. R. Smedberg worked with McClure and Benson in stocking the headwaters of the Yosemite rivers with trout. A. Arndt pioneered in exploration of some of the northern sections of the park. Many others in the military organizations are remembered in place names throughout the Yosemite High Sierra. Yosemite was fortunate in having within its National Park Service personnel one man, Gabriel Sovaluski, who pioneered with these early units and who was acting superintendent of the park in 1908-1909 and again in 1914. For 35 years, Mr. Sovaluski was actively engaged in caring for Yosemite. An unpublished manuscript on his National Park Service experiences is preserved in the Yosemite Museum. Within it, he comments upon the Yosemite work of United States troops. 
national parks in california and yosemite especially owe much to the late colonel h c benson no one who has not participated in these strenuous years of hard riding and incessant fighting of natural and human obstacles can ever realize the need for indomitable spirit and unselfish devotion to a cause that existed during those first years in yosemite national park sheep and cattle overran the country they were owned by men who knew every foot of the terrain they were ordered to eliminate them there were few or no trails and maps did not exist reliable guides were unobtainable and we had more than a thousand square miles to cover officers with detachments set out upon patrols that would keep them away from our base of supplies for thirty days at a time many times rations were short and sixteen to twenty hours of action per day covering sixty miles in the saddle was not unusual constant hammering at the offending cattlemen continued for several years and at last they were convinced that they must vacate the territory set aside for national park purposes the would-be poachers and the entire countryside were taught a moral lesson which still has its effect today some of the present-day administrative problems are made easier because of the foundation laid in those early years of the park's existence the duplication of effort and expense which resulted from the anomaly of state and federal administration within the reserve brought about controversies which finally caused many californians to conclude that their yosemite state grant of eighteen sixty four might well be placed in the hands of the federal government to be managed by the same officers who control the surrounding national park the sierra club and many civic organizations took the lead in urging recession not a few citizens felt that the proposed move was an affront to state pride this group proved to be an obstacle but was overcome in nineteen o five when the state legislature reseeded to the united states the yosemite valley and the mariposa big tree grove a formal acceptance by congress brought the yosemite state park to an end on august one nineteen o six major benson removed military headquarters from camp a e wood wawona and fort yosemite came into existence on the site of the present yosemite lodge for seven years the administrative organization set up by the military continued to function the succeeding superintendents found their responsibilities increased considerably other national parks were coming into existence and a national conscience was beginning to recognize the value of wilderness preserves in nineteen ten the american civic association had launched a campaign for the creation of a national park bureau president taft favored central administration of the parks and bills were introduced creating such a bureau major william t littlebrandt was in command in yosemite when dr adolph c miller a civilian became assistant to secretary lane and was placed in charge of the national parks the next year troops did not come to yosemite mark daniels was made superintendent and civilian employees undertook the work that had been done by the troopers a few civilian rangers had assumed the care of the park each winter when troops were withdrawn archie o leonard had been the first of these and he remained in the service when the administrative change was made in nineteen fourteen park rangers came into existence under authorization of secretary lane they patrolled the park as had the troopers but unlike the troopers they remained in touch with their problems throughout the year End chapter eleven part one Chapter Eleven of One Hundred Years in Yosemite by Carl Parcher Russell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: Guardians of the Scene, Part Two. In 1916, Congress created the National Park Service. Dr. Miller, in the meantime, had been called to other work, and Stephen T. Mather, who had followed Dr. Miller as assistant to the secretary, was made director of the National Park Service. He was authorized by law to promote and regulate the federal areas known as the national parks, monuments, and reservations. Conservation of scenery and wildlife of the areas was declared by Congress to be a fundamental purpose of the new organization. 
Mr. Mather's first undertaking was to balk exploitation schemes. Unfortunately, Yosemite had already been raided. In 1913, Congressman John E. Raker had introduced a bill granting to San Francisco rights to the Hetch Hetchy as a water reservoir. Secretary Garfield had opened the way to this move in 1908. In spite of much opposition, the Raker bill was passed by the House and Senate and approved by President Wilson. Since that time, the Hetch Hetchy Dam has become a reality and provides all the administrative difficulties and troubles that were expected. Private holdings in Yosemite were rather large even after the boundary changes of 1905 and 1906 were made. Timber companies possessing tracts of choice forest constituted the greatest menace. Some of these private lands have been bought up and others have been exchanged. During 1930, much progress was made in the acquisition of private holdings in the National Park. There were 15,570 acres of land involved, which cost approximately $3,300,000. Half of the cost of purchasing these lands was defrayed by John D. Rockefeller, Jr., the remainder coming from the fund provided by Congress for the acquisition of private holdings in national parks. The following statements regarding timber holdings in and near Yosemite National Park are taken from the report of the Director of National Park Service for 1930. It is impossible to overstate the importance of this Yosemite forest acquisition. It brought into perpetual government ownership the finest remaining stands of sugar pine timber in the area and reduced the total area of private holdings in the park to 5,034 acres. This total will be materially reduced when two pending deals are consummated. A tract containing 640 acres is now in course of acquisition with funds contributed by George A. Ball of Muncie, Indiana, as is another of about 380 acres, half the funds for the latter transaction being contributed through the cooperation of Dr. Don Treseder, president of the Yosemite Park and Curry Company. Additional timber holdings in the Tuolumne River watershed, fine stands of sugar and yellow pine, remain in private ownership outside the park. One cannot help regretting that they are imperiled, and it is hoped by all friends of these majestic forests that they may yet be saved. In order that the beauty of the Big Oak Flat Road may be unimpaired, arrangements have been made between the Sugar Pine Lumber Company, the Forest Service, the State, and the Park Service to preserve the roadsides through selective cutting of the larger trees and careful removal of any trees that are taken out. Particularly interesting and valuable stands of timber, which should be preserved untouched, will be made the subject of exchanges between the Forest Service and the Sugar Pine Lumber Company. This land acquisition program was finally assured of success in July 1937, when legislation authorized the Secretary of the Interior to acquire the Carl Inn Tract, comprising some 7,200 acres of magnificent sugar pine forest bordering the western boundary of the park. After a year and a half of negotiations with the Yosemite Sugar Pine Lumber Company, owner of most of the tract, agreement was reached on a price of $1,495,500 to be paid by the United States. The purchase was consummated early in 1939. Senator William Gibbs McAdoo and Representative John S. McGrorty, both of California, were the ardent supporters who introduced the bills, S. 1791 and H. R. 5394, in their respective houses. Policies regarding the toll roads by which tourists could enter the park constituted another perplexing problem with which the Young National Park Service was confronted. The routes had been privately constructed and were privately owned and controlled by turnpike companies. Government funds were not available with which to purchase them outright. One company was persuaded to turn the Wawona Road over the public in exchange for a grant for the exclusive rights to the route during a certain number of years. The government assumed responsibility for the maintenance of the road during this period. 
the owners of the coulterville road could not be persuaded to agree to such a plan as a result that part of it which is within the park has not been maintained and because of erosion has fallen into disuse the tioga road had been constructed in eighteen eighty two eighty three by the great sierra consolidated silver mining company for the purpose of serving the tioga mine the mining venture terminated in eighteen eighty four after an expenditure of three hundred thousand dollars had been made the road had become impassable during the many years of neglect but it was still the property of private owners when the region through which it passes became a national park stephen t mather and some of his friends bought it privately and in nineteen fifteen turned it over to the federal government the state of california purchased the portion of the route which were outside of the park and extended the road eastward down the vining canyon so giving yosemite a remarkable high mountain highway free from toll which connects yosemite valley with the roots of the mono basin tolls were also removed from the big oak flat route every effort was made to put all recognized routes in the best of condition consistent with government appropriations travel to the park grew apace and yosemite had indeed entered a new era the first scheme of centralized administration of the national park system was promising in theory but proved faulty in practice more than a few difficulties appeared on the park's horizon the national preserves were regarded in washington somewhat as orphans and were not receiving the specialized attention so necessary for their proper administration the introduction of mather ideals and methods was required to bring about coordination the story is told that one day in 1915, Stephen Mather walked into the office of Secretary Lane and expressed indignation over the way things were run in Sequoia and Yosemite. Steve, said Lane, if you don't like the way those parks are run, you can run them yourself. Mr. Secretary, I accept the job, was Mather's rejoinder the genial secretary of the interior showed him into a little office and said there's your desk steve now go to work with that lane went out and closed the door but presently opened it and said by the way steve i forgot to ask what your politics are with such brief preliminaries did stephen t mather assume directorship of the national parks he served through the presidential administrations of Wilson, Harding, and Coolidge, but the matter of his politics was never inquired into by any party. Stephen Mather was born on the 4th of July, 1867, in San Francisco. His ancestry traces back to Richard Mather, a Massachusetts clergyman of the days of the Pilgrim Fathers. Stephen T. Mather was not a Zion of wealth. As a young man, he made his way through college by selling books. He graduated from the University of California in 1887 and for several years was a newspaper reporter. Thereafter, he entered the employ of the Pacific Coast Borax Company and was identified with the trade name 20 Mule Team Borax that became well known around the world. For 10 years, he engaged in the production of profits for his employers and then organized his own company it was in borax that he built up his business success and accumulated the fortune which he later shared so generously with the nation through his investments in scenic beauty on which the people received the dividends for more than twenty-five years stephen mather resided in chicago illinois but his loyalty to his native state california never waned he was the leading spirit in the organization of the california society of illinois and as its secretary always secured donations of a carload of choice california fruits to be served at the society's annual banquets mather then saw to it that these affairs were well written up by the press and telegraphed throughout the country on the associated press wires in this publicity the spirit and motives of the present californians incorporated had their birth as might well be expected mather was a member of the sierra club and participated in many of its summer outings see farquhar 1925 pages 52 53 he became acquainted with national park areas on these trips and it is said that his ideal of a unified administration of the parks resulted from the intimacy so acquired 
it was his ambition to weld the parks into a great system and to make them easily accessible to rich and poor alike at the time mather undertook his big task there were thirteen parks some of them were difficult of access and provided few or no facilities for the accommodation of visitors government red tape stood in the way of action in the business of park development but mather cut the red tape when government appropriations could not meet the situation he usually produced appropriations of his own it was such generosity on his part which gave the tioga road to the government and saved large groves of big trees in the sequoia national park in his own office it was necessary for him personally to employ assistance because of the lack of government funds he expended twice his own salary in securing the personnel needed to set his park machines in operation the national benefits derived from the early mather activity in the parks were recognized by congress and that body took new cognizance of national park matters larger appropriations were made available and the mather's plans were put into effect for fourteen years he gave of his initiative and strength as well as his money his ideas took material form and the park system came into being as he had planned his work was recognized and appreciated in 1921, George Washington University bestowed upon him the honorary degree of Doctor of Law. His alma mater, the University of California, conferred the same degree in 1924. President W. W. Campbell, on that occasion, characterized him as follows. Stephen Ting Mather, mountaineer and statesman, lover of nature and his fellow men, with generous and far-seeing wisdom, he has made accessible for a multitude of americans their great heritage of snow-capped mountains of glaciers and streams and falls of stately forests and quiet meadows in nineteen twenty six he was awarded the gold medal of the national institute of social sciences for his service to the nation in national parks development the american scenic and historical preservation society awarded the pugsley gold medal in recognition of his national and state park work and he was made an honorary member of the american society of landscape architects in the fall of nineteen twenty eight mather's health failed he suffered a stroke of paralysis which forced his retirement from public service in january nineteen twenty nine for more than a year he fought to regain his strength, but in January 1930 he was suddenly stricken and died quickly. Indeed, the world is much the poorer for his passing, as it is much the richer for his having lived. One of Mather's first acts as director of National Park Service was to appoint a strong man to the superintendency of Yosemite National Park. On the staff of the Geological Survey was an engineer of distinction, Washington B. Dusty Lewis. Mather appointed him to the Yosemite task, and he became the first park superintendent on March 3, 1916. The Yosemite problems were complicated and trying from the beginning. The park was, even then, attracting more visitors than had been provided for public demands kept steadily ahead of facilities that could be made available through government appropriations for more than twelve years w b lewis expended his energy and ingenuity in bringing the great park through its formative stages under his superintendency practically all of the innovations which today characterize the public service of a national park were instituted in yosemite motor buses replaced horse-drawn stages tolls were eliminated on all approach roads the operating companies were reorganized and adequate tourist accommodations were provided at glacier point and yosemite valley a modern school was provided for local children the housing for park employees was improved the best of electrical service was made available the park road and trail system was enlarged greatly and improved upon the construction of an all-year highway up the canyon of the merced made the park accessible to a degree hardly dreamed of provision of all-year park facilities met the demands of winter visitors a new administrative center was developed the yosemite high sierra camps were opened and an information service was devised 
the ranger force was so organized as to make for public respect of national park ideals and personnel the interpretive work which makes for understanding of park phenomena and appreciation of park policies was initiated in yosemite and has taken a place of importance in the organization of the entire national park system in short the present-day yosemite came into existence under the hands of lewis and his assistants how well the demands of the period were met and future requirements provided for is evidenced by the continued healthy growth and present success of the yosemite administrative scheme in the fall of nineteen twenty seven lewis was stricken by a heart attack he later returned to his office but in september nineteen twenty eight it became apparent that he should no longer subject himself to the strain of work at the high altitude of yosemite valley he removed to West Virginia, and there partly regained his strength. Director Mather then sought his services as assistant director of the National Parks, and in that capacity he functioned until the summer of 1930. His physical strength, however, failed to keep pace with his ambitious spirit, and after another attack, he died at his home in a Washington suburb on August 28, 1930 soon after lewis accepted his washington appointment director mather experienced the breakdown which brought about his resignation as director there was but one man to be thought of in connection with filling the difficult position that man was horace m albright who had been mather's right-hand man since the national park service had existed a native of inyo county california and a graduate of the university of california he became an assistant attorney in the department of the interior washington d c in order to advance his learning and there took a keen interest in plans then developing for the establishment of the national park service he was detailed to work in connection with park problems and had already become familiar with them when stephen t mather assumed their directorship the secretary of the interior assigned him to mather as a legal aide which position quickly grew in responsibilities as the two men became acquainted from the first albright was the director's chief reliance and when the national park service was organized in nineteen sixteen he was made assistant director in nineteen seventeen nineteen eighteen and nineteen nineteen he aided in the creation of mount mckinley grand canyon acadia and zion national parks at twenty nine he was made superintendent of the largest of all parks yellowstone and in addition shouldered the job of field director of the park service in that capacity he compiled budgets presented them to congress and handled general administrative problems in the west outstanding among his special interest in park problems was his vigorous participation in programs launched to conserve and re-establish the native fauna of national parks he gained an intimate understanding of the needs of american wildlife and actively engaged in attempts to supply its wants he allied himself with such organizations as the national geographic society the american game protective association the american forestry association the american bison society the american society of mammalogists the boone and crockett club the save the redwoods league and the sierra club he became an expressive factor in american conservation and in his own domain the national parks practiced what he preached he recognized the importance of ecological study of the great wilderness areas with the safety of which he was charged and pressed into service a special investigator to work on yellowstone mammal problems later he seized upon the opportunity to extend this research to all parks in keeping with his desire to assemble scientific data for the preservation of fauna and flora he had an ambition to popularize the natural sciences as exemplified in the varied park wonderlands he engaged actively in the development of plans for the museum lecture and guide service which today distinguishes the national parks as educational centers as well as pleasure grounds upon the resignation of director mather in 1929 it was but natural that albright should succeed him he entered into the yosemite administrative scheme by actual residence in the park and study of its problems 
from the yosemite personnel he drew new executives for other parks field officers for the service at large and administrative assistants for his washington office he turned to crater lake national park to obtain a superintendent who would succeed lewis colonel c g thompson had distinguished himself as the chief executive of crater lake and in nineteen twenty nine was called to yosemite some of the developments in yosemite for which thompson was largely responsible included the construction and improvements of the wawona road and tunnel improvement of the glacier point road commencement of the big oak flat road and tioga road realignment the installation of improved water systems at the mariposa big trees wawona and tuolumne meadows construction of the new government utility buildings and many smaller projects such important land acquisition programs as the wawona basin project and the carl in sugar pine addition constituted heavy administrative responsibilities imposed upon the superintendent's office during his regime the establishment of emergency programs ccc cwa wpa and pwa greatly expanded the development activities in the park after nineteen thirty three and the inclusion of the devil's post pile national monument and joshua tree national monument in the yosemite administrative scheme increased the duties of the superintendent in nineteen thirty seven colonel thompson was stricken by a heart ailment and died in the lewis memorial hospital on march twenty three in eulogy frank a kittredge said colonel thompson has through his dynamic personality and energy and the wealth of his experience been an influence and inspiration not only to the thousands of park visitors with whom he has had personal contact but especially to the park service itself his keen sense of the fitness and desire for the harmony of things in the national parks has made itself felt in the design of every road every structure and every physical development in the park he recognized the importance and practicability of restricting and harmonizing necessary roads and structures into a natural blending of the surroundings he has set a standard of beauty and symmetry in construction which has been carried beyond the limits of yosemite into the entire national park system the harmony of the necessary man-made developments and the unspoiled beauty of the yosemite valley attest to the colonel's injection of his refinement of thought and forceful personality into even the everlasting granite itself of the yosemite he loved so well in june nineteen thirty seven lawrence campbell merriam a native californian was transferred to the superintendency of yosemite national park he had received a degree in forestry from the university of california in nineteen twenty one had become a forest engineer and had later gone into emergency conservation work in the state parks throughout the united states upon the death of thompson secretary of the interior harold l ix appointed merriam senior conservationist in the national park service and designated him acting superintendent of yosemite during his four years as the chief executive of the park he renewed the service's efforts to restore the natural appearances of the valley and modified the master plan to provide suitable areas for the operator's utilities in august nineteen forty one merriam became regional director of region two national park service with headquarters at omaha nebraska frank a kittredge succeeded him in yosemite during World War I, Kittredge served as an officer in the Army Corps of Engineers and saw service in France. Afterward, while with the Bureau of Public Roads, he was identified with park work. He made the location survey of the Going to the Sun Highway in Glacier National Park, did the first road engineering in Hawaii National Park, and devoted his attention to National Park road matters handled by the Bureau. In 1927, Kittredge was appointed Chief Engineer of the National Park Service and continued in that capacity for 10 years when he was made Regional Director, Region 4, a position involving supervision over park service programs in Washington, Oregon, California, Idaho, Nevada, and Utah, Glacier National Park in Montana, and the territories of Alaska and Hawaii. 
in august 1940 he was made superintendent of grand canyon national park from which position he was transferred in 1941 to the chief executive position in yosemite national park in all this varied experience with the scenic masterpieces of the national park system frank kittredge maintained a sincerity of purpose in safeguarding the natural and historic values of the parks as was true of mather and albright succeeding directors of the national park service have taken personal interest and active part in the management of yosemite national park on july seventeenth nineteen thirty three arno b Kammerer, formerly associate director succeeded albright in the washington post during his incumbency nineteen thirty three to forty the national park system increased from a hundred and twenty eight areas to two hundred and four units and in addition to regular appropriations nearly two hundred million dollars was expended by the service in connection with the programs of the civilian conservation corps the public works administration and the emergency relief appropriation acts under Kammerer's directorship five ccc camps were established in yosemite national park with the help of ccc cwa and pwa many management and construction projects in the park were advanced far ahead of regular schedule the wawona road tunnel project was completed and notable progress was made in constructing the tioga and big oak flat roads on modern standards winter use of the park increased mightily and the yosemite park and curry company developed the badger pass ski center in accordance with service plans because of failing health kammerer resigned as director in nineteen forty and newton b drury a californian and a member of the yosemite advisory board was appointed to the position on june nineteen nineteen forty since 1919, Drury had been a leader in the movement to preserve distinctive areas for park purposes. As executive head of the Save the Redwoods League, he had become a nationally recognized authority on park and conservation affairs and was intimately acquainted with the problems of Yosemite National Park through personal studies the normal problems of the park and of the service generally were greatly complicated by the circumstances resulting from world war ii and the years nineteen forty two to nineteen forty five were probably the most critical in the history of national parks but in spite of pressure exerted by production interests and those who sought to capitalize on the park's assets under the guise of a war necessity the natural values of yosemite were held inviolate and it is to the everlasting credit of director drury and his staff and associates in central offices and the field that during the years of all-out warfare serious inroads were nowhere made upon national park values each year more than half a million people benefit by the great park's offerings and each year witnesses new demands for expansion of public utilities provided by the operators and the government to meet these demands and at the same time guarantee benefit and enjoyment of yosemite values for future generations of visitors is one of the most exacting tasks engaged in by public servants anywhere two hundred years one hundred fourteen years have elapsed since the explorers in joseph walker's party first made their way to some point on the north rim of yosemite valley and beheld a tremendous scene beneath them it is to be hoped that the yosemite visitor today will have his enjoyment of yosemite national park somehow enhanced by the recorded story of the human events during the past century particularly by the story of the human effort that made yosemite accessible to him but not too accessible yosemite like other national parks has its master plan upon it is set down in rather definite form the conception of the park staff of needs for physical improvements this prescription is reviewed by technicians and executives in central offices and made to delimit the maximum development necessary to meet the requirements of staff and public the master plan also contains an analysis of the inspirational and recreational experiences which attract the multitude of visitors to the park 
as might be expected this analysis of yosemite's offerings points to the fact that one of the notable values of the reservation is found in its capacity to stimulate pride in the understanding of the heritage of natural beauty preserved within the park's boundaries another important value is indicated in the capacity of the park to serve as a repository of scientific treasures in this last-named role as Museum of the Out of Doors, Yosemite National Park reasonably may be expected to become increasingly important as the less protected areas of the Sierra Nevada are more and more encroached upon by exploiters. The exploiters are not always concerned with livestock, minerals, or timber. The aggressiveness of those who cater to recreation seekers, even of the recreation seekers themselves, constitute a force to be reckoned with, and this group particularly lays siege to the structure of National Park Service conservatism. It is well that the visitor to this and other national parks extend his kin. We know something of what has happened since 1833, but what will have happened to the Yosemite region by the year 2033 A.D., 200 years after white man's first glimpse of the valley? Will the men of great enterprise have built ladders touching the sky, changing the face of the universe and the very color of the stars? Or will there still be a remnant of mountain sanctuary where the handiwork of today's and tomorrow's visitors will be as hard to discern as Joe Walker's footsteps are to trace? End of chapter 11, part 2 End of 100 Years in Yosemite by Carl Parcher Russell